Hello, adventurers, and welcome to, I am devastated to say, the very final day of D&D Celebration 2021. Do not worry, though. We are going out with a bang. We've got a wonderful day scheduled for you. I cannot wait, sad as I am, to be here on the very final day. So, before we get started, let's talk about how you can join the conversation today. So first up, we have a Discord channel, so you can jump in there if you want to chat to fellow players, adventurers, DMs all weekend long. You can find that at discord.gg forward slash D&D. There's loads of conversation going on there. As I've said all weekend, this is the this is the kind of event where there are a lot of talking points. There is a lot to chat about, so make sure you jump in there if you're watching by yourself this weekend and would love some company. Of course, you can also find us on social media. So we are at wizards underscore D and D, and we've got the hashtag D and D celebration. So you can share all your favourite moments. You can find out what other people have loved this weekend, and there's some great art i have to say people are posting really gorgeous sketches inspired by some of the games and panels this weekend so go and check that out if you haven't already now yesterday was an incredibly fun day i absolutely loved it we had lots of panels and games that you've been really looking forward to so let's have a little recap of what we got up to on day two so first off we kicked things off with hermes's heist now this was a brilliant game as I always say, I'm a little bit biased towards the Brits, and this was a game full of them, but it was also set in a really gorgeous setting. So this was based in a mythological world with Asgard and Olympus at war, which I mean, straight away, how good does that sound? Sucked me in immediately. And so we saw our intrepid band of adventurers trying to steal a piece of technology from a vault that could change the fate of either side. Obviously, no spoilers, I'm not gonna tell you how they got on, but I have to say, if you love mythology, if that is your kind of thing, this was the game for you. The DM, Joe Fudge, put in so much work, so much detail, it was oh, absolutely gorgeous. And he said that, um, I think quite so shortly, actually, he's got a bunch of other games coming up that are set in that world. So if you did watch yesterday, or perhaps you didn't and you want to catch up, he is the one to go and follow. Find him on Twitter, Joe Fudge. He's got lots more coming your way in that world. And I know I will be tuning in because I am an absolute sucker for every single bit of it. Then after that, we had my first character bringing young players into D&D. This was a wonderful panel. Just so lovely and heartwarming and wholesome. It was all about how we adapt D&D to make it accessible to younger players, to newer players, people who are just starting out on their very first adventure. Which seems like a very long time ago for me. It's making me feel old. But we had some really wonderful tips and tricks there. And I think, you know, having had a glance at social media, people loved it. I mentioned it yesterday, but one of my favourite tweets was a teacher who said they'd be using it in their school. And I just thought, oh, I would have loved that. I would have loved to have D&D at school. So yeah, teachers, go and watch that panel and just indoctrinate a whole class into the world of D&D because we want them. We're trying to grab them young. So that was a wonderful panel. Loads of tips and tricks there. So if you didn't manage to catch it, it's all up on YouTube. You can go back and watch that one. Then after that, I hosted Strixhaven in session. So this was really wonderful. I sat down with Amanda Hammond and James Wyatt, Jeremy Crawford, and we just basically talked about everything that is on your way in Strixhaven, a curriculum of chaos. Of course, this is the upcoming book set in Strixhaven University. If you're an MTG player, you might be familiar with it because of course we had the wonderful set based in Strixhaven there where you could choose your colleges and it's been fleshed out for D&D. That's kind of what we dove into is how you take that setting from magic where it is kind of based around your play style and build it into the kind of much more detailed and flexible world of D&D. So we had loads to discuss there, new races, NPCs, new ways of having relationships and of having a nemesis, which is just my favourite thing. I am so excited to sabotage someone and have them try and 
sabotage me back. So if you missed that, go and have a go and watch that panel because it was lots of fun. It's got all the details you want to know about Strixhaven and also interestingly how you can take some of these new mechanics. They're, they're really interesting, I think, and put them in your existing game. Because some of them, as we said, the relationships, the studying, there is LARPing, which I'm very excited about. You can LARP inside D&D, &D, which sounds absolutely incredible. And all those little sections, some mini games, things like that. Jeremy in particular kind of talked about how you can weave those into the campaigns you're running right now, which I think is you know a really great idea think of this book as a toy box. So again, if you want to check out what's on your way for Strixhaven, go and watch that one. After that, we had another game, which was The Slapstick Hunt, A Silly Chase. This was really great. This was an exploration of the multiverse, and it was a comedic adventure, kind of running riot through all the different planes. A really great way to show you how you can work the multiverse into your games, which is something I know I am desperate to do. We've had so much multiverse content this weekend. I can't wait to can't start weaving it into the the D and D world that I'm currently in. So this was, I think, if that's something you're interested in and you want to see how to use the multiverse, this was a great example of that. Really fun, just yeah, a, a really good time. This one, it made me laugh a lot. So after that, I hosted another panel. It was a big day for me. Fizban's Treasury of Dragons Revealed. So as the title suggests, this was about another upcoming book, which is, of course, Fizban's Treasury of Dragons. So I was lucky enough to sit down one-on-one -on -one with James Wyatt, and we just geeked out. We just talked dragons for an hour. We dove into everything this book has to offer because it is going to be the quintessential reference guide for dragons in D&D. &D. So it introduces new dragons, it introduces new lore and mechanics and stats. I mean, like I said, things got geeky. It's, it's yeah, it's a really exciting book. I've had a sneak peek at it. And yeah, if you love Dungeons and Dragons, and in particular, dragons, this is the book for you. It's going to be, there's so much in it. Kind of similarly to Strixhaven, lots you can take and weave into your world. But in particular, the new lore is so exciting. I love it. Really interesting, really intriguing and mysterious. And yeah, definitely one to watch if you love dragons. Or the Dragon Mafia, which again, I'm not going to explain. You're just going to have to go and watch the panel. So after that, we had a DM roundtable on immersion. The DM roundtables are always great packed with um, just incredible advice for DMs. And this one was no different, all about how to immerse players in the game, how you can drop them into that world, make them feel like they are just surrounded by your creation. And we had loads of great tips. In particular, I think my favorite has to be um, Jasmine Buller shared a fantastic story about how she said to her players in the middle of a game, you find something under your chair. And they were all like, what do you find? What do I find? And she was like, I don't know. What do you find? And so they actually reached under their chairs and she'd written them letters with secrets from their character's past. And yeah, she describes it much better than I can, but it was it sounded incredible. So as I said, loads of great tips like that to really bring your world to life as a DM. So again, turn up to that one with a notebook because there's a lot of great advice. And then finally, we finished up the day with the very long-awaited Circus of Sound, a D, D musical. This was brilliant. I mean, I know everybody was looking forward to it. Social media was just, you know, lit up with people sat expectantly by their screens for this one. And I think it definitely lived up to expectations. Absolutely fantastic. I think, um, you know, I mentioned it yesterday, but Jason Charles Miller and the DM, Kelly Lynette D'Angelo, they wrote all eight songs in two weeks, which you would never be able to tell. It was really brilliant, a really fun thing to do. And loads of you have said, using the hashtag DD celebration, that you plan to weave songs into your next campaign. So if you do, totally film it and share it, because I really want to see it. I think it's a really fun idea. So that was day two all available on YouTube if you want to watch any of it. So go check out any panels that you missed or any panels you just want to watch again. Maybe one with songs that you need to learn. So let's take a look instead at what we're doing today. We have got a fantastic schedule for today, as you'd expect for the final day of D&D celebration. So at 8 a.m. Pacific, we're kicking off the day with How to Play Draconic Heroes and Villains, hosted by Todd Kenrick. 
This is going to be a fantastic panel. We're talking about how you bring to life these iconic fantasy monsters. Of course, you know, there is nothing more iconic, particularly in Dungeons and Dragons, than a dragon. So how do we role play these creatures, both as allies and enemies? And what are the multiple ways we can incorporate draconic influences into our characters and stories? I think this one's going to be great because we're all a little bit dragon mad this weekend. Then at 9am, we have Demystifying Session Zero. So this is hosted by Kiana Shaw. And of course, it's diving into Session Zero, which is the kind of optional session you can run before you kick off a big campaign. And so usually a Session Zero is really helpful for establishing expectations, setting tone and content boundaries, kickstarting your character creation, you know, giving your players a chance to really flesh out who they're going to be in this world. And so this panel is looking at how you can make the most of your Session Zero and make it one of the most powerful tools in your DMing kit. Then at 10 a.m. we have Outlaws and Obelisks, Slowdown Showdown. Have to say, I love that title. So this is going to be DM'd by Jeremy Cobb. And again, this game, the setting has totally captured my imagination. So it's set in a land that has been ravaged by a magical cataclysm. And today we'll be seeing a small band of travellers venture deep underground to a city where time runs slower. I don't know if anybody's seen the movie Time Trap on Netflix, but I literally watched that like two days ago. So I'm very excited to see it come to life in true D&D &D fashion. I feel like it's going to be better than the movie was. And their mission is to steal advanced technology from before the apocalypse. I mean, oh, this just ticks all my boxes. I'm very excited to watch this one. Then at 12 p.m., the lovely Brandy Camel is back and she's going to be sitting down with Jeremy Crawford to Ask the Sage Live. I know that you guys love this one. So basically, any questions that you have about D&D, &D, you get to throw them at the expert. So Jeremy is going to be answering questions from the uh, from the chat, as well as some of the most frequently asked questions he gets, because I know he gets bombarded on social media. So if you have a burning question, this is the panel for you. Then at 1pm, The Dungeon and the Dragon will be DM'd by B. Dave Walters, and we'll see an unlikely band of monsters assemble to help a wronged dragon track down the heroes who stole her horde. This one's got an all-star cast, so lots of names you know and love in there, so I'm sure we'll see plenty of you watching that one. Then at 3pm, we've got the DM Challenge Champion announcement. I'm going to come back to that one, so don't worry, more info shortly. And then at 3.30pm Pacific, I will be hosting the Future of D&D &D panel with Ray Reninger, Liz Shu, Chris Perkins and Jeremy Crawford, where I will be digging into what is to come in the future of D&D. &D. I can't wait for this one. We always get some great reveals, so definitely get that one in your schedule. So... The DM challenge, a little bit about that, because we've got a big, exciting segment, as I said, later on today. But this was our fantastic challenge. It's been running for seven weeks. We had 600 entries. We narrowed them down to 10 finalists. And finally, after seven weeks of challenges, losing a contestant each week, we're down to our final three contestants. And they're all going to be joining us later on today to see who is going to be crowned our very first DM challenge champion. I cannot wait for this. It's going to be absolutely spectacular. I'm really excited to sit down and chat to them as well because the competition has been fierce. Our finalists have been absolutely incredible. They've had some fantastic challenges all set in the Feywild. We've seen them design things like villains and monsters. We've had them run encounters, which is what we're going to have a little sneak peek at later. We had them run encounters for our fantastic panel of judges, as well as two very special guests, Christina Ariel and Matthew Lillard. And that will be the deciding factor as to who wins. So as I said, oh, I can't wait for that one. It has been weeks in the making. So make sure you're back here at 3 p.m. if you want to see who we're crowning our very first winner. Now, 
Before we go, before we kick things off, I just want to shout out Extra Life, which is, of course, the wonderful cause we are supporting this weekend. So there's several ways that you can support them. You can go to the Extra Life tab on the event site, and you can also go to the snail races in our interactive map if you'd like to donate directly. And you can also pick up some gorgeous merchandise. It is absolutely gorgeous. As I said, you know, it's it's not just something with a logo slapped on it. It's really thoughtfully designed so that you get to feel good, donate and look amazing whilst you do it. And you can visit extralifeshop.com to do that. But for now, that is it from me. We are going to head into our very first panel. As I said, it's how to play draconic heroes and villains, which I can't wait for because we're dragon mad. So I will see you back here two seconds after the break. Welcome to D&D Celebration. Today we have an amazing gathering of panelists. Uh, this is all about draconic heroes and villains. I'm no, I don't know if you know this about D&D, but dragons are a key component of it. And well, dragons are kind of cool. So, and there's also a great book called Fizzband's Treasury of Dragons coming out. But I've been obsessed with dragons since I think I've ever seen a dragon. And I assume so are you if you are watching this panel. Uh, let's kind of introduce our panelists. We've got a bunch of really great people and really good friends. Abria, would you like to tell people who you are? Yeah, hi, I'm Abria Iyengar. I go by Quiddy on the internet. Um, I am a dungeon master and player all over the internet, including Dimension 20 and uh, Critical Role and literally every other channel. <laughs> all of them. Is, Just all of them. Yeah, is now fall of Abria. Uh, Mark Mir? <laughs> Hello, I'm Mark Mir. I do voices in the video games, but I also like the role-playing games of the tabletop variety. And I am currently appearing in the Black Dice Society on the official Dungeons and Dragons Twitch and YouTube channels every Thursday, which is Adventures in Ravenloft. And I'm having a lot of fun playing not only uh, a party character, but also the immortal and iconic Aslan Rex, the Lich King of Dark Arms. And nothing bad ever happens on that show. Super happy, fun time. Yeah. It's pretty chill. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a pretty chill experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's fine. Yeah. It's uh, a comfort show. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a comfort for me, but I know I'm evil and dark. Uh, I mean, I mean, calibrated to motions broadly at everything. I probably is a comfort yeah. show for a lot of people right now. Fair point. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah, I need mm. some horror in my life, but that's not my own. Uh, BD Walters. <laughs> Uh, B. Dave Walters, I say words about things, and I'm blessed to collaborate frequently with all three of these beautiful people. Uh, you can find me all over the interwebs, wherever fine streaming content can be located, including Heroes of the Plains with Todd, Black Dice Society with Mark, behind the scenes of Into the Motherlands with Abria. I'm the shadow to their collective Peter Pan. And uh, I'm going to try to herd these cats. I am Todd Kenrick, and I do a lot of D&D stuff, D&D consulting, and D&D uh, &D thoughts. D&D documentarian, maybe, even. So all, all, all of it. Uh, so let's kind of jump in. Uh, what, what, one of the things I love about dragons uh, from the get-go is I almost feel like there's only like an instinctual fear I have inside of myself as a kid that, like, dragons, those are cool but scary, and that will kill me. Uh, I, you kind of just get what dragons are. And in the D&D multiverse, they're essentially, uh, they have been framed as, when you look at the celestials or angels in the outer planes, and then in the lower planes, you have demons and fiends and devils, for the prime material plane are dragons. They are that fundamental to the prime material plane. What are, let's, talk, let's kind of focus on players right now. Do you have favorite player experiences that were draconically flavored, or do you have ideas for draconic characters that you've always wanted to explore? Uh, I, I'm going to shoot it over to you, Abria. Uh, my, I have a dream character of like a very high tier kind of like uh, like epic level 
a campaign thing of like a dragon that has been turned like forcibly turned into a person and is trying to like regain their full form i think that's an incredibly fun idea i also am very happy that like i'm currently playing a ranger who had a, a formative experience with an evil dragon and now and ha like immediately became a ranger that's like um like monster slayer and just has a very uh absolutely no dragons kick even though me personally i'm i'm a lot like you uh taught i horse girl but for dragons is how i can explain that very quickly so solid yeah solid. <laughs> that is something that does come up quite a bit is like i i think i have run into a like a, a i think who hasn't wanted just to be like i was a dragon but now i have been forced to be this humanoid and i am slowly getting my draconic power back there is like i wonder a, a level of anxiety that dragons have if they polymorph too often into being a humanoid <laughs> It's like crossing your eyes. You you maybe you get stuck. <laughs> right. That happens. That happens. Oh. oh no! Am I gonna be? A, am I gonna be a halfling forever? Uh, yeah. <laughs> How about for you? That explain a lot. Um, you know, one thing that is always surprising to me is that Dungeons and Dragons generally has a surprisingly small amount of dungeons or dragons so i try to put those things in as often as possible and my favorite example is i, I ran a, a level 20 D, D game for my patreon for a long time and it's not easy to challenge level 20 characters so i had tiamat was going to show up just as an adversary just a cr30 monster they could all fight and I originally had her show up as the Dark Lady, which is one of her manifestations. So they meet this woman and she's kind of traveling with them. And several of the characters were particularly low wisdom. So they're just very happy-go-lucky. And they're like, you're our friend, yay. And you get to the, the big reveal where she's like, fools, I'm Tiamat, duh. And they're like, our new friend is Tiamat, yes! Yes. <laughs> and at the time, I was like, what would a super intelligent dragon actually do here? And I ended up playing her like the Dread Pirate Roberts, where she was like, okay, so you're interesting. I'll probably kill you tomorrow, but I mean, I guess. Um, and so she traveled with them for a while, and I ended up having Tiamat ended up being like Missy from Doctor Who. She was just a trickster <laughs> that was always one step ahead because she was like, I could kill all of you, but I don't need to. And it ended up just being like a really fun interpretation of the character that just emerged completely organically. So now anytime I have Tiamat show up, she's basically that playful trickster and <laughs> not the ultimate evil until you push her too far then she's 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 always really is the, the ultimate evil though yeah. that, that's a really good point because that's something we will cover <laughs> in this panel is uh, uh there there is a, an intimidation factor of running dragons i would say mm -hmm. because you feel like there's a lot of expectations tiamat having a lot of them that that's like a fantastic way to play that mm-hmm like, uh, I wasn't in that game, but I vibe with that entire group. Like, oh, yeah. Tiamat's yeah. our best friend. I yeah. love you. Praise <laughs> Tiamat. Like, just immediate cultists. Like, this is fine. We choose that's, chaos. That's pretty much <laughs> what happened. And she's, uh, oh, 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 okay. I guess cool. I won't be eating you now. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah. Let's, right. Norm <laughs> let's normalize more evil parties or at least evil adjacent. Uh, I would be happy for. Uh, just saying. <laughs> how about for you, Mark? Uh, well, I'll, first of all, I'd like to state for the record that I really want to see Michelle Gomez cast as Tiamat now because <laughs> this whole Missy as Tiamat, the, yeah, this this I must see, this must happen, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, although actually, you could just cast five very well-known actresses, and, you know, <laughs> and gets a different voice, so it's like it's Michelle Gomez, and this is uh, Judy Dench is this head, and, yeah. you know, go from there. That like, yeah, the Alan same Heeran way. Is ahead. The same way Benedict Cumberbatch with Smaug would just get him down on the ground. And like, I'm yeah. the green head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, yes, so for my own personal uh, player experiences, I'm currently playing uh, Kaiservex, the cleric of Bahamut on uh, uh, D4 as a recurring guest. And I, I get to come back with him every now and then. <laughs> Oddly enough, I played him quite a bit over the pandemic, including in one weekly campaign that was just with friends. And in that campaign, I started using like a little Tyrannosaurus puppet just to, you know, because we were playing on Zoom and just trying to. And now that's that seems like an almost indelible part of Kaiserbeck. So, like, you know, when I go back to D4, even if we do it in person, I think I will have to have 
that puppet on my hand. And I should mention that even though Kaiser Vex is, a, you know, worshiper of Bahamut, lawful good, very upstanding cleric, his name, I actually did what a lot of people do, and I, I pilfered that from one of my D&D campaigns when I was a kid, because Kaiser Vex actually was uh, this very powerful black dragon that I used in a campaign uh, when I was younger. So when I had the opportunity to create this dragonborn, I think, ah, I'll just take that name. I'll take that name. And it's an evil sounding name. And that's kind of his shtick is that he was raised by Tiamat cultist uh, dragonborn and but turned to the worship of Bahamut. So, yeah, it, it all kind of fits. Can it I all just, comes full circle can, with the D&D. Can I just say the first time we played, we did a charity game when you played Kaiser Vex. And I remember we, that. And when you bust that puppet out, I was like, oh. Like, I remember screaming on the tech call. I was like, oh. Yeah. Yep. Yes. It'll be that kind yep. of show. Yes. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> you make a statement yeah. right, out, right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. good. so, you know, this pandemic, it did produce the puppet version of Kaiser Vex. So at least there's that. Are there are there implications to personalities for both like Dragonborn or, or characters that are very uh, into dragons that have a draconic origin and dragons themselves that is unique? Because dragons can live a thousand years plus. I tend towards like my my character that I've never gotten to play is just a big barbarian dragonborn path of the beast. They they just feel that they are a dragon. They will willingly eat somebody <laughs> that's yes. totally on the table. Like yes. they're just all about being a dragon. Okay, so I wouldn't be me if I didn't issue a certain disclaimer here. <laughs> intelligent creatures behave intelligently you know it's like yep. you don't have to be anything because you're a dragonborn you don't have to be evil because you're a drow or whatever so you know disclaimer given that being said i think to me dragons are i i i quintessentially think of them as the apex apex predators and what are the other apex predators are cats so i always do you have them being like very feline very subtle in their movements very like fairly you know a lot of, a lot of all we and then, <laughs> you know i'm gonna eat you only because you fit in my mouth like it's not otherwise <laughs> it doesn't matter yeah and and i think the 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 challenge when you're telling stories with creatures that are smarter than you is they're smarter than you but i i tend to i tend to portray age as honestly more like boredom mm -hmm. like i find the 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 older i make a character the less malevolent i make them in a completely different context in a different game i i had kane which is the first vampire the oldest vampire and they finally met him and they thought he was going to be like ha ha and he's like no nah, i've 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 done it all I've done it all. <laughs> like, you guys can't surprise me. I'm not interested in just hurting you. I, whatever. It was indifference, you know? Um, so I think that's one of the first questions you got to ask yourself is, what does time multiplied by intelligence do to a creature? Yeah. And kind of use that as a, as a baseline. I, I just got done talking to Jeremy Crawford about, like, when, when you're a thousand years plus, think about the things you're already kind of done with right now in your life. And how Everything. much after a thousand years, <laughs> you're like, you're going to be like your tolerance <laughs> mm -hmm. or like your nitpickiness is just going to get more and more. You're just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger about all that stuff. I mean, you know, there's that that transition into adulthood when you know you're a grown up when teenagers bother you for no reason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like when, yeah. you, when, you, when you just like see a pack of teenagers and you're like, you kids, you know, and then that's everyone everyone for dragons uh how about you for you mr mark well i think it could also theoretically be somewhat cyclical because you know like even even in our own lives we might pick up a hobby again that's like oh yeah i used to love doing this why haven't i done this in years and i could see a dragon coming back after centuries to some obsession that it had before mm. uh it also depends on how good their memories are maybe if they just forget things that they already knew oh uh, yes yeah this is, these are all interesting things that you can explore with creatures that live quite so long you know dragons liches and what have you but you know we are here to discuss uh, dragons but uh, i mean are we going to give dungeons their root their due? Is, are <laughs> not today. On dungeons, not today. No, no, no. Hey, 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 hey! People I don't care know not about at all them. for a dungeon. This is dragons. People, <laughs> people don't know about them because they're too underground. Ooh! <laughs> you did it. 
that's a very yeah. good point that's a solid that that's a solid player hook as well like you you you're not the player who knows their dragon who's trying to get back to where they were you you don't even know you're the dragon it's it's yeah. I, mean, I don't want to spoil knights of the old republic but, <laughs> but yeah you don't yeah, even know that you're so. that you're the thing well, well we talked about you know a dragon being forced into human form but what if they took on a human form and then just lived for so long in that form unaging that they forgot they were anything else i think that's the fun thing i love idea the idea of dragons as like slaves to novelty where mm -hmm. they're like i just want to feel anything that i can like experience and keep and i think that becomes like part of that like hoarding and like hoarding of experiences and and being absolutely like dazzled by novelty like a high level adventuring group comes in and you're like well okay you're gonna be like a normal one because i've got a lot of corpses on this wall wait you you're not scared of me and you're super down for all okay Tiamat, let's see how this goes. This is interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. I mean, again, when, when you talk about the fact that there's such a, like a fundamental part of the prime material plane, and there might be a lot more dragons around than you are aware of because some of them are polymorph, but like if they're that obsessed with material as well, like gold and everything else, and like you said, magical items and like that can easily transition to the real world they could be like running a crime syndicate they could be like <laughs> like well, you, you know shout out shout out to the og uh, second edition box set council of worms where you played a dragon you were all dragons like you were born as a hatchling and as you just grew up you just became a stronger dragon doing dragon stuff um i think that is also the reason why i've always enjoyed the xanathar so much yes because he's like i'm a monster but also i run a crime syndicate and you're like that seems like a thing a monster would do <laughs> yeah. i just need everyone to know that in my head the xanathar is voiced by jeff goldblum and i will not be taking questions <laughs> oh yeah no that's perfect <laughs> That's very good. I, I won't use the voice that I use for the Xanathar. I was about to say, I, 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 I have your Xanathar voice burned into my head here. That's, uh, yeah. That's... Actually, I'm, I am going to do it. It's like, I'm the Xanathar, hello? Yes! <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. baby, yes. The same voice I give my puppy when, he yes. runs, like, when he's trying to communicate to me. It was very confusing that we were like, he sounds like we can take him, but he's the Xanathar. So... But I think that like, actually kind of bringing this back to what we were talking about, uh, I think there's something about like the Xanathar being sort of fundamentally like terrifying, but like not scary when you meet them. It's the, what is that phrase? It's like money, money shouts, but wealth whispers. Mm -hmm. I think there's something about really high level, super dangerous things that are like, I'm planar bound. Like this is where I, I go here. Yeah. I'm not a God that can get put behind the gate. Like, you're in my hood and uh things are only as bad as i allow them to be that is it actually makes for dragons being like really interesting varied characters because they are so lethal that they don't have to be scary they don't right. who cares about like if i'm the sole human running around in a like house full of cats god someday let me have that uh, <laughs> i won't run around being like super stressed because i know that i control the food and i'm therefore the god of them so like there's that sense of like i don't have to like bark to keep you in line i just i am i am what i am that makes for a, a wealth of experiences that like parties can have with dragons that's a very good analogy like you don't you don't need to run around squirting them with a spray bottle all the time. They, they stay in line. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's yeah. definitely how cats work, I think. It's a, it's yeah. a definite, like, they're great because the, there's a broad emotional experience that they might have. And it, it may be, like, just casual indifference or, like, like, like smog being woken up right by, by, by Bilbo. He's just, like, kind of sleepy about it. <laughs> He's like, yeah. I'm not really worried about you. I don't even know. I haven't even smelled you before, but I, I know that I'm not scared of yeah. you to yeah. being very sensitive and very arrogant potentially yeah uh, well, yeah yeah you, you again you just got to ask yourself what does this dragon want because it wants something and and the answer is not its horde because it wants its horde but what's its horde represent to it you know why why does that wealth even matter i mean i realize at times there's literal mechanical benefits of it just having amassed this horde but it was like but what does it think that is is its wealth influence is it prestige is it, it purely just like shiny things is it baiting a trap to get people to come over it does it think does it think it's gonna do something altruistic with this money eventually you know like the, these resources um all of that will affect it i think the thing i feel the worst for 
is like the mid tier dragons. Yeah. Like like you're 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 like a, like a like an adult white dragon or black dragon or green dragon, and the other dragons just don't respect you like at all. Like you're in the swamp. Like I'm cool. I mean, ass is scary. You know, it's just and, like an ashy horse. Go away. Yeah, right. <laughs> don't right. Enjoy you. Like, like the the one thing the gold and red dragons agree on is they're better than you. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There is like the, because they do li- live so long. I think like being an adult dragon is probably very difficult and great worms don't want you in their territory necessarily they may not care but like that's the other thing there might be a dynamic amongst the dragons that is going on Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. just because you're not seeing them doesn't mean they're around or having turf wars constantly of some Mm -hmm. kind Mm -hmm. so yeah it's the thunder and the lightning in the sky during the storm is there a dragon that scares you the most uh, hand hand, uh, cards on the table Black dragons shooting jets of acid out of their mouth. I can't handle it. <laughs> so I'll yeah, never forget. It's, never, yeah. f- never forget that happening the first time in D and D. And I'm just like, someone just melted. <laughs> like I get, we've all seen dragons breathe fire, right? Or someone turn to ice and like shatter, but someone melting. <laughs> yeah, was it? Was it, a, was it the white dragons that have chlorine breath? The white dragons have a cold. Uh, chlorine comes green. out of the green, green dragons. Green, green and chlorine breath, yeah. yeah. Right. Look. Which is also awful, yeah. yeah green and black dragons die. get con- confused constantly in my head. I'm like, what do you what make do out you? of you? What awful yeah, thing yeah, do you I breathe death. stuff? I, I breathe death. Yeah, you yeah. know, I, I think a lot, a lot of that, too, falls on the dungeon master to describe these things in such a way because most of us have been doing this so long by now that we're just aware that it's like the dragon's going to hit me with 8d6 and it's like no 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 yeah, wait, yeah. wait 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 you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you, gotta, you gotta, gotta romance it a little bit you exactly. know, things like, you know? <laughs> yeah. like you said you know like that this because they'll see a black dragon and be like oh it's not as dangerous as a higher cr creature and it's like well it just melted all your food and also your horses. Yeah. So you sure? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you do, do some of that environmental stuff to, to increase the menace uh, that, that helps ratchet things up a lot. You got to, you got to describe the dragon and like, that's where it gets scary. Cause you want, this is such a, an important moment, right? Like like every dragon is almost a boss moment. Uh, mm-hmm. Even if they're on your side, even if they're your friend, you just want to like do a good job. You don't want, I mean like Benedict Cumberbatch with the, his, his motion caps capture yes. suit. Give it that level. <laughs> you don't have so to. Good. But you want to mm-hmm. see it. <laughs> you want your DM to make this a magical experience, not be like, like B Dave said, this is how many dice you get. This is how this is how much the meal is going to be tonight. And I will pick up the check. I'm like, that's yeah. that's that's not the way to be. <laughs> yeah. The, the, All the, dragons the, are cut scenes. You gotta yeah, give them a cool yeah. beat. All like, dragons <laughs> are cut scenes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Their 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 armor class and save DC are the least interesting things about these creatures. Yes. Yeah. Uh have have you ever done anything with like the radiation that seems to come off of them? Because it does feel like radiation. The fact that they spend more time with their horde uh in fizz bands, I'm not spoiling anything, but it affects their horde and it affects the land around them as well Mm -hmm. because they are such a big part of the prime material plane. They affect it over time and you can get advantages. I'm not going to say how, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay, but they they, they got a lot going on. The goofiest one shot I ever ran was for some female friends who were like, uh, we want to play D and D, but we don't want to play it. Right just do a do a do a dumb thing i was like okay this is great so uh i do remember reading about the like yeah like uh if you spend too much time in the lair so they like met a a purple dragon uh she she her breath weapon was purple stuff from the like old sunny delight commercial it was a very (laughs) very stupid day we had a great time they stole a bunch of the horde and the effect instead of an alignment shift it was like we're all girls we all know our like big three zodiac signs Ended up being a zodiac shift because uh, I decided all dragons are Tauruses because they're materialistic and nap motivated. So uh, m- the entire party ended up becoming more dragon like, but in like a weird zodiac way. So yeah, you could do anything you want with dragons. And nope. uh, I love that idea of like either corruption or just like a slight twisting because of like the heaviness of their influence in the world is very cool. Now I want to play all dragons. 
Yeah. It's funny, it's funny <laughs> that you that you bring that up because the game that I'm running here for Celebration, which our game is on Sunday, but I have no idea when you're actually seeing this because I reject the live linear time and space. Uh, is <laughs> or it has um, rejected us. <laughs> the, the 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 uh the the name of it is the Dungeon and the Dragon, and the inciting incident is a dragon has had its horde stolen and has gathered a bunch of monsters to go get it back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. That's that's what we're doing. So I like oh, that. That's great. Yeah. Should be a grand old time. Oh heck yeah. So have you have any of you like gone to play Dragonborn uh to a large extent? And what what is there like an appeal to Dragonborn? Or do you like maybe a character that is just like a human, but it has some kind of draconic energy? Like what's more appealing to you as a player? I think Dragonborn, just because, you know, I I would like to be a dragon that gets to wear pants. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's the real appeal of it. And who can, you know, fit in a normal sized wagon. That, that's fair. You get everything you get everything you get from a dragon plus accessibility. It's really worth it. <laughs> but you don't get the wings. That's why I you love my draconian, unless, my draconian unless boys. A, <laughs> unless you're a draconic uh, sorcerer, of course. That's true. Yeah, there are many subclasses that will get you wings. Uh, how about for you, Bria? Uh, I think I have spent more time playing actual Dragonborn than like people that are like influenced. I once again, I'm now I'm now very obsessed with this idea of like a mechanic of someone who has no actual draconic ancestry. Like, I don't know, just being kind of a weird stan about dragons and like trying <laughs> to get like way too into the culture. Like I want like a full Rachel Dolezal, like I am trans race, I am a dragon now, I choose this and just, just have it be like a weird, oh, awkward nightmare. Oh. <laughs> ta ta tattooed scales on you and yeah. stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, right. yeah. oh yeah. God, like all of it, just like Aquaman tattoos. Of yeah. Just yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you think about this this is a world where you know the the gods are are manifest you know uh, but, but for the most part like it's hard to actually find where umberly is you probably don't want to even if you could get to where she is you know or like well i mean like loth is in that cave i don't recommend you enter it but she is right <laughs> over there you know whereas you have this a strong enough dragon basically is a personified deity like you don't have to make the jump to bahamut tiamat you know but that you for 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 all intents and purposes when like uh, you know, when you have world ending power like uh, Hundar, the, the Red Rage, when he attacked Mintarn was like a seismic shift in the whole story of the Forgotten Realms, which is why when I wrote Dungeons and Dragons of Dark and Wish, I based it all around Hundar's attack. And his whole thing was like, hey, keep paying me my tribute. I won't come kill you. I'm gonna go sleep in my volcano. And they did it for a while. And then they were like, we haven't seen him in a minute. Maybe we can ease up on these payments. And they stopped. And when they stopped, he woke up, came and wrecked Mintarn, and then went back to sleep, <laughs> you know? Um, so, seeing, right? So understanding that I would then put something like that on a pedestal makes sense. It's like, I get I get yeah. tear, tear since the thunder and the lightning. That's cool, that's cool, that's cool. But I watched Hundar wreck everything. Yeah. So uh, bow down. You know, so being a dragon cultist in some ways makes more sense to me. And the Fizzbangs goes into, and they've, they, they've already kind of talked about this, but Fizzbangs go, goes into the fact that uh, Tiamat and Bahamut both create the very first world and mm -hmm. everyone wasn't necessarily invited. So suddenly <laughs> like humans and elves and celestials and demons started showing up and they're like, uh, and then something happened to the first world and it exploded yeah. and turned into shards and created all the other worlds that you see, like, like, you know, uh, like Kryn and everything else. But then this idea that they've kind of come up with this with this books so that some dragons are so powerful, like the first world they have echoes on many planets and they can even communicate eventually with their echoes. So uh, yeah, I know Loki has been very popular recently. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the Immediate villain from Kang. Loki being very popular. Uh, Bri and I have Kang. talked about this. Kang yes, is a very good example of like, there could be a dragon who has a Shadowfell ver version of itself, a Feywild version of itself, you know, uh, a, Dr a Dracolich version. They're all connected and maybe feeding off of each other. And it becomes this kind of multiverse dragon epic kind of story that's that, 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 that I don't know. I'm very eager to sink mm -hmm. my teeth into 
I was about to say, I'm I sure that's. I to get this book. Oh my I was God. About to say, I'm sure that's the last you've heard of that plot point involving any of us in any way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someday yeah. they'll look back as these four minds meant, met and went, we can do what? Yeah. That's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, mm -hmm. that, that's why I'm excited. That's why I, I love dragons because the more you think about, the more you can come up with cooler and cooler lore and come up with different dragons and different personalities and reasons. Uh, I'm very curious, Mark, because like, obviously everyone here is a performer, but like, uh, what creepy voice would you do for a dragon? Because I haven't heard you do one. I'm just putting you on the spot. I just want to know what you think the physicality would be if you wanted to scare your players. Uh, well, I think it would depend on what kind of dragon. Like, I, you know, we've mentioned uh, Benedict Cumberbatch's Smaug several yeah. times. And I think for the current modern era, that is the archetypical red dragon. It was a very good performance. And it's like, yes, that is what, what a red dragon is like. For uh, the more maligned black dragon, we talked about how the black dragon doesn't get as much respect. Yeah, I think they're, for one thing, they're the creepiest looking and they've got like, you know, the weird curved forward horns and this very skeletal face. Yeah. So for a black dragon, for example, uh, I would probably want to, well, I put a little water in my mouth. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and you would want it to see my sibilant. I'm drooling a little. I'm sorry. Uh, so yeah, I don't like it. Like, and I love you know, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm into it. Weapon. Think about the breath weapon. Think about uh, what kind of evil it evokes. Uh, a lawful dragon is probably going to be a little more measured and precise in its speech than a chaotic dragon. Uh, let's see. For a blue dragon, they're you know they again their their physical structure is so you know bull like. They're just very thick, solid dragons, and they're highly intelligent spell users and uh, and the electricity. So for something like that, you might even want to introduce sort of an electrical sound to their voice. You know, that kind of, you know, we'll see. Don't do that for too long. You'll hurt yourself. But uh, yeah, so again, I would look at the situation, look at the dragon, look at its age, and that I would approach it just like I would approach any other character. That's fantastic. Dope. That, I, yeah, I know. I'm just like taking notes. <laughs> Can I just say my brain went to heaven thinking about like a multiversal dragon. And as the party fights different like uh, planes versions, it's a different DM running their own like special lair encounter. That would be so fun to call in a friend and be like, hey, you try to kill my party real quick. Yeah. It's your turn. Oh, yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm, tell me, I'm, Todd, when, when does this book come out? Yeah, when yeah, yeah, yeah. Real, soon, really, real soon. Real soon. Real soon. Okay, good. Uh, I, please. I, I will just I will just say I've had that happen where somebody was like, come in and break the party. And I'm all like, important point of clarification. Do you mean break the party? Yeah. <laughs> you know? yes. I mean, I right. think you, you I, and I, I have done it. Yeah. yeah. I think you and I have done it. Because was, what's yeah. nice as a DM is when you bring in a friend to kill the party, you're like... <laughs> Wasn't, yeah. me, wasn't me. I'm not the only one with hands I, in this I world. I don't know. Man. That's, that's like a I love playing good cop, complicit cop. Like that's like a corporation bringing in somebody from out of town to fire everybody. That <laughs> that is cold. That I, is I, will, I, 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 I will just say I, I came in and I was lucky to run a game for the fantastic people over at D4, uh, and things happen because I am who I am. <laughs> and then I met them like two weeks ago when we all got together and they walked up to me and they were like, we're still mad at you for that session. And I'm yes. like, good. <laughs> yes. Good. yes. Let the hate flow. Yes, good. <laughs> when you're <laughs> strong enough, when you're powerful enough, come find me again. <laughs> exactly. I apologize. To quote Conor McGregor, I apologize for absolutely nothing. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing we haven't talked we talked about like the dragon worshippers but like it does occur to me and it's kind of like a big part of like you know uh you know pete's magic dragon or puff the magic dragon is uh the economy of dragons like hunting dragons for their blood or hunting dragons oh, yeah. for their horde or for some peace for a spell uh or to gain power magically by slaying one you know there's like we, we've seen th that in and in, in our own history about just like you know little snake oil salesmen you know, there's got to be like some people are treating dragons like whales, maybe. And so mm -hmm. maybe those are the nemesis or maybe that's what you're into. Maybe you're like, I'm, I'm a dragon slayer. That's what I do. I just go town mm -hmm. to town. <laughs> I mean, just just knowing that there's this thing with unfathomable wealth, you know, even you just think is unfathomable wealth. Some people would shoot their shot just from just that solely. 
You know what I mean? Like if you were like, there's a dragon horde at the bottom of an active nuclear reactor, there's dudes that would go, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah. I'm sorry, Bri, I'm stuck on the, uh, each, each DM is playing. Look, I'm dragon. thinking about it a it's lot solid. too. Yeah. Oh, that's so I, 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 I ran a game. It, was, it wasn't a D and D game, but we had like a kind of head dungeon master. And then we had a couple of, we had two or three other people that wanted to dungeon master as well. And we would trade off that way. Someone got to be the dungeon master could be a player, not burn out. And then someone would else would hop in. And that would like be a perfect scenario. It makes so much sense. And, and the, the fact that they're all kind of like echoing each other is just so perfect. Yeah. I love you know? that. I also <laughs> like the idea that like dragon hunting as uh, like as an economy for adventurers. I like the idea of a dra like a very ancient dragon being at the top of that. Like, yeah, you have to like thin the field. Oh. Apex predators. <laughs> so yeah, I'll take a, what did I ask for? A splint deeply magical take your gold go away i think there to be fewer in this area i'd rather have a bunch of like knuckleheads bumping off my competition than me having to get up and go outside like a farmer and do it myself if you think if you think about it too that uh, if various editions have made the gods more or less tangible, more or less statted out, you know, to what extent you could go find tier and kill tier has varied a lot. Uh, and dragons usually sit very high or atop the list of deities that you actually can find and throw hands with, you know, like they, they really are. I mean, especially Tiamat, Tiamat's CR 30, but she's one of the strongest things that you can actually locate and do battle with. And actively you know? wants to throw hands. <laughs> right, yeah, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, but you can. Good. You know? yeah. She's throwing heads, she's throwing heads. She's throwing heads, yeah, she's two, two hands, a lot of heads though. Yeah, right, mm-hmm. Uh, that's fantastic, yeah, they, it, it, it is, uh, sorry you, you you got me you got me i lost my thought but yeah for for, for that the idea that bria just mentioned i love that the elder dragon is hiring adventurers to kill the lesser dragons that's so messed up in such like a dragon kind of mob <laughs> you gave me the idea because you were like well like in this discussion sorry i had that idea like eight seconds before i said it so it's a half of a thought but that idea of like what does a horde mean to a dragon is yeah. an influence i think like a dragon that's like no i have to collect the shiny stuff i don't personally care about it beyond like it's good for my lower back and i'm very old uh but the rest of it i, I make adventurers like carve the world into my image for me that's fine we're great yeah, I like I like that a lot. But it's like, yeah, I'm not interested so much in the money. I'm interested in goods and services, which can be purchased with this money. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and now these, you know, these small little hairless weird mammals are going to do everything I need and I can just sit back. And, yeah. the world that i do i it, my own homebrew which actually ended up being most of the charity games that i've run that abri has been a part of is there was a dragon at the center of the of the civilization yeah and and yeah this glycender my girl you know and that was her whole thing like her horde was civilization basically <laughs> it was right. built up around her and expanded and it's like everything is mine you know my horde is everything um, and every once in a while, I come out and get my own claws dirty, and then I go back, and you guys keep reaching out. Yeah, so that was her motivation. I, I know two things that we're also getting in the book for Fizz Bands, which I'm very excited for, is uh, Monk, Way of the Ascendant Dragon, which is just a monk just throwing draconic energy out, being able to like briefly fly, all of that kind of stuff. But then we're getting a Drake Warden Ranger, and I will say this, I've seen the art for the Ranger Drake Warden, and it's the most adorable thing you've ever seen for a subclass, but they make sure that you know that you can fly on your Drake. You're like, your Drake evolves with you, gets more powerful, eventually gets wings. Uh, so I'm very excited for those subclass. I see that Bria is. Look, I love box. a Ranger and I'm very into this. <laughs> <sighs> The very first game of D&D I ever played, uh, there's like a tiny thing. It was the Tyranny of Dragons, like both books. And at some point, I don't know if our DM just like added it, but you had the opportunity to like fly onto like a moving castle with like a little wyvern. And of course I fought 
the entire encounter to keep mine. And that became my entire identity. So I, I love this idea. I would like to have a good boy, a good scaly boy and write it. I heard two interpretations. Like one is like, I, I very, yeah, I, I just want a dragon. <laughs> Yeah. And I want like, and then the DM can't come for it because I'm like, I'm just gonna summon it again, or it's a manifestation <laughs> of your draconic energy as well. But oh, I yeah, love that. yeah, I, I I think those are two subclasses that were very well received in Unearthed Arcana, and the draconic mo monk is nasty. It's 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 nasty. Also, we've talking got, about throwing hands. Yeah, Whew. we're getting, we're getting draconic new like very chromatic metallic and gem, uh, dragonborn as well oh, we're getting really? gem dragonborn yes we are really? yes very yeah. very extra yeah glitter dragons yep yeah Thank glitter you. yeah but dazzle dragons okay. but dazzle dragons mm -hmm. yeah well that that, that i was, will be sending uh, was... a edible arrangement to the wizard of the coast for this <laughs> gift for me specifically exactly Thank you. Yes, uh, make your offering so they do not come down from on high to smite yes, us exactly. yeah uh, yeah, that that the gym dragons were a big deal in previous editions, so I'm I'm happy to see that that coming back again. If you think about it, also, you know, it's all like I get that you're made out of precious metals, but it's like, girl, I'm made out of lapis lazuli. What are you talking about? Look at this. Look at look at this. Look at this sheen. Yeah, look at this sparkle. Yeah. <laughs> you're not gonna ever get me to be scared of one of those. I'm like, you're a devil. <laughs> What about uh, dragons in times of war? And I think that, you know, Dragonlance and Crins specifically talked to that of like, what happens when Tiamat or Tachesis or Bahamut and Paladine, which are all kind of like echoes of each other are like, no, everyone go to war. Because we also know that Tiamat does this with the Gets Yankee. We don't know all the reasons why, but Tiamat is like, Here, here's a bunch of red dragons. Go hunt the Mind Flayers. I don't like them. Uh, and they do it. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like, what, what are some cool ways to incorporate uh, dragons in warfare in a story about war? I think you know, they, they fit together so perfectly because historically, of course, you saw many armies marching under the banner of a dragon and using that as a sigil. And it just naturally fits together because it's a living engine of war. It's its own artillery. It's its air support. It's, uh, it's a force of destruction that pretty much guarantees the other side has to have dragons as well, or they get pushed out. Fair. I, I think it, if you're gonna do something like that, you should always make sure it matters, mm. uh, because something that it always bothers me in storytelling, and this is a trope that you'll see a lot, that the first time you encounter something, you get one. And so you know should you should be afraid of it. In Deep Space Nine, the first time you met the Jim Hadar, there was one. In the new Doctor Who, the first time you met the Daleks, there was one. And you're like, oh no, it's terrible. And then the next time you see it, there's thousands. And then it kind of doesn't matter anymore because yeah. it's, a, it's supposed to raise the stakes of like, ooh, one was bad. Now there's so many, but they become faceless when there's so many. Like you'd be better served having one dragon general who may or may not even care about your people's strategy. And you know, and you're fighting alongside it and it is your death star, like Mark was saying, yeah. uh, rather than the sky is darkened by the wings of a dozen dragons. Well, you know, a dozen is the same as a thousand past a certain point, it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, was, that was one thing Game of Thrones did really well that, you know, back for its seven season run, when, uh, you know, <laughs> there's three dragons, only three. Oh no, now there's two. Oh yeah. no, now there's one, you know, like it, meant something whereas yeah. if she if she'd hatched 50 eggs wouldn't have yeah agreed yeah. Like, uh, or, or, or the stakes the, the, the monumental effect of the that many dragons being around just destroys a continent kind of thing you were saying exactly Maria? and like what how do people even matter after like a certain threshold of like dragon intervention but i do like this idea of like when we talk about dragons as god analogs like having dragons as a very like the Greek gods during the Odyssey who are kind of like on the side taking bets, like throwing uh, uh, influence and uh, advice behind like people that they like the most. But I also like this idea of like, I don't know, what if metallic dragons as like a sign of their goodness, like you're not considered an adult metallic dragon until you fought in a war in defense of like humanity oh wow mm -hmm. so now you have this reason for a dragon to be there that mm -hmm. like is this sort of perpetual service and something that means something 
to like draconic culture and isn't necessarily tied to like, yes, P protect man. That's fine and good. This is important for me because this is like my bar mitzvah. This is my bar mitzvah. Uh, my yeah. bar mitzvah. That's what I was thinking in my head. hundred percent. And then chromatic dragons probably do that too. And they're like, okay, well, I'm just going to show up and try to ruin your day. I was thinking so pilgrimage, but I really like bar mitzvah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like a draconic quinceanera. Like, like yeah. this really fluffy dress and then breath weapon. Also, yes. I would be remiss if I didn't point out the, the underground hit cult movie that I love, even though it is so bad, Rain of Fire. Rain of Rain, Fire oh, is yeah. the best oh, yeah. dragon yes. movie. Never seen it. It makes you scared um, of dragons. I mean, like, you know, it? yeah. It is it is good because it's bad. Let me put it oh, like that. Yeah. Like they yeah. like there's some there's some parts of it you're like, I don't know why that's a thing, but this is a journey I've agreed to come on. So here we are. Yeah. <laughs> yes. it, yeah. in, in that it is where but it makes dragons scary. Yep. When the dragons show up, you have a problem. Yeah, that's why you should watch it. You know, a, a lot of times you can accomplish these encounters in such a way that they become more frightening. Like say you come, they come into the dragon's lair and it is this voluminous cave complex with all these like side passages that the dragon knows. So it crawls out of one of these passages and grabs somebody and leaves. You know, it comes up somewhere else, breath weapon and leaves. You know, like that. one of the main things you can do to really challenge a party is hit them without giving them something to hit back. There was a there was another 2E module. I keep motioning over there because all my box sets are over there. Um, <laughs> call, it's uh, all a green screen. I don't believe it. It's true. It's imagination. Uh, it was called uh, Dragon Mountain. And the whole premise of it was there was a dragon's horde and the dragon's dead and kobolds took over and kobolds have rigged the whole place with traps. And so it's a high level adventure and they're still CR one half kobolds, but they're gorillas that like hit and run and just never give you a moment to hit them back. And even if you manage to like, because they're just tormenting you as you're making your way through this whole thing. And even if you get a lucky shot and you drop one, you're like, oh, okay, I killed a kobold. Like I feel real, real tough now. Um, and it is all, all about that strategery on the side of the enemy, which is something that is always, always, always at your disposal. Yeah, you, th these are dragons live for th like uh, th thousands of years. They know you're coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like they know you're going to like they, they know the lay of their house pretty well. You know <laughs> their lay. I definitely need to see way more like jigsaw level dragons who are like. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Oh no, if you get to see me, but I built a whole lair. That's this weird thing that's just entertaining me. So anyway, mm -hmm. good luck. It's gonna be I, I really mean, scary when that dragon rides in on a tricycle wearing a yeah. <laughs> That's what the horde is for. You melt I mean, it all down. That's that is the entire premise of Dungeon of the Mad Mage. So why not mm -hmm. with it with a dragon? So the, the fact that we do have like this this uh, incredible amount of new information coming out about dragons themselves in the book. Uh, how what are some interesting ways that dungeon masters can integrate dragons into their existing campaigns or maybe a campaign that they're starting for the first time? Thoughts? How how would you go about doing that? Like, because suddenly, because you know, new D and D books come out come out, and you get super excited about new things. Like, how would you bring dragons in? What's a what's a good way to do that? Uh, we talked earlier about dragons as you know serving the sort of Xanathar role as as crime lords and things like that. And that's always a good way to bring in whether it's a dragon or a fiend or a very powerful monster, you can sort of retroactively find out that, oh, mm. they were behind those brigands that we that we encountered when we were level one. And then, oh, those hobgoblins that we fought when we were level two, they were also being backed by this. So you don't necessarily have to have that plan in when you start the campaign. You can just sort of, as I say, retroactively insert this very powerful monster into continuity when it is time for your, when your players have at least a chance of, of facing it directly. Dragons of Skrulls is a legitimate choice. Like, yeah. like, yeah. like, oh, yeah. like you've already I met mean, three. <laughs> he didn't know it. True. Also, you know, there's an elder brain dragon that is basically a dragon scroll. So also, <laughs> I'm sure this is the last you've heard of an elder brain dragon as well. I don't like that you've introduced that into my brain meat. I don't. Oh, it'll introduce you into the brain meat. <laughs> I, feel, I feel more worried because I'm playing black dice. Well. <laughs> you should. No, worry you, worry that's a legitimate it. fear. Yeah, yeah. 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 That, that's a threat for you, Mark. It's upsetting <laughs> art for me. <laughs> it is. It is not. It is. It's neither. It's not a threat. It's a promise. Yeah. Um, let yeah. me say. Um, I will say when we were talking about playing creatures that are smarter than you. 
one thing you can do there is allow yourself to be a little meta that is the players do something unless it is completely off the wall have the dragon know they're doing it because it was smart enough to figure this out in advance maybe you weren't but it was you know so that it's like i comprehend that there's only three ways into this cave i have contingency plans for all three of those things so that when they do something again don't punish them if they do something truly 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 ingenious like yeah. you know if, if, if they l l you know have geese laden with greek fire that they fly in the top of the hole like maybe Look, the dragon didn't see that coming geese are a very good strategy you yeah, cannot yes. change my mind about I, I do not like the cobra chickens but otherwise <laughs> you know have the the but the dragon knowing that like of course you did x and yeah. therefore not being surprised is a way to simulate that. So I will just say, just as an aside, the, uh, in the Art of War, actually in the Art of War, that the idea that they had, they were trapped, uh, they were being besieged in a mountaintop fortress. And so they lit the oxen on fire and sent them down the mountain path <laughs> into the enemy army. That really happened, by the way. That's really in the Art of War. So stuff like that can work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I've allowed it. My, my own wife, like, tossed uh, just... Uh, dead bodies from a funeral home at Strahd's castle full of alchemist fire. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, you wouldn't expect that. Legitimate <laughs> no. strategy. You can't expect Enjoy that. This. You can't, you never know what gnomes are going to do. Yeah. He's, uh, he's, I don't he's, know he's, what I'm, what I'm going to say. There's yeah. no way for a dragon to predict it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a this surprise Str for everyone. <laughs> Strahd is the supreme tactician, but he has not accounted for Whittle. Yeah, I can verify. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but I even kind of playing uh, in a more like light and comedic because dragons tend to be like inherently very like, oh, this is a this is a gravitas adding moment. Mm -hmm. But even if you're playing in a game that's kind of fundamentally very like comedically driven uh, for me, I always love the like and they it was a human that was a dragon all along, like put the like dra like the polymorphed dragon in, but make it incredibly obvious that they are a polymorph <laughs> dragon. Like, let the party know right away, like, this is a dragon that thinks they're slick and you know exactly what's up. And now there's like a game, like, now you can play like a social game with them of trying to figure out what this like, very oh. clearly a dragon wants from you as a party. And it could be like a very fun side thing in, in the midst of an extant campaign. So you don't have to run something that's like dragon minded, just look, there's this woman, she shows up in a, like a, a gold, like actual gold outfit every time. And when she uh, she blinks, she's got an ictitating membrane. We can all see it. That is a dragon and I don't know why she's following us. Sure. But she keeps smiling and saying, yes, keep going. And I don't know why. Oh, hello, <laughs> hello, hello humans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hello other humans. How obvious should we make it? Like, should she be named? Dr. Agon or yes. Dr. Agon. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Agon. And I'm here too. Well, exactly. Well, I think we have a new show called What We Do in the Lairs. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> I, I also like the scary version of that is like, you, you all know that this dragon is polymorph, but if it knows that you know, yes. <laughs> it's, it's like, going to kill you. I was like, oh, yeah. It's like the vampire like from yeah. Fright Night. Yeah, He's you like, have to. You saw me. <laughs> you have to maintain the kayfabe because uh, a bemused dragon is better mm -hmm. than one that knows what's up. And that's good for any kind of campaign. I love that. I, I want like a polymorphed human that has like, but the weight combined weight of a full dragon. So like every time it sits in yes. the chair, the chair just explodes. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, yeah. the, the, the uh, weak oak. <laughs> Famously <laughs> weak. Oh. <laughs> Famously weak oak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And they constantly make dragon puns. Oh, God, yeah. Uh, I was really yeah. dragging my butt to get here. I tell yeah. you can't imagine the scale of what I'm considering. Oh, You're like, yeah, oh, exactly. stop it. Yeah. Doctor, <laughs> knock it off. <laughs> Dr. Yep. Agon, you. Mm -hmm. please, please don't kill us, Dr. Agon, please. Hold yeah. on, I am obsessed with this character <laughs> now. Dr. Agon, I think. Dr. Agon. Dr. Agon. I like, and there are like good dragons and evil dragons that are semi play, like some are going to play with their food and some are just like playful, charismatic, comedic characters that want to talk your ear off. So like, yeah, yeah. Play, playing a dragon that is like, doesn't know its own size can also be a threat. <laughs> one of my one of my favorite uh, portrayals of that was uh, the book Grendel by John Gardner, which is the epic of Beowulf, but from Grendel's point of view. And when Ooh. Grendel goes to talk to the dragon, that's what the dragon's like. The dragon's just having a great time and thinks like humans and Grendel are stupid. And like, the, he's just messing with him and like laughing and cutting jokes. And at one point, Grendel reaches down and picks up a gem to throw at the dragon because he's mad. And it's like, ha ha ha, stop. 
And he's like, <laughs> got it. Cool. Don't touch your stuff. Got it. And then the dragon goes back to having a great time. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love it. <laughs> oh, love a dragon. That always scares me in a movie. When someone's like being mm-hmm. all happy and jo- and it's like this fun and like amenable and then just like, like, like switch and you're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> There's a scene in Atlanta, actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which yes. I quote constantly with, because they're like hanging out with this real, very famous musician who's a very big deal. And uh, all of a sudden he just yells at the audio guy. And he's like, I would never hurt you, but I'm not the only one with hands in this world. And it's just a moment of like, you thought you were friends. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that. He can destroy you. <laughs> and then dragons have that kind of element to them, even even a nice one. I, I think mm-hmm. so. Uh, any other uh, any other ways to like insert dragons into an existing campaign? We've already talked about the polymorph, but maybe one that's been sleeping for a long time, that's been underground, that was just a legend, is a solid way. Uh, there are certainly a lot of little tiny monsters, maybe that could gather like kobolds and stuff like that. Oh, I will say one thing that I haven't mentioned is you know yes we we're talking about the high end dragons, but a lower level party can have a pitched battle against a wyvern. Yeah. yeah. You take you, you take a group of like level two, level three, and you send in a CR6 wyvern, like they are gonna have the fight of their lives. So you don't have to necessarily wait to this like grandiose high thing. That's why there's multiple age dragons. You can kind of scratch this itch at any point. Yeah. And even a dragonling a dragonling is is kind of terrifying. I think that's a good yeah. adventure hook as well. Like what if you find a dragonling that has gone away and you like a hatchling and you uh you, you just touch it now it smells like you. And dragons go be looking for you. <laughs> yes. It, it rejects its young. It smells of man. Yeah. Ah! Or, or 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 the or the hatchling just follows you around. You're like, oh, please don't. Yes. <laughs> like it, it's a cute threat. It's a cute it's like, threat. It's flames. Yeah. yeah m- Mama right. bear is coming for everyone in the party. Uh, Although you you could see that being evil dragons using that as a tactic. Like if they plant a wormling with a with a good aligned party, they know. They will never hurt that thing. There, no one is going to let anyone any harm come to that. It'll be their mascot, and then when it reaches adolescence, it can just destroy whatever town it's in and take it over. So, I love that. That's messed up. That is some changeling. Yeah. That's so good. Irish mythology, creepy stuff. Cuckoo birds, man. Cuckoo birds. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh. Oh, that's so good. Because you know, you know, players, they they immediately adopt anything. And it's, it's something as cool as a dragon. I like, resemble oh, no, that remark, remark then. sir. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that's fantastic. I apologize. Well, uh, I think we're about out of time. Uh, uh, again, tell, uh, tell us why you love dragons and who you are and where you can be found. Same order. I'll go. It's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Abria Iyengar. Uh, you can follow me on social media at Quiddy, Q U I D V I E. Um, I love dragons because I think I want to be a dragon now that I know more about them. Incredibly powerful, motivated to do things two to three hours a day maximum. Love that for them. Fantastic. Um, you can uh, you can see some of my work over on Dimension Twenty. I ran Misfits and Magic, which is available on Dropout TV, and we're also constant. Yeah. I- Time's a weird soup. Uh, you can also catch me playing Antiope, uh, famously loves hunting dragons uh, on The Seven, which is airing now on Dropout. Uh, you can also go and catch all the episodes of my run of Exandria Unlimited on Critical Role's uh, YouTube channel. And uh, you can catch me live on Into the Motherlands on Cypher of Tears channel on Wednesdays and on Fridays over on Failed Save on Pixel Circus's channel. All right, be Dave. Um, you're not not a dragon now by that list of criteria. Yeah. You know that, right? Yeah. My horde is games I've played or run. <laughs> it, it is accumulating rapidly, yes. Uh, B. Dave Walters, I say words about things. You can find me all over the interwebs where fine streaming content can be located. Uh, creative director for Demiplane, uh, Heroes of the Plains, Into the Motherlands, lead designer, uh, DM of Black Dice Society. Um, I do things. Hopefully, uh, I think... I don't know when our game's gonna air relative to when you're seeing this, but it's Sunday, check it out. Uh, because time and space is a lie, I haven't taped it yet, but I have taped it by the time you saw this and I assure you it's incredible. Um, it's Suicide Squad meets the Five Deadly Venoms, honestly, Fantastic. is what it's gonna be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's gonna be a grand old time. Uh, and uh, yeah, everything Mark Mayer says and does is correct. That's it. All right, Mark. 
Hello, I'm Mark Meir. I do the voices in the video games. If you want to hear my voice, you can play the Mass Effect Legendary Edition. You can play some of the Dragon Age games. You can play the Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition. You can play the Long Dark. And if you want to watch me play some RPGs, you can watch the Black Dice Society on Thursdays on the Dungeons and Dragons Twitch and YouTube channel. Uh, you can also listen to me on Stitch of Fate, a podcast by night, which is a Vampire the Masquerade podcast that I, we have started over the last couple of years. Uh, few months and uh, also of course I'm available available on cameo for all your Mass Effect catchphrase related needs and I, I like dragons because uh, like them I like my food charred and I like to sleep on a big pile of money <laughs> hold on can I buy cameos of you just saying dragon stuff yeah oh, totally I can I can give you like as much uh, Dr. Yes. Agon material as yes. you <laughs> I just, I just, I just need a dinner with Doctor Agen and Kaiser Vex. That's it. This is oh back and forth. Yeah. It's the reboot of Dinner with Andre that we deserve. I did actually buy another puppet while I was at the puppetry center in Atlanta, so I do have a dragon puppet as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good to know. Good to know. Well. Uh, well, that's our that's our dragon panel, uh, everyone for drag for D and D celebration. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you t for our amazing uh, panelists. I'm really excited about everything. like I'm like I was already excited before, but after talking to you all with such great ideas, uh, yeah, I'm I'm probably not going to be able to sleep tonight. Uh, <laughs> so I I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much for being on the show, and uh, thank you everyone. If you are in chat now, or if you are watching this on YouTube, leave a comment. Tell us your draconic ideas for characters for plot lines and just kind of share it with the community because uh you know like just like tia matt uh five heads is better than one <laughs> i, I almost got the fifth there. head yeah yeah all right thank you everyone just The inspiration for Neverfall really started with the Archfey, uh, Lunara Darkwake, who is the this kind of um, luminescent moon-type creature who is kind of like, she's a cross between the moon and the jellyfish, which is strange enough. You have ventured across the forests and lakes of the Sfei domain to meet and bargain with Lunara Darkwake, the Archfey of Neverfall and renowned master of wish magic. And I just started building around that and like the moon led to stars and stars led to wishes and it kind of all gelled together like that. The greatest part of the Dungeon Master Challenge for me has been just challenging myself every week to come up with something new and to come up with something that I maybe wouldn't have worked on otherwise. So just exercising creativity. everyone and welcome to demystifying session zero um a panel that we're very excited to bring here to D, D celebration 2021 um yeah so before we get started into what session zero is all that great stuff uh, i do want to start off by saying hi i'm kiana i am uh the host the moderator and one of the panelists here for this panel I'm very excited to be here and to have all these wonderful faces around me uh, who are also here to bring their expertise on running games and session zeros, uh, whether it's in actual plays or in convention games or private paid games or home games. They're some of the best of the best. I'm very excited to have them here and to be talking with us uh, so we can help give you advice uh, on how to best run session zeros because they're really important. Um, and they make your games better, whether you're a new DM, or whether you've been playing and running games for several, several years. Um, so yes, yeah, so without further ado, I do want to say hello to all of our other wonderful panelists here. Tell us who they are, um, a little bit of background about what they do and all that good stuff. Uh, so let's start off with 
Lauren. Hello, Lauren. <laughs> Hi, we've never met before. Never, ever. Wink. I am <laughs> Lauren. I'm that salty ginger over on Twitter. I use she, her pronouns. I'm also the salty half of Salty Sweet Games with my best friend, Kiana. <gasps> She's right there. Incredible. <laughs> Uh, I do a lot of things in the tabletop community besides streaming. I've been a professional game master. I work for Roll20 on the content conversion team and many other things. I wear a lot of hats. There are many within reach of me right now. I think five. That's what I have told you about myself. Hello. I'm very excited to talk about Session Zeros because I love them. I think they're great. That's me done. Hooray. All right, and let's go over to RK. Hello, RK. Hi, uh, I'm RK Wild. I am a podcaster, streamer, um, safety consultant, and professional GM. Uh, I'm a safety consultant currently with Start Playing Games, which is a site that allows GMs to run pro games uh, and get paid for their work. Um, and I'm also the GM of Prison Pals and the creator of Fear in Living Color, a soon-to-be-coming-out actual play podcast uh, and you can find me on twitter at russ wildest hell yeah and let's go over to connie hello connie hey everyone i'm connie pronouns they he and she i am a professional gm game designer and screenwriter uh, my bread and butter thing is transplanar rpg which i am the gm and producer for it is an all transgender people of color led 100 percent homebrew dungeons and dragons fifth edition live streamed actual play campaign set in an original non-colonial anti-orientalist world if that sounds like your jam check us out saturdays at 3 p.m u.s central time on twitch um or you can check out our podcast which drops every other uh every tuesday actually We've been on a really nice weekly schedule uh, for that good, good actual play content. Uh, I've run games for Magpie Games Curated pl a Play Program for uh, for as a paid GM. I've done plenty of home games, running D&D, &D, running masks, all sort of systems out there. Um, and I'm really also excited to be bringing the perspective of a game designer to this conversation as well. Uh, I'm really excited to dig into the topic uh, today with my fellow panelists here. So I'm going to pass the baton back to Keith. Kiana. Perfect. Uh, and I said a little bit about myself, but uh, a little bit more. Uh, I'm at Kiana. My pronoun is she and they. I'm all over the internet as at Kiana S. I am a, a TTRBG designer, streamer, uh, and also the co-curator of the TTRBG Safety Toolkit, a resource, a uh, free accessible resource that is made to help uh, safety and support tools uh, be more accessible and usable uh, for people by compiling them all in one place. Um, yeah, and you may also recognize me uh, from my work in Candlekeep Mysteries uh, as well, uh, and just kind of floating on the internet. I'm sure you've heard me in, in some places or another. Um, and if not, hi, nice to meet you. Um, yeah, so we're going to kind of just get into this. Uh, basically, uh, we're just going to do a little bit of a 101 uh, about what Session Zero is, uh, and then uh, hop into not only that, but also how you can use session zeros um, in and like as a GM uh, and be able to really leverage all the cool information that you get from there, um, when you should be running it, um, how you should be running it, if you're running it for uh, you know your friends versus a group of strangers you're playing with for the first time. Oh, and we're just gonna kind of hop back and forth between all of these important topics to talk about uh, and making sure that you have the most uh, use out of this really useful tool. It's uh, probably one of the most powerful tools that you can have in your DMing toolkit. So uh, yeah, so basically, I guess we should start off with what is session zero? You know, penultimate question of all this in case you're coming in from this. Um, there is a really great thing that uh, in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, I have the fancy a fancy cover here Ooh. um but in uh this we actually get an introduction to session zeros um there's also several other places where you can learn more about session zeros um but the basics of it is that um when you're a dm you have plenty of things to think about when you're about to run a game so that includes making sure that everyone is on the same page uh about you know what the one shot or campaign or whatever game you're going to be running is going to be like for you and your players um so session zero is a tool that helps you just with that with setting those expectations um that includes also setting the tone 
um, any content boundaries. So if anyone says yes or no that they want to have in the game, um, it also helps you set expectations for character creation, uh, deciding you know what characters are going to be involved uh, in this campaign or this game that you're going to be playing, um, and just general stuff about how to make your game more fun for everybody that's going to be there. Uh, have I missed anything? Does that feel that I feel like that encompasses what a session zero is? <laughs> yeah, it feels like a good starting point. Yeah, so setting ex expectations, that's the basics of it. Um, but um, beyond that is a very, very powerful tool that you can use. You know, you're going to get a lot of information when you're doing a session zero. Uh, and we're going to talk about, you know, uh, stuff like when do you use it? When do when do y'all use session zeros in your games? Um, because you know, from the name, it kind of sounds like it doesn't start anywhere. Session <laughs> zero. <laughs> so the name's a bit of a misnomer for me. I run session zeros at the start of a campaign before we meet characters, before we do all that stuff. But I also revisit session zeros. So if we've had a long break, like if there's a season break when it comes to an actual play, uh, if like something really tense has happened in a previous session and like players have expressed concerns or I have concerns about safety things, we'll run another session zero. And it's more just like, it is called session zero, but for me, it's more of use when safety is a concern or when like you're just getting back and need to get more comfortable with each other again. Um, and so for the first part, you use it when you first start and then you use it when you need to afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. I use session zero, even if I'm only playing one session of a game, I will still have a section of that session that I call session zero. Uh, for safety, for genre and tone a lot, because I run a lot of horror games, right? So I like to set that up before we actually even get into it. So everybody kind of knows what we're all going for as we tell this story together. Mm -hmm. Just to sort of echo what everyone else has said already, uh, even for like a one shot, which I run usually three to four hours, a piece. Um, usually the first hour I dedicate to the entirety of session zero uh, of that, which includes uh, setting expectations, uh, character creation, going over rules and safety tools, and anything else we might have missed during that like initial setup phase. So session zero really to me, I feel like there's like a little bit of like in the D&D community of like, what's a session zero? We don't need that. Pa, come like first session, guns a blazing, ready to role play. And I'm like, you're that's that's a dangerous road to tread down, my friend, because <laughs> I feel like that just sort of um, breeds a table where no one really knows how to talk about conflict, and you sort of have to count on the GM to also be a facilitator uh, in addition to a game master, which is a different tool, which is a different set of skills, I would say, than it takes to like actually run like a campaign in a game. So I would say like session zeros, I run them every, like I always have them, whether it's like one-on-one -on -one session zeros, if like we can't all get together and meet before like the start of a campaign, or if it's just an over discord, or if it's all, like, like this, like we all sit down in a Zoom meeting and we talk about it before the actual campaign begins. Whatever fits the table, fits the needs and fits the actual game we're gonna be playing, whether it's a one shot, uh, streamed, home, paid, whatever. I love what yeah. you said, Connie. Uh, session zero, uh, you know, GM being slightly different from facilitator. Like, I feel like a session zero can take some of that pressure and expectation off of the GM that can happen if you don't have one of these and you're in the middle of the game. And, like, of course, the, you're the GM. You have to decide how this resolves. Like... Well, if you have a session zero, maybe you've already discussed that or maybe you have the tools to discuss that. So it doesn't all fall on the GM's shoulders while they're also, you know, juggling uh, everything to do with the campaign, the lore, the mechanics, all of that. So I, I think it's a great way to kind of lift the burden off the GM's shoulders just a little, which is always nice. That's always, that's a really good point. And actually, I think it's leading uh, right into, you know, what I want to talk about next, which is, you know, why is it important to have a session zero and set expectations at the table? Uh, Connie, you kind of touched on that already, where, you know, um, if you just go in guns are blazing and there's no expectations set, you kind of can just end up in the stranded uh, in the middle of your game, unsure where to go next. <laughs> um, you know, Muppet it's arms. never great. 
<laughs> just, just kind of look around and be like, I don't know what's going to happen next. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I say, when we say ex- set expectations, um, I think we mean several things here. Uh, so there are some things which are, you know, setting expectations about, you know, the tone. Uh, Lauren, you kind of talked about this with, you know, like, are we going for a spooky story? Are we going for a super high powered action adventure uh, where we're going to feel really powerful heroes? Uh, or are we going to, you know, go on to Strahd's uh, Barovia and feel like everything's terrible <laughs> uh, and that you feel very powerless? Like, that's going to, if someone comes in with very different expectations of what kind of game that is in that sense, it's very jarring because. That's how you get, um, you know, joke characters that are coming into a very serious game. And you're like, this is a great character, but maybe not in, you know, when we're trying to do this very serious game about morality or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, How else, uh, why else is it important to set expectations? Like what kind of expectations are you setting uh, in session zero? Uh, One thing that I always set expectations with is safety. Um, So like, I specifically use the safety toolkit and go over the tools that I use at my table. Um, In addition, it's also important to set expectations when it comes to like table rules. If you've changed rules with the game, if you have specific rules as a GM of like, hey, if someone's in a scene, don't interrupt that scene. Like, don't do that. Don't like butt into their moment. Let them have their moment. Or if it's stuff like, hey, if you're going to be late, let us know. It can be like small things of expectations of just like common courtesies that maybe they don't have at other tables or like you want to establish so it's understood with everyone. Um, and talking like you said, talking about like characters, you don't want to be the person who shows up with a high magic elven wizard in the grim, dark, no magic fantasy setting. Because then that entire idea you built, that entire character you've created, immediately in the garbage. Doesn't fit in the world. Can't work. Um, But also works for a GM because you can set expectations of, like, what you want from your players. Like, one of the things that I do is I use Stars and Wishes. And we do that right at the end of uh, Session Zero. And Stars and Wishes is a safety system, for those who don't know, that allows players to say, hey, here were things that I really liked. And here are things I'm really looking forward to. And it allows my players to basically say, hey, here's what I want from the future sessions. Here's what I want to explore in the story-wise, which means that once once session zero is done, I can then go and do a bunch of planning and, like, take the notes I have from what they said and use it against them. (laughs) Like, it's it's great. It does excellent work for you. Mm-hmm. I'm also a big advocate of doing less work as a GM always. Yes. <laughs> I feel like that needs to be taped up on my wall where I can see it. Uh, also to sort of echo what RK has said, a question I always ask for longer term campaigns uh, is what do you want to get out of this experience? Right? Like, what are you looking for? What's your power fantasy here? Right? Like, why are you playing this game? And like, how can I cater to that? Right? Or how can I build encounters around that and make sure that everyone sort of gets to shine throughout the course of the campaign? Um, Basically, like, it's. I'll have players who are like, I'm here to get real messed up. Just mess me up. Here are a bunch of knives. Stick me with them. And then there are players who are like, if you touch my character, I will, I will, I as the player, will cry i will like burst into tears in a real bad way and i will not be able to handle it and i'll be like great i need to make sure i don't like accidentally stick knives in the in the sensitive player right and like give like the player who wants to get you become like a a knife block like all of the (laughs) fluffy romances right um i also think like specifically in terms of DD fifth edition session zeros which i run kind of differently from other systems uh i will have my players rank the three pillars of uh of play uh and if they really truly don't have a preference then that's also useful i'll be like do you prefer combat role player exploration right like some players be like i like all of them you know and some players will be like i really don't like puzzles please for the love of god don't give me puzzles in that aspect of exploration like don't give that to me and some players will be like role play above everything i don't really like combat and that's also really useful for me when i'm designing encounters specifically in fifth edition um and like their answers you know my players answers always help me with designing the feel of the campaign and also what the story will look like uh and i you know session zero is also a a opportunity for me to generate seeds for session one i want to make sure that like the like what um 
RK said, uh, the, the wishes they might have come up with during session zero, I always like to have a wish list. And I'll be like, what, you know, what are specific things you want? In addition to lines and veils, like stuff we're just not gonna touch, right? We're touched with caution. Like what are things that you actively are inviting me to throw at you, right? And I'll try to like start throwing those things in like starting session one. So people already feel like, oh, dang, like all the, all the stuff we generated, all the grist we've set down, all the seeds we've sown in session zero are already bearing fruit, right? Already starting to sprout. And that usually generates a sense of excitement as well, because I feel like some people see session zeros as like, oh boy, we gotta talk about the bad stuff. We gotta talk about what's not allowed, which is true, you do. But also it's like an opportunity for you to share your hopes and dreams for the campaign and for the game. Yeah, y'all have both covered uh, a lot of what I like to do in my session zeros as well. I'll sometimes even like specifically for actual plays, if we're putting out like a, a casting call, I'll try to do even some of that work in the casting call. So it's not limited to just this one session, as you were saying, RK. Uh, we ran a horror podcast recently called Missing Annie Lee. And when we put out that casting call, it was like, this is not about longevity. We're not going to explore lands. We are going to tell this kind of uh, real people in horrifying circumstances story. And it is about leaning into that danger. It is about putting your character at risk. So it may just not be the game that you want to do, but for those who want to, they have that expectation and you kind of find, you know, your people for this particular story. Uh, I also really like to use for expectations. I am, I'll say it, I am not a world builder. I don't always like enjoy like fleshing out the entire world, but you know what I love is using Session Zero and the players who have assembled to build the world. That is my favorite thing. I think that can absolutely be a part of your Session Zero to set the expectations because then you're not the only one setting them, right? Like you're sharing the reins and the the creation of the world together. So so it's, it's like a form of Stars and Wishes, right? Because now... Your players have come up with this. You know what they're interested in, what, they, what they've what they brought to the table. So you can say, oh, okay, well, now I'll flesh out that because I know my characters were interested in that. Uh, yeah. And that's yeah. like... Yeah, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was going to say, that's like exactly the thing, right? So part of what I do for my session zeros is that once we've gone through all the safety stuff, I always start with that. We get into the actual characters and everything, right? And what I'll do is I'll look at my players and be like, okay, tell me about your character. Tell me about what you have, what you don't have. If you don't have anything, that's fine. I'll go to someone else who might have something. We'll start building them out. And I'll tell them basically, tell me a little summary of your character and what their life was like, what's important to them, that kind of stuff. And the player will go through and describe their character. And then what I'll tell everyone at the table is ask questions. Ask whatever questions you want to ask. And I'll ask questions too. Uh, I play a lot of Monster of the Week. It's one of the games that I run the most, especially as a paid GM. And there's a whole history section that we don't even touch until we understand the characters and who we're going into the story with. So I've had players who've asked incredible questions that I would have never thought of. Like, oh, I have this character who's a teenager. They're fighting monsters. And one of my players looks at that person and goes, okay, if you're fighting monsters... What happened to your family? Where are they? Where are they in this picture? And it just immediately like completely changed the tone for that character and made it like less of a like, yay, I'm fighting monsters and more of like, oh, something tragic happened and allows <laughs> to build out the story. And then once again, as a GM, you pull those knives, you take those knives and you put them into the campaign and throw it at them. And like, not only does it allow you to plan for the characters, but allows for players to plan around each other allow them to think like, okay, how's my character going to react to you? Or how's my character going to react to you? If we've been in the same group together for months and months, how do we handle each other? How do we react? Are we friends? Are we more than friends? Do we hate each other? And like, I feel like it really allows players to enter session one with a rapport already going. Yeah, that gives them, like, confidence, because you're not like, uh, how do we interact? I don't know, because you you figured some of that stuff out, and it'll change, of course, it'll evolve, 
but yeah, that that stuff is so much fun. I think yeah, I think it's in in Tasha's. Uh, they have this. A uh, little table about like origins, uh, party origins, and party formation. It's all about asking questions. I think um, are any of the characters related to each other? Like what keeps you together? How did you meet? Like things like that. Just asking those questions will prompt a response. Which is questions are great. Questions, bread and butter. Always ask questions, even if yeah. it's just like, what do you do? <laughs> What do you do? Why are you here? What's going on? Um, <laughs> and I mean, I think we, we've, we've touched on it uh, several times with RK and stuff. Um, but yeah, setting the expectations about safety at the table um, and content boundaries uh, and invitations are really, really important in session zero and are a great opportunity to do that. Uh, so, you know, talking about what uh, safety tools are you going to be using? Um, there's so many out there uh, and different ones work for different tables. Uh, you know, there's lines of veils, uh, there's X and O cards, uh, there's stars and wishes, there's the Luxton technique. Um, I could spend literally days like just listing off all of them. Uh, you know, check out the TTRPG safety toolkit. Uh, but uh, <laughs> um, but really what you're looking for in a session gym when you're setting expectations about the table is, you know, making sure that everyone is bought in to whatever way that you're making sure everyone feels comfortable uh, and safe uh, doing this stuff. And what we mean by safe is, you know, that no matter what terrible things are happening to the characters, because there can be terrible things happening to the characters, uh, the players are still enjoying themselves and having fun. Um, because that's, that's at the end of the day, that's that's what we're here for, is to have fun at the table. And sometimes that can be by doing, you know, touching upon typically uncomfortable subjects. So that can happen with, you know, engaging in scary things. Um, but that shouldn't come at the cost of, you know, actually hurting your players um, or actually, you know, doing anything harmful to them or uh, anything like that. Um, and so session zero is a great option to not only talk about what safety tools you're using, uh, but also to establish um, content boundaries and invitations. So things like saying, which is what you would use stuff like lining veils for, uh, to talk about, you know, what is not on the table. Um, and this is also super helpful for you as a DM, because uh, when you know what's not on the table, you know what you can actually lead into. It's like, um, I like to say it's like bungee jumping, where it's like, if you know that you've got a safety line and you know the boundaries of where you're following, if you where you're following and how deep that's going to go, but you also know that you're going to be able to come back out, then you're great. You can feel safe doing that. Um, but if you have no idea what people um, might not be cool with, um, you know, exploring and playing, um, then, it, you know, you're kind of like tiptoeing around and being like, well, am I, am I doing okay? Is this, is this okay for everybody? Um, so, yeah, so being able to establish uh, at the very top and then continually uh, throughout if you're doing a long-term thing, um, what people are into exploring what they're not is super, super important. Um, and, you know, you can do this several different ways, uh, whether that's, you know, an anonymous Google form or, uh, you know, just having a quick conversation being like, hey, uh, is, are people feeling this today? Because um, sometimes, you know, one day maybe you're super gung-ho and into, you know, I want to beat up the scariest monsters. And sometimes you're just like, you know what, today I just, I just want to pet a puppy and just like, go help a child. And you're like, cool. <laughs> Good to know. Um, in that same breath, uh, as we kind of talked about, also talking about content invitations, uh, being explicit about what you do want to explore is also very helpful um, as for players and DMs to go, okay, so we know what we don't want to explore, we know what we do want to explore, and then we have everything that's kind of in between. Um, and you can, you know, with common sense, pull on whatever else is, uh, is on the table uh, to use in your games. Uh, yeah, I think, I think we mostly covered expectations and stuff. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, I have sort of an outline, but you know, I'm, I'm just more interested in hearing what you guys have to yeah, say. Yeah, I think just with finishing up expectations, you know, I think when I was first getting into the hobby, I always thought that the GM was like a puppet master, like controlling everything from above. And I think with session zero, in particular, you really see how the whole thing is is collaborative, uh, and I think that can just inform like your play style. Like it, it's so wild how 
how much easier it becomes to GM when you use a tool like this and you're collaborating with your players. It's great. Yeah, collaboration is key. Um, as a DM, you're also another player at the table. You should also be having fun. And hope, and session zero is just one of those things of making sure that everyone's having fun at the table, including you. And like we've said before, making it a lot easier for you in the long run. Because you might be doing like session zeros and like this little bit of work more often, but it means you have less work altogether. So it's great. It's a win-win for you. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm specifically interested because all of you come from great different backgrounds of, you know, actual play, of, you know, private games, of, of convention and paid games and all that stuff. I want to I wanna hear more about, you know, because our, the people who are watching, um, they may be coming in and put, and having to run session zeros differently uh, for different scenarios or people and all that stuff, you know. How do you end up uh, changing session zeros if you're playing with, you know, friends you've been playing together with for 10 years versus, you know, people you've never played with before? Um, and, you know, what if you don't have time to do, like, set, set a whole, like, separate session zero uh, before, you know, like a convention game where you're just going to be sitting down with people that you've never met before and they've never met you before and you're just going. Um, how, do you, how do you adjust session zeros uh, yourself for your different uh, play styles and play areas and play scenarios? I don't know how. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That made sense. That was good. Cool. Um, surprisingly, it doesn't really change for the people I'm playing with. Like my girlfriend, we've been together for three years. She's probably the person I know most in the world besides like my sister. And I will still do a thorough session zero whenever we are playing a game just to like touch base. Every campaign is different. So uh setting doesn't matter as much to like what I do. Uh, I think for something like conventions or like when I was running uh, for Magpie, you know, sometimes I'll be doing a one shot. We've got four hours. We got to get a session zero in there somehow. The way I'll adjust is my other session zeros are pretty kind of free form. Like we'll go in whatever order as long as we hit on everything. Uh, that's good. But for something that is that has a time limit, I'll I'll write out a script. You know, I'll kind of uh, parse it down. If we're if we're playing a one shot, I'll kind of write out content warnings. Like if I'm running Zombie World, um, there are zombies in it, and you might die from zombies or for like from these other things. Like that is a possibility with this game, so you'll know that going into a game of mine. And then I just kind of make sure we cover safety and we usually do character creation at the table in my experience. Uh, so it's, it's, it's maybe skimmed down a bit and I'm super efficient at it when I was like doing it regularly. Um, but the content doesn't change too much except, you know, streamlined. Uh, so a lot of my session zero work actually happens before session zero, uh, especially coming from actual plays and paid games online. I can't bring a bunch of different concepts to the players and be like, which of these do you like? Because there's too many options or people are indecisive. So what I normally do is I go, here's the game we're going to be playing. Like, here's the system we'll be playing here's the basic story. So with Monster of the Week, I'll go, here's the basic mystery. You're all students at the school. A professor recently died. And while you were on vacation for winter break, you got an email from said professor with a prophecy attached. You come back to school. What happens next? And that sets the, the wheels moving. And part of that is I use uh, what I believe is called CATS. Uh, which is an acronym for concept, aim, theme, and subject matter. Uh, and it's basically a way for you to basically have like a one-page blurb that tells your players, here's what's going on in the world, here's what's happening, roll with it. Like, let's see where it goes. And it allows you to also put like safety tools in there, but also talk about like, here's the world, here are the limitations, and allow you to set up so if you do have a sit-down session zero, 
you can get through that stuff much quicker. Players already have ideas flowing for the characters. They can easily build them at the table, that kind of stuff. Uh, that way there's not a million questions about the world and what's happening in the world. So you're not spending too much time world building on your side and more world building for your players and what they're interested in and their stories. Um, so I think that that's, that's really how I run it, whether it's actual plays or paid games, um, especially with start playing games, because I have to list a template on there that says, here's the game I'm running, here's what you'll be playing, that kind of stuff, and letting people know that ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I think... I really want to just like echo what RK, RK is just dropping like wisdom bombs here, like out here being like, this is what I do and this is why you should do it. And I completely agree. Um, for like an actual play scenario, I like RK, I have, I have a premise already and I'm like casting care, like players or seeking players who will be able to gr like grapple with deepen turn on its head and just generally explore the themes that are prevalent in the premise and in the system, right? So like a dungeon crawl four shot using D&D fifth edition with eighth level players where death is probably going to happen is going to, I'm going to be looking for different types of players than for like a royal ball one shot where you're all like, you know, scheming scions mm. of various houses, right? Like I would, yeah, like what one, a, you know, a player could play either of those game those systems right but like would be drawn to these different premises for different reasons and i'd want to make sure that the players specifically for actual plays are the best suited players with that particular premise um and i want to say i've never heard of the cats abbreviation before but i'm going to start using it because i feel like that's so helpful in like struck like writing a pitch basically uh my screenwriting background actually comes into handy really well uh when it comes to like writing and flavoring pitches because i'm so used to working with like a single sentence log line right or like mm -hmm. a two sentence log line being like when x happens y must do z or else you know a will occur you know so i'm always trying to think like what are the players objectives here right like what are they trying to accomplish? What's like the big finale that they can kind of expect going into this if it's like a paid game, right? Because paid games probably aren't persistent ca campaigns with no end date, right? Because like they're paying for a certain number of sessions, right? Uh, or you're on like a monthly module if you're running paid games through Patreon or something, which I am doing, so I'm putting that in. Um, but for instance, for like Magpie, like the the longest term quote unquote campaign I've run, it was a four session masks campaign. And I set it up like from the jump, like, session four these two factions are gonna clash and like ev like the players know it i know it as a gm and like the fun is like playing the tension up to the clash and trying to see if they can like gather allies right and like discover mysteries and secrets behind these two factions before the clash occurs but they were all looking forward to like the final finale like battle right like there was there was like no doubt like no brainer was gonna happen but uh, they all knew it going in and they're able to like design their like teenage superheroes uh with very strong and specific relationships to each of the two factions in question. Um, so those are my two cents bouncing mm. off of RK. Yeah. Uh, you know, what has a great uh, kind of template for all this is we, uh, Kian and I recently, recently played good society and they have a whole section about like, what genre is this? Do you care about historical accuracy? Like all of that kind of thing. And I think that is so useful, especially when you're doing something, you know, that has, uh, limited sessions or you're at a convention like that's such a great shorthand like are we doing rom-com or are we doing like kind of brooding introspective uh in that case Jane Austen era yeah that's a good one yeah for sure um and I guess for those of you who are watching who are more you know you're just running games for your uh, friends or family at home um you do have a little more flexibility to uh build a pitch uh, with the rest of your your group there. Uh, but th their four sessions do is also really important because it goes, okay, you're starting from scratch. Where do you go? And session zero is a great way to go, okay, so what does everyone kind of want to play? Um, and you can go from there with to say, oh, we want to do, you know, go adventuring across favor and you go cool uh or is you know i want to go into barovia or i uh you know go to any of the other ravenloft areas um or they want to go into the Feywild, wild which you know 
having the new module out is really helpful that way. Um, so from there, once you start getting that, you can go, okay, maybe I can, and you can just start asking like, oh, do, you, do we want to do a module? Do we want to do homebrew? Um, that's also very helpful to know because, you know, sometimes uh, you might find it very useful to use a module. Uh, and sometimes the players will just want something and you might want something as a DM uh, that's totally brand new and totally cool. Um, and uh, being able to understand where that's going is important. Uh, so session zero, you know, basically just how much information are you getting and to what extent uh, is going to be dependent on, you know, how much time you have um, and how much uh, space to customize you have. But there's always space to do session zero. I don't think we can ever, I don't think there's any place where you cannot have a session zero whatsoever. Um, because like we've said before, you can do it in that game session. You can take the first hour to just be like, okay, so what do we want to do and all that stuff. And improv is going to be your best friend that it always is with, with D and D, uh, or other TTRPGs, uh, and all that. Yeah. And like, there's also an in-between between like starting from nothing and going with one specific pitch is you can make multiple pitches especially for friends uh this summer i played a monster of the week game with a bunch of college friends and i made six different pitches and gave them all six and basically said pick your top three we'll play the best one and they all picked what they wanted but you know what's great about that i now have five ready pitches that are ready to go out for another game and in fact i did run another one of those during the summer as well for my paid games and it worked out great because I knew what I was doing and it made it so that like work in the future was easier. Do less work, just as a reminder. Do less work, <laughs> the motto of this panel. <laughs> just, just do less work. <laughs> do this little bit of work here and then you're set, you're good, you're cool. Um, yeah, um, that was all really, really cool insights into, you know, how y'all have kind of adapted session games to each of um, you know, your games, but I, I would really love to dive a little bit more into, um, you know, there are so many different ways to run session zeros. What resources do y'all use? What, what types of, uh, you know, tips and tricks do you have, uh, that makes running session zeros a lot easier for you? Cause that's, you know, there's a lot of information that you're gathering, a lot of stuff that you're kind of seeking to get from your players. Like, and sometimes players are kind of weird about giving that type of information. Cause they're like, I don't know. I don't know what I want. Like, how how do you draw those tough answers out of them? I, I say tough answers. They're not. Um, how do how do you encourage people to, to talk about these things and and really get that information? Yes. Ooh, hello. Ooh, 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 me. <laughs> um, the thing I love most is using other games. It does not have to be the game you're about to run. I mean, I've used when when coming up with characters and how the party knows each other. I've used Never Have I Ever. It's so easy. Everyone knows how to play it, and you learn so much without feeling like the pressure to like wax on about everything your character's been through. You're just like, have I? Do I think my character's done that? Yes or no? Okay, and then maybe you get to like tell a little bit about it, and you could maybe do it in character depending how much you've already done. But like, that's a really short, simple one. I've used, like I said, I don't like world building in a vacuum. I just, I don't like it. So I will use something like the quiet year, right? If we if we have the time, I will literally play another game and we'll all build the world and get ideas for our characters from that. I had a great session zero for a cipher game, but we used dialect to come up with like a specific slang for the world that we wanted to make. I think stuff like that is so useful. So if you have the time, I seriously recommend just doing a one shot of another game and seeing what that sparks for, for a home game I ran, you know, we wanted bonds. So we pulled from some, it was a D and D game set in water deep, but we wanted our party to have been together for a while so we pulled from Powered by the Apocalypse games. We just went in there and we're like, what are the like debts and bonds and things that we could pull from this that we could kind of adapt to make it work for D&D? Like, okay, so how do our characters know each other? My character did this for you or your character screwed my friend over or whatever it is. Uh, but yeah, I think pulling from other games is a great way to just make your uh, D&D session like and world sing that's my that's my biggest tip my biggest tip 
jumping play on the beer pong in character <laughs> writing that down that would be amazing <laughs> that would be so much fun <laughs> But jumping off of what Lauren said, playing games within games, I've actually played Microscope to build a world before, which has been so much fun because we ended up making a Papa John's Infinity Stones world. And it was so ridiculous and all over the place. But it was it was fun. We had a great time with that campaign, even though it was short, but like it was great. And then also just like one th- I've mentioned this a ton is safety. I start off with safety because starting with that will tell me instantly who's about safety, like who's going to take safety seriously, but also who amongst the players would it be good to call on when it comes to like certain things, when it comes to like, oh, hey, what does your character do here? Like it lets me know before we even get to character building how my players will be reacting. Just going over safety. I always start it not just because it's like, the important thing for like setting up characters so we're not touching subjects that other people don't want to touch but also because it gives you a lot of information as a gm reading your players and being like well this player has been very attentive and like listening and like nodding along so i'll call on them see if they have any ideas for their character that kind of stuff and it helps you inform yourself to like try and get people out of their shells um and if you're running a game where you have one of your friends in it and a bunch of strangers call on your friend Make your friend, put them in the spotlight. Have them help you out. Have them break the ice. Um, And I especially find that, like, as someone who's neurodiverse, as a player, when I play in games, having someone else break the ice makes things so much easier. If someone else makes a joke that's really funny, or, like, if there's, like, safety tools that are ready in there, like, it immediately makes things easier as a player. It makes it easier for me to follow along. It makes it me trust the gm and the other players more having that sort of moment of understanding and conversation <laughs> there's yeah, that I mean, moment of, of my stuff had already been covered <laughs> <laughs> i was like there's that pause yes i knew it would happen i love yeah. that pause yeah it's like well <laughs> Both of those were things I would say <laughs> in my own <laughs> experience. So great. <laughs> uh, no, that's great. I'm so glad. Thanks for being so it. informed. <laughs> Problem. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think kind of, you know, going beyond that, um, finding what worked for you in terms as a, as a DM for not only collecting the information, but be able to go through and and pick out what's most important to you to build off and work off. Um, I often use a form like a like a Google form or like a uh, like a piece of paper. Uh, And I'll I'll think about like what I specifically am looking to ask for uh, my player to answer Uh, to stuff about, you know, not only content boundaries and invitations, but also, you know, like what I think we've talked about this before is like, what would you like at the end of this game? to be the to outcome of what you know ex- your experience is um i've definitely had players who are like i want you to kill my character as fast as you can i'll make it a challenge i'm like Speed cool run. great let me just yeet <laughs> to rask at you how fun i guess uh, <laughs> um but you know like being able to uh to find what worked for you there so there's uh, stuff like the monty cook safety checklist uh which is a great form for there um there's you know plenty of lines and veil sheets out there uh, which also uh, includes stuff like invitations or like uh, ask first which is like you know hey maybe I I think I do want to do this but I would like you to let to like ask ahead of time uh, before you do it just in case Um, and uh, it's also a great place to to talk about um, relationships uh, beyond like you know how we met before but like are you going to have romantic relationships in your games Um, it's a great place to put that there too because Romantic relationship between player characters and NPCs or player characters and player characters can be really cool. Uh, also not great if people don't consent to it. So like having that ahead of time, it's, it's a good idea. Um, so being able to find what makes sense to you, whether it's a, it's a free form conversation and you're just na- taking notes for yourself uh, or you're like, here, spend five minutes filling out this form, give it back to me and I'll read through it 
and I'll come back to you with with you know the key bits of information. Um, like I said before, there's like tons of different tools out there and tons of different safety tools and uh, toolkits and, and resources that are out there to help with this type of stuff. It's all about what's going to work for you and what's going to work for the rest of your players. Um, so I, I really would suggest taking the time for you as a DM uh, and as a table to go through and go, what works? Uh, if you already know your players, then that's great because you can kind of go, well, I mean, nobody really wants to spend, you know, five minutes filling out a form and that's fine. Uh, we'll just talk instead. And sometimes it'll be like, people don't really want to be, you know, tell everyone about all this, you know, straight up. So let me just give you a piece of paper and you can answer these questions privately and I'll read them and we'll make sure that all of that's anonymous, uh, but all the information's still there anyways. Uh, so yeah, so getting a good read on what you and your table need uh, is is important. <laughs> be Be aware of that. Um, that, you know, what works for one game will not work for another. What works for one person will not work for another. Go find what works best for you. <laughs> got anything else, Connie? <laughs> got, got, or is, uh, have I mean, we, have we taken all the words from you? <laughs> y'all said a lot of great things. I'm low-key, like, taking notes here. Like, oh, my <laughs> all right, I'm going to do that next time. Okay, <laughs> I'm learning here. <laughs> um, yeah i mean there's just so many cool things i've heard of people doing their session zeros that i just want to try like this idea of like i've heard of people like rolling out a piece of graph paper and session zero everyone just draws the world map you know like we just there, 30 minutes people sit down and people just draw on it right or like rolling out the graph paper and everyone just spills pulls all their dice together and, and then you draw the boundaries of the map along like how the dice spill so there's just like especially in a home game like a kitchen table game with your friends like you have so much latitude to just like do stuff you could just be like you know what let's spend 30 minutes an hour together just like building this world together using these like other systems like microscope or like never have i ever or like any other sort of system that's out there like to like flesh it out such a great idea i also think in terms of world building because uh, Lauren, I feel like I'm on not the opposite side, but I'm definitely farther away from you in terms of like how I feel about yeah, world yeah, building. Yeah. I really like it. <laughs> I'm like one of those GMs who like, I'm a little bit of a control freak sometimes. I like <laughs> being able to be like, this is the citadel of darkness. You know, when my players is like, I feel like my character is actually, and I'm like, no, no one's ever been inside the citadel of darkness. It's yes, important to me. Yes. So I think like laying expectations during session zero of how much control mm. players will have over the world is important as well. Cause I've, had players who are like, I want to be able to collaborate. I want to be able to name the barkeeps. I want to be able to say that there's also a citadel of light that opposes the citadel of darkness. Like, I want to be able to do this and that, right? And then there will be players who will be like, I don't want to know jack crap about anything. I want you to tell me. I want to discover stuff that you make for me, right? And it's also it's also complicated when you have those two exact same types of people at the same table, because then you still like, you know, you have, sort of have to like learn to juggle personalities as well as like different kinds of desires while you're in play. And session zero is a great sampler for that. You can sort of be like, okay, this person's looking for this, that person's looking for that. Got it, right? Um, so there's no like right or wrong answer, right? There's no like, oh, it's wrong to let your players collaborate on your game and you're a bad GM if you don't like world building. Like that's not true, right? It's also not true that you're a quote unquote bad GM if you're like, I have a very specific world that I've spent a lot of time building and I'm inviting you into this realm as opposed to like you being co creators of this realm like both forms and everything in between and outside of that are valid ways of play just make sure you're on the same page about it before it begins right like how much power is a player going to have over like the shape of the world which i think is different from player agency because i'm a strong proponent of mm -hmm. like player agency in every game um and that's different from like being able to control what happens in the world i think totally completely I have so many thoughts. Yeah, we're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like so many. <laughs> yeah. Um, God, I'm, I'm, I, we're, we're running, getting close to the end of our time uh, here. Uh, so I, I do want to, uh, you know, let everyone have a last little word about, you know, session two. Is, is, is there, there were many things we talked about in the last, you know, 45 50 minutes uh but i would i would love to hear you know what anything last thoughts last bit of tips anything that you want our our viewers today to to take away 
uh, from our conversation today uh, when they're going into their own games and, and starting to run uh, their their own session zeros. What 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 words of wisdom do you all have? <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Hi, I'm a GM <laughs> who has really bad memory. Um, so my games with friends and games that are being paid, I record. And then what I do is that when it's about time for the next session, I will rewatch the session at two times speed and take any notes that I need and prep for the future session. That has cut down my prep time from hours and hours and hours to about two hours for a three hour game, which isn't bad. And that's like not even just session zeros, but like everything. I record every session just because it makes my life so much easier. And allows me to run, I think at one point I was running five games a week. So I only had two days where I wasn't running a game. Makes it much easier to do that kind of stuff. Yep. Yeah. You know, they get mixed up when you're doing so many. I remember. I remember having to do that many games. It's a lot. (laughs) Lauren, Connie? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll hop in. GMs. Hi. Hello. Um... Don't worry, fam. You just let others like you can outsource things, especially like even in session zero, like uh, with, you know, safety, like it's not just all on you. Right. You make a collaborative Google Doc, you make a collaborative Spotify playlist or Pinterest board. Right. That everyone can get in on. So just like what you can like you don't have to you don't have to come up with why the parties together you could maybe that's in your pitch that i mean that that would be really cool but you don't have to like you are at that table with the people you want to play with and you decide what your campaign is going to be there and it's just not all on you so uh yeah that's what i would like to leave everyone with connie (laughs) Mm. uh my piece of advice my last piece of advice is going to be very specific uh this is for if you are in a session zero uh, and you have a specific pitch and it's either for a one shot or for like a, a can or like a four shot or something or like a smaller campaign or not even, but it's w- this only applies if you have a specific pitch that all the players have already bought into. Uh, come up with a list of, I would say three to five pitch specific questions. Like for example, if you're running D&D fifth edition and the pitch is the professor pitch, right? Like a list of questions I'm already thinking of is like, uh, how do you all know the professor? you vacation together on winter break, where'd you go? Like, who got too blackout drunk uh, on the break? You know, and like, who ended up in jail? Who right? looked and, up? Like, who ended up having to call their mom? Right, <laughs> something, yeah, something, <laughs> something like that, right? Just like, really specific questions that will then like help establish relationships between the characters, uh, how they feel about each other, and also their specific buy-in to the pitch. Like, so they already know by session one why they're here, why they're investigating the death of this professor, right? And like why, you know, that email matters so much to them and why them specifically. So that would be my final piece of advice, I think. And like, have a lot of fun thinking of these questions, right? This is like the fun part of GMing. Like, you, you're you deciding this. This is when your puppet master can sort of like come out a little bit. Like, you're, you're designing the little strings attached to your little players. Uh, characters um and yeah the kinds of questions you ask will also definitely shape the tone and the themes of the game too so no pressure really no pressure seriously uh but this is like your chance to sort of like shine and like show your devious side a little bit and like communicate to the players the things you care about uh and the things hopefully that they'll care about too uh when it comes to the comes to the campaign i guess that's my i guess that's my parting piece of advice because y'all all said <laughs> such amazing things <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's a summary. Yeah, what's up? Parker? One thing. Uh, this is something that has saved my life. Give scheduling to one of your players. Make one of your players yes. responsible for scheduling. Yes. Yes. That's it. Session zero is a great way to expect set expectations on who schedules um, and what your schedule is. Um, yeah, I think that's our time. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for coming in and listening. Thank you all to our wonderful panelists who came in and sprouted their wisdom. Please go check them out. You can see their Twitter handles and all that stuff. And we hope you have a great rest of your D&D celebration 2021. We'll see y'all later. <laughs> Bye.
for me, the uh, greatest part of the Dungeon Masters challenge uh, has been the creative inspiration, really. The, the kind of kick in the pants I needed to really kind of finally put these ideas on the page. Of, you know, I've always had these creative uh, inspiration and just getting it out there, executing it. Intrepid adventurers find themselves in a world of darkness and twilight. Pinpricks of starlight blanket the sky, providing the realm with some illumination, and more importantly, its primary source of allure, wishes. Yes, the uh, DM challenge has inspired me to create more content, and I, I do intend to get right on that as soon as Witchlight comes out. While I'll be on the Witchlight, uh, I'm planning on uh, doing some writing involving that, and, and in fact, running that campaign uh, for my players uh, here in New Zealand. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's exciting D&D celebration broadcast of Outlaws and Obelisks Slowdown Showdown. I am your DM, Jeremy Cobb, uh, from the show TB Halflings, and today I am joined by, uh, we'll, I guess we'll go in order across the, like, the chat there, so I guess we'll start with you, honey. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Honey, a.k.a. Honey and Dice. And that's who I am. <laughs> All right. And next. Hi, I'm Izza, uh, or Evil Clever Dog. Um, I'm a cosplayer, designer, and TTRPG streamer, and I am super excited to be here playing with all of you. Yes. And of course, next to Iza. Hello, I'm Grace Kelly Miller from the Actual Play podcast, No Small Roles, where you can come and join us for lots of conspiracy and cups of tea. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and below that, we have, we'll start with you, Drac, on the lower level. Yeah, hi, I'm Draconix, or Drac for sure. Um, I'm from a bunch of different shows, but um, I guess the most recent one is from Dust Till Dark, a, a Ram and Frost Million D&D campaign. Every Tuesday, we can just hear me be the... Uh, I believe it was called Himbo and Hardship was the title I got given. Um, the the <laughs> Dumbs in Distress. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And next to Drac, we have... Hi, I'm Kim, and I am one-sixth of High Rollers D&D, &D, uh, and we are a D&D &D stream normally every Sunday. Um, and that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, last but not least, we have... Hello, I'm Jonathan Charles. People call me Johnny. Uh, I am the resident bard over at Jeremy's podcast, Three Black Halflings. I write the music and sometimes show up on the show every now and again. Uh, and that's me. Here I am. All right. And we are going to go ahead and jump in. Uh, I will give a brief introduction of the world, just so everybody kind of is on the same page here. Uh, we are in the land of Utadam. It's a land of deserts, mountains, brushlands, and weirdness. An unclear amount of time ago, uh, we'll get to why that's unclear, the land was ravaged by a great magical cataclysm, or calamity. This calamity, which occurred at the height of a vicious civil war that was raging across the region, wiped out all magical technology and warped the land and its people in bizarre and horrifying ways. Many people and animals were mutated, and perhaps most strangely of all, time runs differently depending on where you are. 
In most regions, it's been about 30 to 50 years since the calamity, but in some spots, time runs so much faster that it's been over 100 years, or so slowly that it's been less than 20. These areas are called speed-ups and slowdowns, and our adventure takes place inside a slowdown. We open in Adukal, the city below. Adukal was built into a pre-existing subterranean rock-cut city. It had been carved directly into the rocks underneath the earth that had been built centuries prior. Uh, those who moved down there and established the city were wealthy landowners trying to get away from the destruction of the Civil War, known colloquially as the Great Strife. They used their resources to expand the city significantly and were also in the process of excavating parts of it that had been buried in, by cave-ins over the centuries. And since the construction and ex excavation process were still underway when the calamity occurred, and all magical technology stopped working when the calamity occurred, there are lots of caves and unexplored side passages, nooks and crannies, as well as remote sections of the original city complex that were never fully explored. Now, we're going to open in the most central part of Adukal, in an establishment known as the House of Serpents, an establishment uh, into which each of our characters have entered. Uh, let's stay. We'll start with those of you who are visiting Adukal for the first time, uh, which I believe will start. Will go in the same order. So, if you are is visiting Adukal for the first time, please go ahead and introduce your character. Go ahead and say your race, class, and all pertinent information that people need to know about. Uh, we'll start with you, Isa. Okay. Um, well, I'm playing Zavine. She is a half orc, half wizard. wizard. Uh, she's uh, pretty she's slender, slender with, with um, um, like green, green skin, skin, purple eyes, and hair. Her hair's like shaved down the sides, but then the rest of it's long and tied up in a ponytail. Um, and around the sides of her face and down her neck and shoulders, her skin turns a kind of sandy brownish color with sort of cracked, dusty texture and then rough hewn amethysts like growing out of her skin, like out of the cracks. Um, and she wears a colorful embroidered caftan, uh, baggy trousers and sturdy boots covered in sand dust with a large coat over the top. And this coat is like bright orange in color with gold and green embroidered trim. And it's definitely too big for her. It's always slipping down over a shoulder, which makes the, gre the gems growing out of her arms and shoulders visible. Um, and she would be holding a staff made from dark gold metal. Uh, at the top of the staff is a sphere with circular strips sort of uh, suspended and slowly rotating around it. Um, it sort of looks like the structure of like an orrery sphere. Um, and at her side, almost all times, is a small bipedal dinosaur, uh, a little coelophysis colored green with red strips down his head and back uh, and little tufts of feathers. And his name is Apep. And accompanying, uh, accompanying Apep, and Zavine, uh, we have uh, Drac. Could you describe your character, please? Yeah, so uh, my character is Carfe. He is a, a Artificer Armorer Warforged. Um, so he stands about six foot, six foot one, rather tall. Um, he looks like a just living suit of almost um, high tech armor, not quite, not quite like plate mail or anything like that, just very much high tech armor for the, for the region we're in anyway. Um, He's made of seems to be a material that looks similar to copper, um, but it seems to change in shade as it goes closer to his chest, where his chest is um, a shiny silver. Um, he on his on his head, probably um, scrambling, crawling around him, and um, very excitedly that we're in a new place. It's a small mechanical scarab beetle. Um, he named it. He made it himself. It's called Onyx, and I think he's just like honestly like flitting around from shoulder to shoulder, um, trying to get. Uh, scope of the land we're in and probably just excitedly taking it everything he can. Um, on Shrap 2, Carfe's back is a shield, but it's a very odd looking shield. Um, most of it is metal, but the front of it seems to be like almost some kind of transparent um, see-through um, material, almost like glass. And inside of it, it's almost like a snow globe. It's kind of like, it's definitely filled with some kind of liquid with particles um, floating around in it. But those particles seem to make a face and every time he shifts and moves, those particles rearrange to make another expression. Um, and that is a shield of expression on his back. Um, and yeah, that's Carfe. He's just kind of just standing there, 
completely straight, um, looking around. He doesn't seem to have much of an expression on his um, expressionless face. Mm. And uh, next up on this band of travelers, uh, Kim, could you please introduce your character? Sure. So I am playing Shadow Beyond the Veil, and she is a tabaxi. Um, she is also a Grave Domain cleric. Um, if you imagine basically a black sphinx cat, um, so big ears, big golden eyes, no fur, but dark black gray colored um, skin. Um, and she's kind of scrawny and slim looking. Um, she's dressed in kind of um, dark, if you imagine kind of black, simple ceremonial robes, um, kind of decorated with gold. Um, she's got a very, um, what's the word? Like a large golden necklace and golden pauldrons. Um, I think that's the term, the technical term for it. Um, and she has a large golden scarab um, embedded into her forehead with kind of big uh, marks. Black and gold is the theme that we're going for here. Um, and she normally is a gravekeeper, um, but yeah, she's been having some mysterious messages from her goddess in this land, and that's why she's joined this troop to see if she can find out uh, what's going on, really? Because um, normally she would be ushering souls over to the afterlife, but um, as Jerry men Jeremy mentioned, like thanks to the calamity, things have gone a bit strange um, with souls and in this world. Um, and I imagine that she would probably um, be stood slightly behind Zavine, um, a little bit shy, a little bit nervous, not really been out in the world that much. So this is probably her first big adventure. And she's just a bit like kind of curiously looking around, trying to take everything in, trying to project an, uh, an aura of calm, but is secretly panicking inside. Mm, and rounding out this group who's experiencing Arukal for the first time, Johnny, please introduce your character. Okay, sure. So uh, my character is called Onuris Budge. Uh, he is a mechanically a cynic hybrid uh, druid barbarian. Um, what you see was once a Nubian Egyptian man uh, around about in his 50s, but he's, and he still is, um, but not quite anymore. Uh, underneath, uh, so his uh, black flat-brimmed gambler hat is squashing down a pair of elongated hippopotamus ears. Um, and beneath that, you see a face that is sort of very, very lined and cracked from a lot of traveling outside in the hot desert sun. Um, he also has a slightly elongated jowl and um, a pair of uh, tusks, not dissimilar to those of a hippo, uh, coming out from uh, his bottom lip. Um, he's wearing a, uh, a long uh, green jellabia, which is a sort of loose-fitting robe with quite an ornate uh, uh, collar. Um, but it looks like he's worn it for a very long time and probably hasn't washed it uh, for quite a while. Um, out of the right-hand sleeve, uh, you see a largely human hand, um, but with skin that is slightly tinged green and glitter glistens in a sort of oily uh, way, uh, a little bit like a sort of snake. And instead of fingernails, he's got a set of uh, uh, talons. The right sleeve of his jellabia is uh, is uh, worn away uh, to the at the shoulder almost, and coming from that, instead of a, a, a human arm, you see a large trunk which down by his side sort of listlessly um, and beneath uh, the jellabia you see a pair of protruding uh, crocodilian uh, feet with between the toes um, and he's just sort of trudging along I suppose he's just here for the money <laughs> and uh, there's going to be a lot of money to be had. All of you were gathered by a man named Gohar Spears, who told you that in this city, uh, there's a an individual who is apparently hoarding large amounts of tech from the past. Now, pre-calamity, uh, Utanum was a very advanced, very Afro, uh, excuse me, Afrofuturist society. Uh, like mech suits were not at all uncommon, uh, huge airships, all sorts of in incredibly powerful technology. But since the calamity, all of that is pretty much wasted away into ruin. All of it stopped working. But this person apparently has a huge a, a horde of, of uh, pre-calamity tech. 
that is apparently not in working order, but could get there with, you know, if you get the right the right person with the right tools and know-how. And so you have all been sent down here to uh, extract this stuff. And you have traveled to the House of Serpents uh, in order to meet with your primary contact. You just, I imagine, just finished seeing a pretty interesting uh, burlesque performance. And now you're being led uh, through the, the hammam baths uh, section to one of the back offices. Well, I guess the back office of the House of Serpents. Uh, you're being led by a small little uh, lizard folk, a very short lizard folk named Sala, who looks very, simultaneously, very excited to be doing their job, but extremely put upon to have to be leading you through. It's that, it's the classic, um, the classic like stage manager, I love my job, but I like making everyone feel bad that I'm doing it. Uh, <laughs> leading you back to the back room. Uh, he, he looks at you all and says, okay, well, mistress is expecting you, so if you just go right through this door, it should be fine. Uh, and knocks on the door and says, a mistress, are you ready? Welcome. Come on in. Uh, Sala pushes the door open for all of you to enter. Uh, and in this room, you see uh, two people. One person who I think you don't notice at all at first, because they're pretty much just sitting in the corner, uh, and are also nowhere near as showy as the, the primary object of your attention. Uh, one of the performers, a dancer that you had seen on stage, lying on what looks like a, a heated marble slab. She is considerably less clothed than when you last saw her perform. Uh, she is lounging. Her her skin reflects the autumnal hues of, of the, the snakes that she was dancing with. And as you approach, you see patches of snake-like scales all over her body. Uh, I will let the rest of the introduction for this character come to you, Grace. Please tell us about your character. Yes, she is being massaged and exfoliated by uh, two snakes, an orange and yellow one, a purple and red one, and and as Jeremy said, her skin does reflect those autumnal hues. Now, as she elegantly rises to meet you, her snakes help her slip into a luscious robe of shimmering gold. And you see her long, deep purple hair fall about her shoulders. She smiles a wide smile to reveal white, dazzling fangs. They are surprisingly charming. Her rather large turquoise eyes are warm and welcoming, and she gestures to you all to take a seat on her lush furnishings. Not a euphemism. <laughs> <laughs> uh, go ahead if you if you have anything you were going to say. I was like, Welcome to the House of Serpents. You most likely know that I am Soraya Rakisa, famed dancer and acclaimed businesswoman. And this dear soul here is my associate and loyal customer who will be our guide. Why don't you introduce yourself, my dear? Uh, honey, if you'd please introduce your character. I am playing Mari, a.k.a. Mirage, and she is probably the happiest Gloomstalker Ranger that ever Gloomstalked. Um, <laughs> but she is currently settled in her chair. She's small enough of a halfling that her feet don't really touch the ground. She's like a miniature little warrior woman. People who know her, she wears her hair in a style where it's braided so that she has the appearance of an undercut, the rest worn long and curly and black. She's got dark brown skin, dressed in ranger western chic with her button-down shirts, and she even has a pair of chaps and her daggers in holsters at her side and her bow strapped to her back. But because she's in work mode, her usage and creative usage of disguised self, the people who see her see almost a prismatic halfling shape with no clear features as if a mirage is just settled in that particular chair and a tiny hand comes up to give a wave um, and then drops back down. Thank you, dear. I do hope you enjoyed the show. They say never mix business with pleasure, but pleasure is my business, and business is a pleasure, so let's get down to it. 
And as she briefs you, she dresses in a more heist appropriate outfit, which is finished off with a deep purple leather armor with scale details. Um, so I'm gonna tell you what's going on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a persistently irritating competitor of mine, Zane Bass, uh, he's one of those rich folk that just keeps getting richer and more powerful. I don't trust him. So, wanting to take him down a peg or two, I've been doing some digging. Found one of his associates who was craving a listening ear. Turns out Zane has a secret stash, a, a hoard of valuable past tech and weaponry. The sort of items I don't feel comfortable being in the hands of someone as entitled and ruthless and selfish as Zane. That's where you all come in. I would love to make your acquaintance. Hello, um, yes, I'm Carfe, and this tech, do you have any other information on it? Uh, I, it, seems, it intrigues me. Ah, well, I'm glad you're intrigued. You see, I believe there is going to be some weaponry involved in this past tech. Uh, it's going to be quite a hoard. It is going to be something quite dangerous to try and get a hold of. I think it's going to be worth a pretty penny or a pretty uh, magic dust, you know. Mm, and I should I should clarify, uh, th a lot of gold uh, currency has pretty much passed out of vogue since the calamity. Uh, nowadays, be, with how irradiated all of the dust is with magical energy, uh, the most valuable currency is actually magic dust, which can be used to power all kinds of, if you do have past tech, the magic dust can be harvested and used to power it in a variety of ways. There's all kinds of different uses for this stuff. So that's the primary currency that's used these days. Mm -hmm. And all of you, I should say, have been pr uh, promised some a hefty, hefty uh, bonus of magic dust should you succeed on your mission. Uh, Zavine just kind of raises a hand and she's like, hi, hi, I'm Zavine, um, and this is a pep, and, and the one hiding behind me, that's Shadow Beyond the Veil. But, um, uh, I just wanted to say that I, I really loved your show so much, and also your armor's really cool, and your outfits are all really, really cool. Just... Oh, well, thank you. I'm always happy to meet a fan. <laughs> um, uh, Sala... Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. Oh, Sala jumps in and says, uh, Miss, uh, I don't know if we can... You know, we, we may have to hurry this along. You remember, uh, Mr. Bass, he's, he's in the city right now. We only have... Yes, Maybe about yes, Sal uh, yeah. yes, Sal Okay, well, yes, we do have four hours. We should get a move on. Zane is currently attending a funeral. N funeral? Funeral. Uh, now, I know the stock is on funeral. his property, which is outside the main city limits and accessible primarily via rail cart, which is why I've hired the darling Mirage. Uh, now, to get us there without using public transportation... Now, Zane controls most of the cartways in and out of his property. Now, though it would be best to execute this heist as covertly as possible, I'm aware that Zane has a rather uh, uh, good amount of rough and tumble employees, farmhands and whatnots, uh, and a small army of militants, so I hope you don't mind getting your hands dirty if necessary. Oh, no, not at all. Well, that won't be a problem, man. looks down at his hands. My hands oh, are on. Yeah, on. often clean. Well, there's always a t time for a change. <laughs> um, Onyx like scuttles down your arm and produces like a little uh, wiper, as if to be like, like, like <laughs> as if to be like, look, I can I can clean your hands if they get dirty. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Onyx. Just scuttles back up my shoulder. <laughs> You'll be devastated to know that I don't usually prepare prestidigitation. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's uh, what I made Onyx for. <laughs> so, Mirage, you are aware that there are really two ways that could work to get onto uh, Mr. Bass's property, Bass Ranch uh, for short. Option one 
uh, is to take back ways. You've, of course, explored Adukal and the ruins surrounding it more than just about anybody else. So you know that there are back ways that you could take little crannies, uh, holes and whatnot, uh, that you could sneak all around, completely avoiding all uh, cartways, and get onto the property. However, uh, that'll take like a full 90 minutes each way. Uh, and so even though you have a lower risk of being seen, you have a greater risk of running out of time. Uh, I think, I think, um, you would have already, uh, Sarai would have informed you that you really only have about four, a four hour window in which to pull this off. Uh, because, uh, because Zane Bass is currently in town at a funeral. Uh, a very prominent member of the community, Idris Plenty, just died. And so he's attending that funeral. He's got a lot of his entourage with him. So the guard, like the, the security will be a little bit lighter right now. Uh, however, option two, that's option one. Option two uh, is to use your knowledge of this to, to find one of the cart tracks. Of course, you know where these are. There are some of the cart tracks that had been being built when the calamity happened that were unfinished and are therefore unused. And you could uh, use one of those carts because they don't have full railway cars. It's more like the classic Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom cart chase or like Donkey Kong where you're just sitting in like a railway cart that just uh, trundles along. You could take one of those and ride that onto the property, which only takes 30 minutes each way. Uh, however, it does increase risk of being seen if someone happens to be monitoring the tracks. You would have to talk or potentially uh, fight your way past people, uh, but it's really a, ta a trade-off. You'd have a lot more time to pull off the heist, but you have an increased chance of being seen by ranch hands. Uh, which would you prefer to use? Which, which way would you prefer to take people? I go fast and furious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> get in, get out. Let's do it. Mirage gives everyone kind of like a once over, considering size and speed and so on. Probably thinks about all the different ways that they could get caught more so. In the... <laughs> um, I am not very stealthy. So... I clink whenever I move. Yes, and so it's like. <laughs> While I could get in and I could get out very easily, I don't believe I would be able to do that because this one makes such a pleasing but clanky noise every time the elbow moves. Clank, clank, and clank. <laughs> I'm not sure about this one. I think this arm is amazing with the trunk, but I don't know if it makes a sound and that's completely blows all cover. So, um, we can take the cart, but uh, if we are caught, then nobody gets anything. But uh, that is the way I would go. Time is a issue. Cart does sound fun. I trust you. All oh. right. Uh, it's, it's, is everybody in uh, agreement? Yes. I'd say so. Uh, Sala will run around and have you all sign waivers so that you do not hold <laughs> uh, Soraya or the House of Serpents responsible should you uh, lose any life or limb or otherwise be horribly mutated. Excuse me, do you have a form for my Scarab Beetle um, Onyx? I believe he also <laughs> deserves to be signing a waiver. I came prepared. Pulls out a very <laughs> tiny little clipboard and holds it up. <laughs> you, just see, like, a, you just see a tiny pen come out of like the antenna of the Scar Beats or just signs his signature on it. <laughs> uh, he also produces a medium sized clipboard for a pep in case. Oh my God. Uh, gonna ask. Sign. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Zavin just like covers his little like claws in ink and he just like stamps it. <laughs> 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 awesome. Uh, Sala looks, makes sure everything is in order, uh, and runs off and says, uh, well, ma'am, whenever you're ready, uh, go ahead and set off, and just sort of scurries out of the room. Uh, Soraya does a little, like, and, uh, her orange and yellow snake slithers up her arm and kind of perches around her shoulder, um, Brosheen is coming for the ride. All and we're right. on our way. Cool. So uh, as you guys exit the city, because of course you're going to have to, you don't want to take any of the cartways that are 
established in the city. It'll just be too visible. Uh, as you guys are exiting the city, you see like the cons- you get another view of the architecture here, which is like a real mix of like wattle and daub, uh, mud brick, all mixed in with stone, and then like a metal framework that's been laced into all of it. Uh, you can tell that like this metal framework at one time would have been charged with magical energy at nowadays it's mainly like they only charge the parts of it that they can afford to with how much magic dust they have um and also i should mention this city is lit by basically like a lacquer that was smeared over the ceiling of the cave that uh has been magically attuned to match the actual rising and setting of the sun so like it glows uh during the day and then uh it sort of like goes to like a mood real mood lighting uh at night uh, real nice, uh, very, very uh, atmospheric. Uh, but as you guys are led out of the city, um, let's see, uh, Mirage, would you please roll me a survival check just to see how quickly you're able to find one of these, uh, one of the derelict carts? 15 plus 4, 20. Ooh. Ooh, dirty 20. We love yes. to hear a dirty 20. Uh, wow, you know, ex- you like in your mind know exactly which one is the best one to go to. So you guys sneak right out of the city. Uh, you actually like pass the funeral of interest plenty, but I mean, you know how to weave around that so that nobody sees the group. Exit the city, get there in record time with the rest of the group. This cart, uh, you know that it probably runs but it doesn't it it has not been charged so it would either need to be charged with magical dust or uh with magical energy if any of you were willing to spare spell slots for this uh it would be like a one like a one first level spell gets it for 10 minutes so it'd be uh second level spell would be 20 minutes third level spells 30 minutes uh and it's a 30 minute trip to uh to bass ranch uh, but you'll speak up. Than... Uh, honestly, I ain't that good at casting spells, so you might as well take one of mine. I can only spare a, a first level one, but uh, that should get us some of the way. Well, I, well, I wouldn't. After you. Oh, I can I can uh, expend a spell slot as well. That's fine. Fantastic, and it wouldn't be hospitable of me not to expand one as well, so I'll join the party. Yeah, Onyx in. pats you on the shoulder, uh, <laughs> Carfi, like as you were knowing that you were about to speak up, like ting, 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 uh, and it's then okay. gives you a tiny little beetle thumbs up, being like, "Hey, we get to keep the spells," uh, and scurries <laughs> back gonna... underneath your arm. <laughs> <laughs> Onyx is a hi- great hype man. Love him. <laughs> <laughs> Onyx pulls out a mic and still like drops a little beat and just starts <laughs> yelling out all like all slogans, but they're all like in beetle and in such a pitch that no one can hear them. So it's just like kind of like. Thank you, Onyx. As you know going exactly what to say. <laughs> I just, so, As, yeah. I'd just like to say that every time Onyx does something, Shadow is just enraptured. Because, I mean, she's got a scarab beetle, like, emblazoned on her forehead, and she's never seen, like, an actual you know, functioning, living personality ridden little um, scarab beetle. So every, it's like a, a tiny god to her. So every time <laughs> Onyx does something, she's just like... <gasps> but doesn't know what to say because she's in the presence of a tiny god. What do you do? Um, so yeah, I don't know if, dra- um, if, um, if Carfave picks up on that, just like every time, it's just like. <laughs> I, I, think Car- I don't think Carfave picks up on it, but I think Onyx does. And I think there's a point where Onyx like crawls off of um, um, Carfave and like scurries up your leg and up onto your shoulder and kind of just sits there, kind of like just come to be like, they seem nice, I'm gonna stay here now. It just sits in your shoulder. This is internal dialogue. What what do I do? The tiny god. The tiny god is on me. Should I make an offer? Should I should I notice what 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 do you do? What do you do when tiny god sits on you? Oh, oh no. Uh, but, you know what? Roll a religion gonna check. Reach over. Oh, I'll right. go ahead, Budge, first. Uh, I, well, uh, uh, I'll let you roll a religion check first. Uh, <laughs> okay, go ahead. Roll a religion check to see what you should do when tiny god sits on your shoulder. I rolled a 16. <laughs> Um. <laughs> <laughs> is that a natural 16 or is that with the modifier? Uh, with the modifier, 13 plus 3. Okay, cool. Uh, as you look down at this beetle, uh, it just like kind of in like a b-boy pose on your shoulder, just looking up at you like, yeah. 
um, you hear, like, it's, I, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, when trying to contact your god, uh, Kapera, have been hearing not, like, any words, not really receiving any signs, but it's been almost, like, static, mm. like, spiritual static. Yeah. Uh, Just as, a lot of as you look at this, yeah, okay, as you look at this beetle, uh, there's, like, a little glint in its eye. Uh, not seemingly the, anything the beetle is doing, but it's just like a bing, like off of its metal eye. And you hear that coming through that static very faintly. You hear like, Shadow, 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 beware. Uh, but you can't quite make out other than like your name and the beginning of another word. And then it. Oh, tiny. And at this, at this point, um, uh, Budge is going to reach over with his trunk and flick oh. the insect off of her and say, oh, you, you, you had a bug on you? Don't worry, I got it. It's all good. <laughs> on it! No. Oh, tiny god! You struck the tiny god! It had a message for me. Truly, it is sent from the heavens. Are you feeling all right? <laughs> heavens, it, I... I made him! And he's going to just rush over to Onyx and pick him up, just like, why would you do that? He oh, like that was to the your floor bug? I'm sorry. Yes. I didn't realize people were keeping bugs. Okay. <laughs> I think when when the scarab landed on the floor, like a pep was nearby, and he just kind of like scoots over to it and just like, not like trying to eat it, but just like curiously like <laughs> jabbing at it with his <laughs> with his snout. <laughs> and so he's like, no, 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 that belongs that belongs to the robot. Don't scoot him away. <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely it was one of those like situations where like your pet comes over and it's like, can I eat this? Could I yeah. eat it? And you're like, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> um, okay, well, it doesn't take two. I mean, it's thirty minutes. You guys trundle along uh, on this cart. And I will say along the way, Shadow, every time you start to like focus on on your deity again, you get that same like staticky sound. And the closer that you get to the property, the louder the static seems to become, and the more the voice seems to cut. Like you can fully hear the word shadow a couple of times, like cutting through during all of this as you're getting closer and closer uh, to, to Bass Ranch. And as you guys arrive, you see, like, the vast fields, the acres of land that uh, Zane Bass owns. Like, you see off in the distance uh, the huge uh, stalagmite farm of le these, like, six, seven-foot-tall, glowing, magically-infused stalagmites growing. You see uh, that there, you can see, like, the fields of food that are being grown with, like, special magic lights. There's only so much you can grow down here because, like, the sun is not down here. So they're having to install, like, magic lights over all of these to try and try and reproduce the effects of sunlight. Really not very nutritious. That's why there's the stalagmites being grown. Just a little, I guess, side thing for everybody. They have, they've been infused with magical energies that people can, like, grind them up and put use press uh, digitation to make them taste better and then add them with like new to give their food more nutrients and flavor uh but as you pull into the stopping place for this cart you see that coming out of the stalagmite field are a couple of ranchers riding hoats uh hoats are a combination of goat and horse that have become extremely popular since uh, since the calamity. They they pretty much showed up after the calamity, so most people assume that was like they that was how they got combined. Uh, and people just like riding out on these, and they're like, "Hey there, what what are y'all doing?" And you see, there's a couple of dudes that have ridden out as you guys pull up. Well, hello there. I'm just giving my guests here a tour of the more untamed parts of Aducal, some subterranean hospitality and excitement. Uh, okay, go ahead and roll deception against, sure. <laughs> against these guys. Ooh, that is, um, that is a 37. A 37? What? How did you get a 37? <laughs> Good lord. No, it's a 27. Max. Okay. Oh. Still a 27 is very, very good. Sorry. And they I, cannot beat that. I was so surprised at myself and I got it wrong. That's why. <laughs> uh, damn it, Jim. I'm an actress, not a mathematician. Uh, they, they're like, oh, oh. 
Oh, so sorry, Miss Miss Rakisa. You you came all the way out here. Oh well. Uh, w- d- d- do you need an, an escort or or anything? Well, I have my guide here, so uh, I think we'll just be fine if you'll just be letting us on our way. Oh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. We'll we'll make sure everybody knows uh, if y'all if they see y'all, not to be alarmed. Uh, we'll uh, we'll go and try and let people know right now. Not to be alarmed at all. I just want to show these people just how finely we can entertain here. R- right, right. And Mr. Mr. Bass uh, approved this, right? Oh, of course. Yeah, I saw him on the way to the funeral. Oh, it's such a sad day. I wouldn't go, you know, he seems very upset. I wouldn't go making sure uh, you get in contact with him or anything like that because, oh, he's having such a hard, hard day. Uh, roll one more deception check. Fuck. I'll give you advantage because of how much you crushed your first one, but I, d- I doubt you'll need it. <laughs> Just to make sure this second lie goes through. That's the pressure of dropping your dice on the floor. <laughs> okay, Sick. there we go. <sighs> that is a 25. Yep, okay, yeah, you easily, they're like, oh yeah, all right. Uh, they just decide to take this woman's this woman's word over their like their actual <laughs> employer. Just like, of course, you're a celebrity, so we see no reason to think you would lie. Uh, and they just ride off back into the stalagmites, uh, letting everybody know that not only that you're there, but that not to bother you. There we go. Smoothly does it. Um, oh, I should say you had been given a map a very crudely drawn map of the of the Bass Ranch by the gentleman that you had gotten this information from in the first place. Uh, it's like, it's on a piece of parchment. You could tell he's in, he was intoxicated when he drew it. You see like the, the main cart lines that come in, then like a crudely, like you see like little uh, triangles drawn for all the stalagmites. And then way off in the Northeast, uh, he says there's a gatehouse. And then behind the gatehouse is what he referred to as the hidey hole, which is where all of this stuff should be. Here you go, Mirage, honey. See if you can take us in that rat's out of direction. And this is the first time that most of the party has actually seen what Mirage looks like because she drops that disguised self and instead of that shimmering prismatic thing, there's a small uh, little halfling um, with her little cowboy hat, cowgirl hat on her spurs on her boots but the spurs have been they don't make any noise so they're probably glued in place but she looks like a little rancher uh, with the leather vest and it's it's got all these shells and pieces of turquoise embedded in it and so on and she just says very well let me see you did not pay for this map right no one made you pay for this map because oh, no. I do not okay oh okay the hidey hole. That is what we are looking for. The hidey hole. Yes, indeed. Okay. <laughs> Folds it back up. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I I think you have found a hidden talent here. Truly, best cartography I have seen in a very long time. Um, <laughs> I love the and... specificity of that hidey hole. <laughs> Seems easy. Yes. Yes, okay. And she she just starts walking. So please keep up. If you lose sight of me because these things are taller than me, just that is fine. Just keep walking in the general direction that I am going. (laughs) Awesome. So you guys head into these, like you're walking among all of these stalagmites (laughs) that are around. There's a few times where you encounter, like, uh, you encounter actually a, a ranch hand just fully asleep. Uh, at one point, like, ah, ah, uh, and looks around and just runs away, thinking that you guys are other employees, uh, sprints away. You, like, once or twice run into other people who are like, oh, oh, so nice to see you, Miss Rakisa. Uh, we just wanted to get a quick look. <laughs> and they rode off. Um, but, yeah, it doesn't take long at all for you guys to work your way all the way through this stalagmite field. And ahead of you, you can see uh, this is, like, at the far remote end of the ranch, there is uh, sort of like a choke point. If you were like trying to defend it, it would be a choke point where the cave walls come together 
and sort of like built into that little choke point is a uh, like a what looks like a little gatehouse. It's made of same materials that you would get in the main town, uh, and the lights are on as you approach. Right. Behold, hmm. is the hidey hole, I think. Okay, how do we want to approach this? You're all the experts. Uh, um, it, I it, tend to just charge forward. Um, like I, like I said, I, I clank whenever I move. Um, so stealth never has been my strong suit. Okay, that's an option. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like would it. like to clarify that I'm an expert in grave keeping and administering rites after death. Uh, I do Hopefully not... we won't need that. <laughs> yes. Or maybe for them, not for us, though. <laughs> yeah, oh, for them, absolutely. <laughs> yes, for them. That's why I'm here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're filling me with confidence. Good. Well, you're like the cleanup crew, all right? Yes, cleanup crew. This is definitely not my first heist, no. It's my first oh. heist. I just heard about the advanced technology that we could be getting our hands on, and I thought it'd be interesting. I, I'm more of an inventor, and technology is my strong suit. So, just being able to lay eyes on this would be payment enough for me. But the, the magic dust is also nice as well. I have a few infusions that I want to try. Yeah, I mean, actually, it's it's my first heist too, and I thought I was the only one, so I didn't say anything. But now that oh, I know no. that it's you guys' first heist too, that makes me feel yeah, it's, so it's... much more comfortable. Oh man, like, I think on like adventures and things before, but not like a proper like organized heist with like another group, you know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now that <laughs> Savine has said that, I am going to clarify: this is my first heist as well. Oh my okay. goodness. Um, yes. I, I, oh, right. I thought that was obvious. I, if it I, makes it any, any better, <laughs> Onyx has been on multiple heists before. And just like points out a little beetle. <laughs> <laughs> Honest or flexing. Just... I, is, is, well, you see Mirage has a moment where when she has her Mirage up, there's natural glitching, but almost she seems to be glitching for a moment as she's like, what is it? I, I, it's, and she looks over to Soraya. I, I am sorry, they, we are not guiding professionals, we are guiding amateurs. This is, <sighs> this is, Amateur hour on the richest person, one of the richest persons mm. that lives outside. I like to be able to come back here because they have the baby hoods, no. the hoodlings. If I cannot oh. come here because I have murdered multiple people in self defense, I will not be able to play with the baby hoodlings. Now, hold no, your hoods now. The, you are working with at least one professional, all right? Okay. Right, I didn't realize either. I'm out. just as shocked as you are. Now, listen, oh, yes. you you with the technology, do you got any yes. anything that might help us in this sticky situation? Um, we got to get in depends. that place. Getting in? No. Most of my technology is very much combat-based, at least the ones I brought. Well, that could be fun. It's... Who else wants to go in guns blazing? It's... I can teleport I mean, myself inside, but no one else. Oh, so you could do some scouting for us? Oh, maybe. I've also got a pep. He's pretty good at scouting. He used to go out and scout for me. A, a pep like perks up and gets like real excited. Yeah. The opportunity like, oh. starts dancing in place, uh, <laughs> yeah. going to, to le from little <laughs> foot to foot, just like. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Like Are you planning? Are you planning yeah. to... Sorry, go ahead. No, that sounds like we've got the startings of a plan if we've got somebody to go in and, you know, get the lay of the land. We could... We could yeah, but yeah, we could send a pep in and I can, like, see through his eyes and we could, like... Yeah. Yeah, we could do that. Or, like... I mean, I could go in too, but... Um, then I'd be by myself. <laughs> and I can teleport him out of danger, you know. <laughs> Let's go with the sending him in first, perhaps, if everybody else is okay with that. I yeah, most of that. the dinosaurs are extinct anyway, so what's one more? Oh. What? Eight, <laughs> <Nothing>. <laughs> I... The brutality, oh. the brutal callousness. You love it. Uh, so are you going to teleport a pep in there, uh, Zavine? Because I can bump right. him in and out, you know? 
<laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Uh, he's like getting ready. It's like a real like, okay, he's okay, like, I'm ready, I'm ready. Just like getting, he's just like, like he's about remember, to start. Remember, just how we practiced when we used to like go out, when we used to go out on the caravans together, like just like old times. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he's like, ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead and tell, are you going to teleport him in and then see through his eyes? Yeah, that's the idea. So she'll, um, she'll reach out her hand to whoever's closest to her, which uh might be shadow if, if shadow is still kind of like sticking to like just standing behind Sabine. i'm definitely sticking with the big um. lady yes <laughs> <laughs> she's not that big <laughs> she's bigger than me. <laughs> um so she just like reaches her hand out and puts it on your shoulder and she's like yeah i kind of go like deaf and blind when this happens so i just need to i need to like not fall over is okay. that okay is that cool i should have asked first i'm sorry yes I will prepare bandages in case you fall and hit your head. Thanks. Wow. But also hopefully you won't let me fall, because I'm holding on to you. I will do my best. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Okay. And she goes like, you got this buddy. And then, and then, and then, and then snaps, snaps her fingers and, fingers and the pet fingers. kind of like, sort of like shifts, like kind of warps in the air and then, and then she sends him inside the building hopefully somewhere if she can see somewhere where there's sort of like a tape like through a window if she can see like a table or something like that mm. it can be like slightly hidden underneath or behind something when he arrives yeah uh he in there underneath yeah we'll say like underneath one of the various uh tables that they have uh as he looks around you can see through his eyes this looks like it's real fluorescent type lighting like kind of like uh and it feels very office like uh, as, as he, like, sneaks around, uh, he sees there's only, like, two people in here, and mm. they're having, like, a conversation, like, nah, bro, I'm telling you, the host existed pre-cataclysm. I heard all about it, dude. It was a whole mishap. Like, bro, what are you talking about? That's not even possible. They can't mate. That's not, that's, you can't have a hybrid. And, like, he looks, and at the far end of the room, beyond those two who are arguing, there's, like, a cabinet that's partly a jar next to a much, much older than the rest of this room, a stone, like, a beautifully carved stone door. Uh, the, the stone door has a, uh, a much like a sort of a past tech pad next to it with like keys and mm -hmm. numbers and stuff. Uh, but on it, uh, excuse me, a screen and numbers. There's not like physical keys. Uh, but it looks like a, a pad that you might need to type stuff into. There's the door, there's the two people and there, the rest are like, there's a bunch of files. Like as he's walking around the room, uh, can you roll a stealth check for him? Because him just being in here and looking is one thing, yeah. but <laughs> like, he can see all this just from his original position. But if he's going to explore, then he needs to roll a okay, stealth check. I don't know how to do this because I'm using the dice roller on D&D &D Beyond. Uh... Um, just roll a d20 and then okay. I'll add, I will add his stats. I'll just add like, oh, yeah, he's say he's he has a plus, plus two. two to... so, yeah. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, that's what I was going to add. Come on, baby. Oh, no, he did bad. He got a four. No, he got a five. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, oh, so no. he starts to walk out. Uh, he looks over as he's walking along, sees among these filing cabinets, one of them is partially open, and one of them has Soraya Rakisa on it, like the name Soraya Rakisa. It appears that, uh, that Zane Bass has a file on her, and he lets out like a... And then the, the, the two people immediately like pfft, turn so their heads to see. Immediately bumps him out. <laughs> <laughs> you see them both like look and then, pfft, and he's just yeah. gone. Yeah. So he like he goes like ah, and then like turns to look at them just as Zavine just like snaps her fingers again and he like pfft, and disappears and reappears <laughs> next to her. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So they probably do see him, but it's just yeah. like there's there like was a, no, they a weird they like eyes. broken up it was a full lock eyes. dinosaur in the air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so and then go? she like yeah, snaps herself out of the um, the like familiar vision, and she's like, "Oh, okay. Um, God, it, it went a bit wrong at the end there, but um, there was only two people in there. Uh, I can see like a weird carved stone door with like there's like a." like a pad on it, I think, that would gain you access to it. Um, and so they also had a file on you in there, just so you know, just might want to, might want to know that. Yeah, that's probably useful information for, for a later date. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so we going in with the charm offensive or the offensive offensive? 
Uh, well, they might have seen a pep at the end there, but um, could still try and blag our way in. As you I are talking, you see two, two faces appear <laughs> in the window, like <laughs> looking out like, hey. <laughs> and Soraya at... gives them the really like cute wave, like, hey. A pep's like. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, but they're like, what are you? One comes over. In fact, actually, to determine what race these people are, we're going to do something fun that I like to do in my games. We're going to roll on the race chart. Um, yeah. Now, Ooh. Zavine, since you saw them first, uh, I will have you roll. I need, uh, oh. I'll have you roll for the first one. I need you to roll okay. me a D12 and a D4. And tell me what's Okey on dokey. the D12 and then what's on the D4. Okay. Uh, so the D12 is an eight. And okay. then the D4 is a two. Okay. Uh, so, and uh, let's see. Who wants to roll for the other race? The other race of the person who comes out? Because that's one. I'll roll. Okay, cool. Please go ahead and roll for the race of the other person. A D12 and then a D4. A 12 and a four. Okay, roll two more D12s and two more D4s. Ooh, okay. 11 and a 2 and then a 11 again and a 1. Okay, so you see that a satyr and a half knoll, half owl folk have a, have emerged from this. The knoll full hy like hyena long neck with the spots, but all like you have like a little beak at the instead of like a snout, oh. uh, just like a weirdly shaped face for a hyena. And then the paw, there are paws at the end of these like winged arms with these unnaturally big owl eyes uh, that, as they both step out, both dressed in the same sort of like rancher outfit that you've seen on the other employees. And they're like, uh, excuse us, what are, are y'all supposed to be here? Y'all may be trespassing. Hey, aren't you Soraya Rakiza? Why, that's me, and I have absolute reason to be here. And I'm going to cast Charm Person on both of them. Ooh, okay. Um, is that... A, do you cast... It's a it's wisdom a second level? save. Okay. Uh, so I need to are cast you... at a second level. Okay, cool. A wisdom save from both of them. Yeah. And what's the DC? Um, 16. Okay. So you see that the the satyr is immediately like, huh, uh, <laughs> so good to see you. The other one is like, wait a minute. But, and points at everybody else, the half null, half owl folk, completely un unconvinced, just looking at everybody else like, no, nah, something's not right here. Something's not right. Oh. I, but just I'm going to have to ask y'all to leave, around. please. I'm actually here to check up on the the technology being used here. I basically the engineer of this place. I've been recently hired. Can I take a look? I don't think um, your boss would be very happy if you delay us. Uh, roll, roll deception. Oh wait, my deception's not great. <laughs> that's a um, da -da -da -da. I think that's a seventeen. It beats it beats him because he got a fifteen. <laughs> uh, he looks at the yeah, pair of you. Or he, he looks at all of you. He's like, okay, and who who are these people? Pointing they're at the my, rest of the motley. They're my associates. I quite have, I actually have a, a lot of tools I need to be make sure they're in, um, work in order, and they help me out with that. Uh, so you're going to keep delaying us, or can we get to work? Um. Okay, you can come in, but. She's a burlesque dancer. I feel like that's not like useful for tech stuff, right? It's it never too you... late to expand your skill set. Uh, a minute, a minute, she contains multitudes. Uh, <laughs> okay, whoever wants to can roll. We'll say whoever wants to can roll a persuasion check, uh, and everybody else by jumping in is giving them the help action, so you'll have advantage on this. Okay. No, uh, but it's gonna be a hefty one. It's gonna be DC <laughs> twenty it. because. Yeah. Oh. I'll oh grab God. the um, I literally I'll would have to roll a nat 
<laughs> Me yeah, too. one person can roll. One person can roll persuasion. Okay. Not not the. Okay. It's like the Plus spokesperson for the six, group. Six. Anybody got? Uh, I, I'll grab the little bug uh, off of him and just um, like spit on it and start polishing it like furiously. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, <laughs> <on> it. <laughs> that's my job. Um, yeah. <laughs> like struggling as he's being polished. <laughs> <laughs> I know you don't like bath time, but come on, calm down now. <laughs> Why are you spitting on the tiny god? It's Stop my spitting. job, Stop right? Stop spitting on the tiny god. His name is Linux. God, no. um, <laughs> uh, so, Soraya, are you rolling? Because I think you have the highest persuasion. Yeah, I rolled, but I got an 11 total. Oh. Okay. Um, uh, this individual's like, all right, the rest of you are going to have to wait out here with me. Uh, while, and he's like, you could go in with my associate, but and he just stands there. The The other one's like, oh, come on, man. We can let him in. He's like, Bro, I'm telling you, this does not make sense. I'm keeping them out here. Okay, I'm not making them leave. They can stay, but my eye will be on all of you. And these huge owl eyes just <laughs> blink at you. Uh, as as uh, Garfi, you are led into this into this gatehouse by the satyr. Yes, yeah, so I'm meant to be checking the door. I believe there's a door of a. Um almost old tech um, keypad on it. Not many people know how to work those things, so I'm here to uh, make sure that's working work in order. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, absolutely. Uh, here, it's, it's right here at the end. Uh, he leads you, you down. You see you see the pad there. And I'm going to... Um, I'm going to start, like, fiddling with the pad and just start talking, just absolutely nonsense. Like, so, um, mm -hmm. just, do you have any other engineers here that can work with me? Do you, how, do you know your way around tools? I'm probably going to need help while I'm holding this. Could you hold this for me real quick? And like get, get started talking <laughs> and just tell them to like hold a spanner or something. <laughs> oh, to yeah, keep he's just holding on to it. Great, thank Happy you. Happy to be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Why is your friend so um, uptight? Uh, this oh, would be a lot more know. helpful if my friends were here to help me out. Nah, he's he's had a stick up his butt ever since he stopped smoking shisha. It's shisha. It's, you know, quitting quitting was a real challenge. I mean, I'm I'm glad he's set a goal and achieved it. But if it's maybe we should find something else to keep him, um, I guess, remove the stick up his butt. It's an odd <laughs> turn of phrase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, he st no, it he literally has a stick up his butt. Oh, he stuck it up. It's helping him quit. <laughs> it's some of the it's some of the past tech we have here. It actually emits it emits a pulse that removes your impulse, you like your impulses, your addictions. But you have to keep it up there. That's this might be forward, but can I take a look at that? Because I feel like that'd be very useful to make it like, a public like, something that you'll have to ask make. him. He's not my butt. You'll have to ask him. I don't know. You know. Um, you two seem you close. I didn't know. <laughs> what are you doing with this? He's like, we ain't that close, buddy. <laughs> what, what, uh, what are you doing with this pad as you're working on it? Are you trying I'm to trying, like, I'm trying to like, dis like disable it so that I can just, we can just open it without need to put any keys or any code or thing. Mm. I'm assuming it's probably like a fingerprint kind of thing. I'm trying to like yeah, it's it's, it's like right. button scanner. It's like or excuse oh, okay. me, you have to play. You have to press like a, a series of buttons. There's a code that yeah. you have to press. So like, uh, roll an intelligence to, check. Yeah. Oh, okay, if you're trying to you're trying to bypass that essentially and hotwire yeah. this thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, my okay. We will good. say that this is a DC twenty check. Well, I wrote a nat twenty. This is a twenty four. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> you like you just without of course this dude is utterly oblivious to what you are doing uh completely think, distracted can i add like i think like there's a point where um carfe is stuck but then onyx comes up like scrolls off his shoulder and like puts, pokes an antenna into it and you see a spark and it um, finishes off what he was trying to do and just goes yes. thank you onyx i was trying to wonder where i can get a discharge from <laughs> Uh, Onyx says, and gives you a little thumbs up and scurries uh, back up your arm. But you, like, complete this circuit. You have, I will even say that with this, you can, like, emit a pulse to open this door remotely. Like, you don't even Ooh, have to be perfect. next to it. With yeah. a natural 20, I'll let you, be, I'll say you're so in that you can just choose to open and close it at will. Okay, that looks perfect. Thank you. What's your name, by the way? You're very helpful. Honestly, I need more, more hands like you would be perfect. What's your name? Oh, <laughs> thank you. My name's Buto. Buto, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Carfe. Buto Wells holds out his hand. Carfe gives it a firm handshake. If you ever want to look into engineering, let me know. Just look for Carfe. I usually am at Rakotus. It's never too late. Like like um, Kritia said, it's never too late to just expand your horizons. I could teach you some things. I think you really have a knack for this. 
Oh, that's real exciting. Thank you. Uh, so, so are you done? Um, pretty much. I'm probably there's some equipment my friends have to just make sure it's all done. I didn't have everything on me because obviously I expected everyone in my whole team to come with me. So I might have to head back out and let them know. Um, right. But yeah, that's pretty much oh, it. I, I can just wait here for you to come back. That's perfect. Thank you. And okay. he's going to head back out. All right, cool. The rest of you have just been standing. You notice that this half knoll, half owl folk walks very stiffly. Uh, just like a real, it's like a, you're, it's like if you're constantly clenching your butt cheeks, that kind of like very <laughs> stiff walk that this guy has as he paces back and forth, uh, his hand just sort of resting lightly on, he, you see, he carries two revolvers as he's just sort of walking back and forth, looking at you all, uh, real stick in the mud type guy. Zavine has been trying to get him to talk and <laughs> being like, so how long have you worked here? Do you like working here? Do you like your friend over there? Is he your friend or are you just co-workers? Just like peppering, <laughs> like pestering him with questions constantly in the hopes he'll get distracted and they can, someone can slip away. <laughs> Which obviously doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, you can try and slip, you can try and slip by. Uh, if you want to roll to try and distract him, I'll say roll performance, essentially, to try and oh, distract <laughs> this dude. Uh, so that if somebody wanted to, they could try and beat his passive stealth. Or excuse me, passive I mean, perception. I've got a big fat plus zero, let's go. <laughs> hey, I rolled a two. Hey. Okay. Total he is utterly two. unimpressed. <laughs> utterly unimpressed by all of these questions. Not Doesn't even surprising. respond. He just he just spits occasionally. That's it. You uh, know, that's quite the, unhygienic, actually. Uh, he does. He just looks at you dead in the eye, spits again, continues walking, and it's at that point that the door swings open and Carfi comes walking back out uh, to um, see all of you there. I go to this. Um, guy and it's like put, plays a hand on his shoulder and goes i'm very proud of you for quitting it's very brave <laughs> <laughs> he gets this like really confused look and looks down at your hand that's on his shoulder he's like um i, I don't think we're there yet and kind of like pushes he says <laughs> oh it's, it's always a journey there's always going to be ups and downs but i'm glad that you're putting the effort into it yeah it's um i don't like to talk about it much but yeah it's been really hard and painful i understand for in a number of ways. Yes, your friend uh, told me about that. That's a very interesting. He he said I should ask you about this. That's very fascinating technology. Could I take a look at that at some point just to see if you can reproduce it in a maybe smaller size as well, make it more available to others who are suffering with addictions? Um, I don't know. What's your name? Carfe. Well, yeah, Carfe. Um, hey, look. Uh, maybe not right now, but like, if you're still around after I get off, maybe. You okay, see you're cool. like a tech guy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, maybe if you could make it like, if you could make it smaller, that would be great. I could probably do that, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, then he looks and he's like, so are you done? Um, almost. My friends actually have some equipment on them that we need to just make sure we're doing the final checks on what the gear that we've um, fixed up. Could, could we please kind of bring one person in? Ooh, okay. Roll me a persuasion check. Uh, in this uh, case, I'll say again with advantage because okay. you did just talk to him about uh, his, <laughs> his difficulties <laughs> and show sympathy. Okay, that's good. Um, that is a 18. Okay. He rolled a 17. Uh, oh my God. Okay. <laughs> so he, there's like a real pause. And he's like, yeah, okay, one person. Thank you. Um, ooh, who should I bring? Um, I'm going to look to Budge and just go, um, I'm, I might need your help. Could you come with me? Yep. Thank uh, you. I, I'm ready to use the tools and, and, and stuff and technology. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to head in with Budge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you see, yeah, you see, uh, boot, you see, uh, booty at the, or Buto, excuse me, at the top, just like, ah, oh, you're back. Uh, he kept it warm for you. Uh, motions thank up you, to the thank panel. you. He was very good with this. Honestly, I think as a future in engineering, if this whole thing doesn't work out, what do you do here, by the way? I hope you don't mind me asking. Oh, I'm just watch the gatehouse, make sure nobody uh, gets in here. It's, uh, and also I have, uh, cleaning duties from time to time. <clears throat> oh, okay. He just kind of gets like a sad look on his face. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, while that's happening, can Budge attempt to uh, sneak past and open the door? Oh sure, yeah. Uh, roll stealth. Oh, that was a mistake. 
Oh dear. Uh, I want to keep. <laughs> I want to keep. Um, that's, Butius that's in, what's suit. the name? Butius. I want to keep it in conversation. Uh, Buto. Um, His name is Buto, Buto Wells. Buto Wells. I want to keep Buto in conversation, like looking at me, so that Budge has a chance to go past. Okay. Cool. 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 Uh, yeah. No doubt. No doubt. That's a. <laughs> that, that I rolled a nine plus. Uh, oh, plus four. So that's a thirteen total. Oh my gosh. Okay, that is his passive perception. <laughs> Uh, oh. So, like, as you're walking over to the door, he's he, he out of the corner of his eye says, Oh, uh, yeah, are you you're planning on uh, checking the panel there? Yeah, uh, just checking that the, this uh, I might need some oil on this uh, hinge here. So I'm just going to, you know, check for the squeaks. <laughs> Do you open the door as you're saying that? Uh, Yeah. You open, he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Like runs over to try, like grabs you. I'm like, wait, 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 stop, 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 stop. Okay, I'm going to make a grapple check. Can I, can I try and grapple him? Yeah, sure. Uh, roll, okay. roll an attack roll. Okay. Um, uh, okay, that's a 19. You easily overpower this dude. <laughs> Okay, he's like he's he's shorter than you are by a little bit he runs over no 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 you just like Oof. how do you grapple him like what do you do uh, i'm uh, okay so I'll, I'll take uh the my uh human arm around his sort of like midriff area and then the trunk just kind of goes around his neck and then just wraps around fully around his head um <laughs> like a couple of times just so he's just completely like mummified yeah. you just hear <laughs> as he's just okay. struggling uh the rest of you i'd probably if you're like looking you might see that i just completely <laughs> subdued this man in the background just <laughs> gonna turn to cuff and be like what what do we do now i'll be honest like i said stealth wasn't my strong seat and i tried it and i'm currently failing so i think we should i don't know i don't <laughs> i'm just gonna do what i know what to do uh, and he's gonna like walk towards the door and i'm gonna immediately cast heat metal on the revolvers of the knoll um oh dang <laughs> okay like i don't know so, i'm just good at combat and just pokes his head out from behind the door and just cast heat metal oh my gosh <laughs> okay let's uh i'll have you roll initiative budge if you want to help with this you can i don't think the rest of you have joined this fight yet so <laughs> you can just go ahead i'll have you roll initiative with the knoll okay uh that's a 15. okay uh you're going to go first the no okay. eleven. Uh, so yeah, I just cast heat metal, um, and I think oh my god, if it's touching any part of his skin right now, he automatically takes two d eight damage. Yeah, uh, you're casting it at first level. Uh, I think it's a second level spell. Oh, you're right. Yeah. You're yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'm casting <laughs> second level. Um, so yeah, okay. it takes two d eight and two d eight fire damage, which I can roll right now, and he has to make yeah, a constitution saving that. throw. Yeah. Okay, I'll just roll this twice. So it takes. Oh, that was not good. That was better. Uh, so, nine yeah, points of fire damage. Oh, okay. So you see, as you reach out, how do you cast the spell? Like, what does it look like? Um, I think. I think you see um, this um, Onyx kind of scuttle. Like, the moment um, Carfe says that he's going to go into, like, almost combat mode, you see um, that his eyes, they see they will glow like a. Just a light um uh, like a white but they switch over almost like a lens flipped over on them to a red and you see um on its um go onto his head and almost attach itself to um his head and from the antennas he's just he's almost invisible you definitely can't see it but if you could see into the infrared for example you see an infrared something of infrared hit the revolvers of um of, of this no half no and start oh, heating sick. it up Okay, so they they height they heat up like white hot just out of nowhere, and this guy ah, 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 you see like uh, it's it's getting to the point where like it's melting through their holsters <laughs> and like the belt, and he's like ah, ah. Um, he, he failed the uh, he, he can't drop them because he's not even yeah. holding them, so he has to take his belt off, but <laughs> he he doesn't have time for that. Um, I guess on his turn, that's what he's gonna try and do, or he's gonna try and grab them, Psst, ah, and try and like he's gonna just throw them off. The rest of you see that this knoll is now partially burned, uh, very badly burned, I should say, as well. You get the sense this dude is not the most tough guy, and that, like, it's unlikely that Zane uh, Bass has tons and tons of really tough dudes. It's just that he has a lot of dudes. Um, this guy is, like, very hurt. 
if you wish to continue attacking him, he uses his turn to take off his belt and throw. There's like an audible like sound as these things are like taken off of him. You think maybe some feathers and fur went with it as he throws them onto the ground, just ah, ah, and is slapping at his sides. I think, did did they see me do this or was that back to me? Um, I Oh, he didn't see you do it. He just okay. like started screaming and is like, he probably would have whirled around and seen you there with red eyes and been like, hey, uh, but he's he's also in a whole lot of pain. So he's not really responding coherently right now. I want to see the rest of you also see, do see this man partially lit mm. on fire. <laughs> Aren't you going to help your colleague there? He looks like he's in quite a sticky situation. Uh, oh, you say that to the guy, to the guy who just got burned, or the uh, guy who's completely wrapped up? To the guy who's with us, up? to be like, go, go help him, and we'll, we'll all oh, go I in that direction I did it to the guy too. that's with you. Yeah, the Noel is oh, the did? guy who's with you. Yeah, oh, I did it to yeah. the guy Sorry. Yeah, I kind of poked oh, my, my head Oh my goodness, out. you're on fire! <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like, oh cool, we're doing this. That's way better. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. If you want to try and end this here, Carpe, you can. It's your turn. Um, I'm just going to hold Heat Metal and use my bonus action to do it again. Um, I mean, he threw it off actually, so I can't. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and spin and be like, okay, no, I thought this was going to happen. Um, I might need the rest of the group because I kind of messed up with the, te- the <laughs> door. It's, se- it's sending out infrared signals all over the place and heating up all the metal around. Um, Honestly, if you don't I'm want to tell you right now, this, this route is probably not going to work. You just seriously, <laughs> severely burned this man. There. Okay. You also, you also have Budge is holding and like suffocating his fellow <laughs> That is true. He's very much an eye line. Yeah, okay. Okay, in that case, this I'm going to... You've chosen violence. <laughs> I'm informing you that you've officially I chose violence. violence. Okay. Okay, I think I'm going to have Onyx finish it off. Um, I think from Onyx's um, antenna, you see... Um, him shoot at projectiles as I use an ability that I need to check real quick. Uh, give me a sec. Uh, uh, I think it's called Four Strike. You just see, like, um, from his um, the antennas that are now like attached to Carfe, Onyx lets out uh, a blast of um, for a wall of force to hit this um, to hopefully finish off this guy. Um, does oh, dang. What's does this a, called? Uh, four Strike. Oh, four strike. I don't even yeah. I can't even find this on here. Okay, uh, it's so a what is it? Um a homunculus can. Okay, cool. Attack. Yeah, what's he going to yeah. what is it is it an attack roll? Yeah. Um does a 15 hit? It does. This guy, oh, okay. okay. This guy has exactly <laughs> 15 AC. <laughs> Perfect. Um that is 6 um force damage. Okay. You poof, uh he he had 2 HP left. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> bless him with six force damage. How does uh, how does how does he die? Describe to me how this man perishes. Can it not be a death? Can you it want be, like, it to be non lethal? Yeah, non lethal. Yeah, you can not. You can just knock him right out. Yeah, I think just like a wall of force, like basically gives him a real bad concussion. <laughs> As a wall of force oh, okay. hits him across the head, and he kind of like snaps his head back and just passes out from the whiplash. Okay. Poof, he poof, falls to the ground. Poof. Um. The way is clear. I mean, there's there aren't any ranchers in the immediate vicinity who would have heard that. You know, it's probably only a matter of time before some show up. But the way is clear. I was like, I'm very sorry. I tried to go the deception and stealth route, but I quickly began to flounder. So I switched. Oh, it's clear we should have just done this from the start. She says as she casts Mold Earth and just kind of like tries to cover up his body a little bit, not like covering (laughs) his head so he'll suffocate, but just like camouflaging the body, just like the ground yeah. shifts around him. To, like, <laughs> as, as you do that, you just notice that there is like, it's, it's, you only see it for like a brief second, but there's like a stick like between his legs <laughs> that you hadn't seen before that just like a metal stick that just gets covered up. Um, yeah, he's out. Uh, are you guys heading, in on, uh, heading on in there? Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's cool. get moving. Time is against us. Awesome. So uh, you have, uh, Carfe, you have the ability to open this door at any time. Like you have to be within, I'll say that you have to be within 60 feet of it, but you can just open it right away. I think I just like detach um, Onyx from my head and like click one of his wings like a remote and it just opens. <laughs> uh, <laughs> these open doors sesame. open. 
Yes, these doors <laughs> open as you see Buto's struggles are getting more and more feeble as he's just being slowly choked out uh, by, by Budge, oh, who's just oh, holding there. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, I'm going to just slightly, like, part uh, uh, the two of the, the limbs of the trunk and just give him some breathing space. I don't want to, I don't want to, like, kill him. I don't want to outright Okay, him. you hear... <laughs> just still kind of yeah, screaming. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. It's going to be okay. <laughs> you just relax. As these, <laughs> as these doors open... Um, Here's what I, uh, as you all are about to head in, I will just ask, Soraya, do you trek check for the file really quickly or do you just head straight in? I just like, gra- if I can see it, I will grab some like papers from it if I, if I see it. All right, cool. You see there's like a lot of envelopes in there. Okay, I grab them, stick them in cool. my bag. All right, so um, you guys see that into this room, this is, the construction of this appears to be a similar age. I think both uh, Soraya and Mirage, you, or Mari at this point, you'd have the easiest time of, of recognizing this. The construction of this room looks very, very similar to the construction of the original ancient city that had been here, that, uh, that Adukal was built into. It looks like a vast... Uh, like a religious type room. There are carvings all over the walls. You see like uh, all of these small pyramid structures that are that look like altars around. Um, all, and easily visible from the door are piles of past tech that have been like set. They're not just like, uh, they haven't been like just thrown to one side. They've been like kind of stacked in various parts of the room. Uh, and um, the other thing I will say that hits all of you as these doors open, there's like a really gross smell. Like as imp- as visually impressive as this room is, the smell is disgusting. Um, Zavine actually has the uh, the archaeologist background feature, um, mm-hmm. which is like specifically about like when you enter dungeons and ruins, you can ascertain their original purpose and who built them. Like, does she gain any extra knowledge from mm. looking around a little bit at all? You know what? Yes. I think you immediately can tell that this is not just a religious room. This is also clearly a burial area. Uh, This was built as like a burial with the level of ornateness, probably for uh, monarchs. Uh, You'd probably have to do more investigation to know exactly which Mm -hmm. monarch, but you immediately know like, oh, this is a burial chamber chamber for monarchs. You're guessing 600, like between 600 and 700 years old. Okay. Um, um sorry just uh I was just wondering um would would shadow recognize that kind of smell like being around you know dead bodies a lot and stuff like that preparing them for the afterlife would she recognize like you know maybe there's a stench of death or anything on that like um mm. you know what roll me a what what uh I guess in this case we will say a nature check nature to see Okay, I rolled... Actually, uh, it's a sense of smell. You know what? Perception. You could okay. add your perception instead. Uh, well, I rolled a 15 on the nature, uh, but perception... Oh, I got quite good perception. I got a plus six to that. Oh, I rolled 19 plus six is 25 on perception. Whoa, okay. Uh, you, as you walk in, this smell, there's a slight smell of death, but, like, the death is mixed in with stuff. Having cleaned bodies, you recognize this is like some kind of a fecal smell, oh. but not like a humanoid fecal smell. Mm-hmm. Uh, it smells like there's some kind of like creature or creatures that have made this smell. You don't see anything on the ground, but you know what? With you got a 25, you said? Mm-hmm. Yeah. With, with a 25 perception, I'll even let you see as you look at the ground, like walking into this room, it looks like it's been swept somewhat recently uh, as if somebody has like come in and swept and cleaned this room Mm -hmm. Uh, and like even as you enter you can see all around uh, this room are like there's all these carvings of like what look like these incredible exploits all done by like one guy it looks like like a real kingly sort of dude some of these exploits are plainly impossible but (laughs) there's uh, you see like on the ceiling it looks like they carved all of these weird lumps like these weird stone lumps or something into the ceiling, almost like it's um, 
sort of like a soundproofed room or something. Oh. Uh, and you also would notice with a 25 what look like really old, uh, like pre, sort of uh, pre catacly or pre, pre calamity tech where it's like they you can tell they were trying to build stuff that would have eventually be like nowadays would be considered like computer view screens mm -hmm. even though they don't have screens but there's like interfaces uh but it's all made out of stone as you're looking around this room oh um i advise caution my friends i i assume we're friends now um the smell it's rather fecal in nature and someone has been here recently i don't like it yeah for someone where they bury monarchs you'd think they try to keep it less stinky indeed mm. i certainly keep my graves very clean you would not have this smell in my tombstones and and my you know the, the crypts that i look after this is very unprofessional if i'm honest that's, that's very good to know on your part not theirs mm. High level well, ride. Go ahead. Well, why don't we try and uh, ascertain which are the most valuable pieces, what we can carry, and get on out of here? Oh, I might be able to help I that. brought a bag of holding. Yeah, all of you had been given, actually, bags of holding. Oh. Uh, when you were... Well, excuse me, those of you who came down. Uh, so so all of you had been given uh, bags of holding by Gohar Spears in order to, like, keep, grab as much tech as possible because it was thought that you might not have a whole lot of time to, like, right. sift through and basically, like, look, dump stuff in here, get as much as you can. Uh, if we have four bags of holding worth of stuff, that'll be a good amount of tech. I'm sure plenty of it will be useful. Yeah, the old uh, archaeologist background feature comes in handy yet again because there's another part of it that says you can determine the monetary value of art uh, and objects more than a century old. So can she try okay. and pick out what's like going to be the most valuable to steal? <laughs> mm. Okay, now this is very interesting because for you, they are more than a century old because you right. <laughs> come from a place where it's been 150 years. For everyone else, they're less than a century old. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, so, but you know what? Seeing as for you, they're that old, I will let it count. Cause it's like, it's talking about stuff that's old for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I will let you look. Uh, the, the weaponry appears to be the most valuable stuff. Mm -hmm. There's some stuff that is like, some of this stuff are like far outstrips any of the guns and stuff that people have nowadays. Like mm -hmm. back in the day before before the calamity, the guns didn't even need ammo. They they just needed uh they needed they were magic powered and did pure force damage. And mm -hmm. they like so you couldn't even pick up the bullets. They were shooting basically packets of magical energy at people. There's a whole bunch of like weaponry and stuff like that. You see that there's armor from before. Mm -hmm. Uh that is also very very valuable there's stuff that looks like it could have been used to fly short distances uh that stuff is easily the most valuable okay yeah zavin uh pipes up again and she goes i might be able to help with that just give me a moment and she starts kind of looking around the room uh inspecting things up close kind of like wiping dust off of things and a pep like pops around doing some stuff as well and sort of like reporting back to her with like dinosaur growls um and she turns around and she's like okay so these weapons these are going to be super valuable they're like guns from before the calamity they don't even need ammo like they're so powerful uh and this armor also very good and there's something over here that's capable of flight can that fit in a bag of holding i don't know but it's like it's small enough that you could fit it you could just jam it through the mouth of the thing and get it <laughs> <Yeah>. in there <laughs> Oh, I would love to pull that apart and see how that works. He's going to go and take the flight, um, whatever the device that lets you fly and kind of shoves that into his bag of holding. Mm -hmm. uh, All right. There we go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, as this is happening, I, uh, I two things are going to happen. One of which uh, you can roll for this if you wish. Uh, this is going to we're going to start with shadow shadow. You, if you wish to, can roll a religion check. Because as you enter this room, it's not just the smell that hits you. You feel like an intense, religious, magical energy in this place. Mm -hmm. Like, I think everybody feels like this, This it's similar to like when you enter an old cathedral, mm -hmm. you get that se that sense of solemnity, like the whole- the Reverence, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it goes further than that. You're like, some of this is familiar. This is like, the smell of death is not the only thing that's in here. There's like, there's some kind of almost death 
divine energy in this place. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm rolling now. Rolled a 16 plus three, which is 19. Okay. You again through the static, uh, like the static, at this point, it's to, whenever you listen to it, it gets to the point where it's like, ah, like, uh, it is, it's louder than it has literally ever been as mm -hmm. you're in here. And through it, you hear shadow, shadow beyond the veil. Be careful. Be careful. There, there are such threats. There are such threats. Be uh, it's like coming in and out. Okay. Um, I'll turn to the rest of the group. As that comes um, comes through, can I like my uh, use? I want to use um, one of my class features called Eyes of the Grave, and basically <laughs> it means that I can see the location of any undead within sixty feet that isn't behind total cover or protected by divination magic. I just want to see mm -hmm. if there's any like undead in this room. Um, and I like okay. to imagine that it kind of, basically my eyes just go completely gold and as I kind of look around, um, yeah. All right. Before I tell you that, I will jump to Mari because Mari has a passive perception of 20. And Mari, you alone hear, just before this happens, the slightest like a tiny little splash as if something fell and you see that it fell it, it, like something some kind of liquid has fallen onto the ground clearly from above you like there's nobody standing over where this thing fell and it must have fallen from above in the room yes in in the chamber so when everyone entered mari would be staying the closest to the entrance as possible because again that passive perception um, mm -hmm. Also slightly uncomfortable because tombs and places of rest is a little bit different than someone hoarding someone in a hidden place. So she's a little bit like, okay, what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. But when she hears it, does it sound, based on her history and what you know, is it a familiar sound or does it just sound like a leak? I would say it is most similar to the sound, like the, the splash uh, as you look at it, it, it's reminiscent, even in the color, mm -hmm. of, I imagine, uh, with the time that you've spent with the Hotlings, you may have mm -hmm. seen a few Hotling births. It's reminiscent of, like, the fluid that comes out when something is being born. Mm -hmm. But it has dripped from the ceiling, and mm -hmm. even the feral subterranean Hotes are not, they cannot climb onto ceilings. Yes, looking up right away. Okay, I don't like the sound of that. Please continue your semi-grave rubbing so that we can exit, please. Uh, as this occurs, um, Shadow Beyond the Veil, your gold eyes, and you get a strong ping. Oh. from directly above you. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just... Like... In fact, not just a ping, I should say a lot of pings. Okay. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. a whole bunch. So as I'm standing in the center of the room, I look up. So if you imagine, like, um, Shadow's just looking up with these completely gold eyes. Uh, I wish to ask the group a question. Um, What's up? Yes, ask away. When you haven't heard from your goddess in a very long time, and you suddenly hear from her, and she says, there is a lot of threats down... <laughs> And then what? you sense a lot of death coming from the ceiling, and I point at the lumps. What should you interpret that as? How would you interpret that? Just I, I uh, to leave, to leave. That get the me. hell um, out of here! Um, yeah. um, Spin just taps herself on the chest and casts mage armor. <laughs> <laughs> Those I'm of you who look <laughs> up. <laughs> Those of you who look up see that, and I think actually, uh, Mari, you'd see this first, the dripping seems to have come as you see a much smaller lump emerging slowly from one of the larger lumps. Just like... <laughs> and slowly you see that this lump starts to move and sort of climb onto the larger lump, still sort of dripping wet, with moving as if like watching a baby bat climb onto its parent. Uh, and a face turns down to look at you, a face that only two of you would recognize. 
It is a kindly face, an elderly face, a humanoid face. It is the face of Idris Plenty, who oh. looks down at you all uh, and lets out a <laughs> uh, on the body of this tiny, wet, bat-like lump. Oh, no! <laughs> like I said, my forte is technology. When it comes to biological, I'm very much um, ignorant. Is that normal? No, no, that no. is no. the person whose funeral it is right now, if it is a person. <laughs> the, the satyr's hands reach up, grab onto your trunk again, and pull it apart, and it's, the ghouls! I'm trying to tell you, it's the ghouls! We have to get out of it! And as, like, the yelling, uh, all of them <laughs> start to move, you feel like a shudder oh. goes around the room, and he's like, it's a cabinet! There's silencers! We got silencers in the cabinet! We can't clean without it! They're tigers! Please! And, like, all of them, you start to see more heads turn down to look at you oh guys. <laughs> uh, some of the heads oh, no. you would, a couple of you would recognize, specifically uh, Mari and Soraya, you notice that these are heads, some of them of people you've known, uh, that turn Ooh. to look down at you. Uh, and these faces, like these, you see these bat-like ears extending out of the backs of them, but just a series of humanoid faces. People, as they looked when they died, are looking down at you, and then a series of high-pitched, sort of like a mixed in with like the moans of actual humanoid voices, just whoa, like just emerging from all of these horrific throats as these things look down at you guys. There could be dozens, even hundreds of these beings in here. Okay, time to go. Time to go. Yes, pick up, think your, pick up your technology I'm, I'm trash. Come leave. on. Time to Let's go. get out of so Yep, yep, yep. yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, what? Oh, say, okay, so I think at this point we're going to have to roll initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> feels like it. Okay. Yeah. I was like, I know it would Every... be logical for us to leave, but I want to. <laughs> I want to fight some people. That's pretty okay, cool. Shadow Beyond the Veil, so you got a 13. Mm. Zavine also got a 13. Who has the higher decks between the two of you? I've got plus three. I have nothing. Uh, 10. Uh, so zero. Uh, plus zero. So okay, so Zavine. Zavine goes first. I rolled a 17. 17 for Carfi. 21 total. Ooh, a 21 uh, for Soraya. What did Budge get? Uh, but I've got a 14, 13 plus one. That's probably the okay. best initiative roll. <laughs> it is the best initiative roll Budge has ever had. And what did Mari get? I believe you have advantage on initiative, don't you? I do. Well, actually, no, I get, I, I get to add my wisdom modifier plus oh, okay, two to yeah. initiative rolls. But I don't know if TND Beyond does that automatically or is it. It does. If you click on the initiative be. button, it'll roll. Correct, so it's a plus four, so that did it do. I have a 20. Okay, that dirty 20. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Well, the good news is uh, all of you did beat the weird, crazy bat ghouls. Mm -hmm. uh, the bad news is there's a whole dang bunch of them. Mm -hmm. What would you like to do? Soraya, you are the first to act. Okay, so as like a like gut reaction, um, she is gonna go straight for um, her poison spray cantrip. Mm hmm. What's the uh, range on that? That is uh, uh, 10 feet. Okay, these things are way more than 10 feet. It's a good oh, 30 feet above. Okay, she, she'd know that. She'd know that. Um, so instead, she is gonna cloud of daggers. Okay. Cool. Uh, do they have to make a save? They... you have to make a deck save right am i correct in thinking that uh probably yeah let's say that <laughs> <laughs> okay i'll look at the spell really quickly i believe cloud of daggers uh you summon it in a specific spot right yeah so i'm going like straight for like the center of where it looks like the you know the bit that you said looked like when they were crawling onto its parent that bit yeah okay so on their turn uh it's a concentration spell on their turn they will take uh damage Essentially, it's not even a save. Fantastic. They just take 4d4 slashing damage. Yeah, so, they will. Cool. So what do, what do these daggers look like as they appear? They are the most, like, be they've got, like, blades of, like, autumnal hue. Just, like, everything is so on brand for her with her skin tones. And they are sharp and pointy, like daggers usually are. 
beautiful. So <laughs> this cloud of daggers like erupts among them. Uh, do you have any bonus actions you'd like to use? I do. I'd like to use Mantle of Inspiration to give uh, everyone uh, eight temporary hit points because five creatures that I can see. Um, and Ooh. each creature can immediately use its reaction to move up to its speed without provoking opportunity attacks. So that's our party, basically, apart from me. Okay, awesome. Cool. Uh, who would like to use their reaction? You can use up to, uh, tw- is, is it say, up to its speed? Yeah. Who would like to immediately run, or are you would, would you like to stay? Because you all gain the temp hit points no matter yeah. what. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm just thinking because um, Crunchy Wizards have good stuff to do with their reactions, and also there's shield. Um, mm. I think Zabine's going to stay put for now. Yeah, Carl okay. is gonna stay put as well. He's a he's a beefy boy. I mean, metallic, but you know, you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Shadow that is going. Beef. Shadow is gonna move towards the door, being a squishy little healer. Um, but I've got ranged heals, so it's good. <laughs> so yeah, mm-hmm. I will I will skedaddle. Um, so up to thirty foot, uh, towards mm-hmm. the exit. Okay. Um, did you fill up your uh, Did you fill up your bag yet, or do you want to? Because it sounds like the main ones who had been filling bags were like Zavine and Carfi. I'm not sure what Budge and Shadow were doing. Um, I think to be honest, Shadow was too busy looking at the walls and list, like probably the shock of hearing um, her goddess. She would have mm-hmm. been far too distracted with that to 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 take any um, treasure in that moment. So. Um, yeah, I don't think I would have taken anything. Okay, luckily there's treasure right next to the door, oh, like within good. 10 feet. There, Like there was a pile right there. So if you need to, you can run on your turn to grab some of it. <laughs> and Budge, do I think, uh, uh, are you I staying put as well? I had my hands full. I'm grappling the guy still, so I haven't. Exactly. <laughs> okay, uh, so you're staying, are you staying put? Uh, yeah, I think I, I think I will, yeah. All right, Hold wonderful. Hold everybody else, please. Okay. Um, so that's going to be Mari's turn next. Oh, excuse me. Wait, before it's your turn, Mari. Soraya, are you moving to the exit or are you staying pretty much? Um, uh, yeah, I'm keeping an eye on everything, but I'm moving towards the exit, just but like kind of open. Uh, and she's kind of, she because she kind of gave the mantle, mantle of inspiration with like a shimmy of her hips. She's just kind of like... <laughs> hip shimming all the way backwards <laughs> just shimmying through, she's the, just shimmy. through the place she's shimmying but in danger yeah <laughs> just a real uh, a real urgent shimmy yeah. over to next to the door awesome okay so mari it's your turn what would you like to do so budge is right near right in the doorway area with his grappled friend we have Mari, not Mari, we have Soraya is making an exit, and we see Shadow is making an exit, but it seems like Zavine and Carfe are still just into the thick of it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Mari uh, draws an arrow from her quiver and makes sure that she has it notched as she keeps an eye on the ceiling. Okay, Monsieur Budge, uh, we may have to run soon. Uh, the ceiling is giving birth to demonic bats, and two people are still trying to get some stuff for some money. So um, you might want to drop what is in your trunk and hand, and be prepared to exit. I cannot leave until everyone has vacated the premises as per my contract with Little Salah. So please, 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 I am too, too, too black for this. So please, everybody, come out, come out, come out. <laughs> 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 awesome. You know, take inspiration. Uh, be so oh my God. I am too black oh, no. for this. Oh, <laughs> uh, for some reason, Carf is like, wait, I've, I remember. I, I, I'm also black. I probably should. <laughs> <laughs> Part deep within you, you, rem- you like get a pang of fear wait, and like, mm, nah, I should not be in here. Uh, so, are you, uh, Mario? Are you preparing an action to like? fire on these things if they're attacking? Is that what's holding, happening? Yes, I am holding her shot, and she gets more than one action, but she's holding her attack. If one in the party is attacked by one of the things, then she will release her attack at that time. But All right. right now, she's attempting to get everyone out. 
Yes. Okay. Beautiful. Uh, then that is going to be Carfi's turn. Uh, Carfi, I will. Uh, have you? Do you think you had filled up your bag by this point? Because it sounds like you had pretty much just been grabbing stuff. Yeah, I was definitely grabbing stuff and just shoving it into the bag. Um, even I think even after it was pointed out that there were um, these weird bat gremlin things, he's still like just taking the last bits and pieces he could fit inside before looking <laughs> up. Um, before the blackness and... kicks in, you're like, hell no. <laughs> <Wait a second. laughs> To the um, no, but, no, no. Yeah, go ahead. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually, I'm actually going to do... Um, have they? Does it look like they're going to like pounce or attack? Or does it look like they're just staring at us? Can, like, can oh, no, they're like letting out, they're letting out horrible, unearthly mm -hmm. screams and screeches. Okay. This is clearly a bad situation. Okay. Um, in that case, I would like to cast... Hmm. I'm gonna cast catapult. So I'm gonna get like um, some just the most useless tech or most broken tech I can find, <laughs> and I'm gonna like yeah. hold it in front of his chest and he cast catapult and just see like some blast of energy slam into the object and it shoots up towards um, these things and they have to make a deck save. Okay, um, uh, I'll say that you can hit up to two of them from the angle because it's it's ooh. a line, right? I'll say yeah. that you can hit up to two. Um, what is this? Wow, they both just rolled natural seventeens. Oh, uh, yep, is... yep, they make it. Yeah, okay. My, this, this you, save his decks, 15. You, you grab this broken down uh, past tech chamber pot, shoot it oh, up God. there, <laughs> the two of them just pop out of the way, it shatters against the ceiling. Um, that didn't go as planned. <laughs> uh, you see, yeah, Onyx is like, <laughs> like just pointing at the end, pointing at the edge, <laughs> like, let's get out of here. I hear you, Onyx, I hear you. Uh, he's gonna start running. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you, I'll say that you, uh, if you m use your movement to run all the way, uh, how how deep would do you think would you would have gone in? Like, um, I would have gone pretty deep in. Like, I would have gone to the most interesting, probably not even the most expensive, but the most interesting points, bits of tech. I'd imagine okay. those are like deeper in. So I'm probably so you, just nearing. Yeah. So you make, uh, I'll say that you went like 50 feet in, and you now came running back out. You're now uh, 20 feet from the door. Good. Um, yeah. So, it is now uh, Budge's turn. Oh, okay. Um, question for you, DM. Um, so, I presume that um, uh, uh, this guy is trying to escape the grapple. Would I be able to release the grapple as a free action, or is that going to cost me? You know, I'll let you let him go. You can just... Awesome. It'll yeah, be like an object I'll just, interaction. I'll you drop him by the door. Him. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Okay. And then I would like to, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, since I haven't been useful at all, uh, grabbing stuff, um, and I wouldn't know what to take anyway, um, I'm just going to run, uh, my full movement speed out, uh, and try and get to the inner side of everybody else, um, so that they have a bit of a chance to escape. Uh, and I'm going to, Budge is going to, uh, um, put his hands, uh, behind his head and start, like, tapping rhythmically on the floor. Um, and sort of chanting under his breath, and he's going to summon forth uh, the spirits inside, and he's going to rage. And I'm going to take form of the beast um, claws, and so he's going to whip his arms forward, and you'll see his uh, left arm, which is now uh, uh, back to being, uh, uh, has transformed into his sort of human arm, similar to his right arm, and he puts his fingers, places his fingers together, and his uh, claws uh, grow and meld and form into one enormous uh, uh, mass um, that gets longer and longer and sharper and sharper until eventually, at the end of his arms, are two massive uh, rhinoceros horns um, curved out. Um, so that's the that's gonna be my bonus action. And then as my main action, uh, I'm gonna uh, wild shape uh, into um, an atlas bear. So uh, yeah, he's gonna start growing uh, uh, hair sort of, uh, his skin sort of rips and tears and falls away and hair is gonna sort of grow out of there. And he becomes an atlas bear with uh, rhino horns for hands. Awesome. And I think that's my turn. Yeah, so you guys see this gigantic brown bear uh, with with like the craziest looking. Bear. They're not bear claws. They're what are they? Teeth? They're tusks? Elephant uh, tusks? Uh, yeah, rhino horns. <laughs> rhino horns. He's with a pair yeah. of rhino horns for paws, standing. All eyes are now on you, Budge. So the good news is you probably have drawn most of the fire away from your friends. Um, now it is Zavine's turn. Zavine, what would you like to do? Okay. Um, oh my god, I have two different ideas. Um, 
Zavine, because I think Zavine is quite far into the room, isn't she? Because uh, mm -hmm. she was the one who like went in and explored and everything. So I think um, whichever of these creatures are like the closest to everyone else, she's going to reach out her staff and the sort of orrery looking thing on top of it starts to like shift even faster and spin around. Um, mm -hmm. And she, and then space around them begins to warp in a similar fashion, and she's going to cast Pulse Wave on them and try to pull them away from everyone else with that. Ooh, okay. Um, yeah. So you're going so to blast some make... of them like away? Yeah. So it's um, it's a thirty foot cone, and then I get to choose whether I push or pull them in which direction. Mm -hmm. Um, so I basically want to pull them away from everybody else. Um, okay. And they have to make a Con fifteen saving throw, uh... and it's sixty six force damage. They all failed. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah, you, they all the ones that you like blast utterly fail that save. Okay, so yeah, this the space begins to warp around them. They all take nineteen force damage, and then they're kind of like pushed and coalesced into one another, and then like pulled away from everybody else back into the room. Yeah, and then just blast it off will... the ceiling oh, and deeper into the room. I just accidentally rolled a roll I didn't need to make and rolled a natural 20, so that was a waste. <laughs> um, <laughs> fantastic. Uh, yeah, after she's done that, she... Is she near anything that's going to make an attack of opportunity on her or anything? No, they haven't left the ceiling yet. You're good. Okay. Um, she's going to start moving closer towards the others then. Um, she's got... I don't know how far in we want to say she went. Um, Sounds like she might have gone for like a good 40 feet, so you might be like 10 feet from the exit. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, she's uh, going to basically put herself behind Bunch. <laughs> yeah, okay, cool. Uh, and that leaves us with Shadow Beyond the Veil. Hello. Um, so I'm sort of at the edge, I guess, the further. So I was in the middle, um, and then I use my reactions to kind of um, start making my way out. Because um, mm -hmm. this is Theater of the Mind, and I'm a bit rubbish at distances. Um, is everyone kind of within 30 foot of me? Uh, um, not everybody. Not everyone. Budge, mm -hmm. I think most of the group is. Actually, wait, now that I think about it, yeah, I think everybody is. Budge ran 30 feet into the room, and you're right by the exit. So, yeah, everybody's in 30 feet of you. Okay. Um, I'm going to be a classic healer, and uh, you'll see um, I'll take a kind of deep breath in, and then a kind of golden glow will emanate from the scarab on my forehead and sort of um, wash down uh, over my body, and then through my hands, I raise them up, and this golden glow sort of shoots out across uh, the ceiling, showers down, and uh, forms, like almost showers down on everybody in this room. It's everyone in the party. Um, and I have cast Beacon of Hope, um, which uh, bestows hope and vitality. And for the duration, each target has advantage on wisdom saving throws, death saving throws, not that I don't believe in you all. Um, and you will also regain maximum hit points from any healing, any further healing that I do. Ooh. Well, any healing um, that anyone does. Um, so, you know, just preparing, just getting ready. You know, I believe in mm. you guys, but, you know, always be ready. <laughs> <laughs> um, as as you access your divine power, I'll say that vo same voice comes back, uh, mm -hmm. and you hear you hear shadow beyond the veil. You're doing well. Please, my child, I I'm, I'm able to reach you here because the, the air is it, it's thinner here. The plane I can <gasps> I can just come through. Please take you are my you and my, your friends. Take some of my power. Flee this place. This is not safe for you. Uh, and you feel like this power coming through. You hear like, I'm in a realm of shadows. Take, I will push you. And like this sense as you, this the Capera being a, a scarab beetle deity, mm -hmm. uh, like, and of course the legend being like, oh, the scarab beetle rolls the sun up like a solar yeah. deity. Uh, it's like you feel the power of like a scarab beetle behind you just like, and all of you feel like a sense of like thousands of tiny little beetle legs all just like infusing all oh like God. through this magic <laughs> as it touches you uh and i will say you all for the next minute gain uh sort of a divine haste upon you oh. so the effects of the haste spell are are on you guys you get the sense because like from the damage that these things have taken they're still very much okay this is like a very bad scenario to get trapped in. And okay, you so know that like you got to get off of this property. Mm -hmm. So um, all of you have the effects of the haste spell, which means that your speed is doubled. You get two actions, but the second action can be used to, I believe, uh, dash, uh, disengage. Uh, let's see, the second action can be used for dash, disengage, hide, 
or use an action, or if you may take the attack action, you can only take one action as your second action. But bottom line is, speed's doubled. Your your AC also goes up by two. Uh, oh. So you're all much harder to hit now, which is good because it is now the, the bat creature's turn. Uh, they are going to fly down. Three of them letting out their screeches are going to try and bite into Budge. Um, uh, Budge, with your new AC, okay. what's your new AC? 17? Um, yep, looks like 17. Yeah, yeah they're not going to get through, buddy. They, <laughs> they fly down and like, it's as if like you're around your fur, this golden scarab beetle carapace <laughs> appears and... <laughs> Their teeth clatter against it. Another today. two are... Yes. Um, but that also would trigger uh, Mari's attack if you want yep. to attack uh, one of these three. Or two of them, I guess, because you get two attacks. So that is a... So the first one is an 18 to hit. And the second one is a hmm, just fifteen plus seven. It's okay, a fifteen both of those plus seven to hit. hit. It is, yeah, an eighteen and a uh, twenty-two both very easily yeah. hit. Um, and so that and you get a third attack because it's the first turn. Yeah, you want and, to attack. Yep. So there was three that attacked. So it's just choo, 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 from that bow. Yeah. Uh, and that next one is a that's an eighteen plus seven. Um, also easily hits. So I will just roll all of this damage. The first shot is 1d8 plus 2 piercing. Um, oh, actually, the first hit gets an extra 1d8. So the first one is uh, 6 plus 4 is 10 points of damage plus okay. 2. That is 12. And then the second one is just 5 plus 2. So 12... Seven. Seven and uh, six piercing damage each arrow. Ooh. Uh, okay, so that one that you just <laughs> is that all into one that you just shot? Nope, three. Okay, so you shot all three of them. All yep. three of them are like, ah! you hear the same like mm-hmm. ah! moans come up, but they mm-hmm. are seriously injured by uh, mm-hmm. it. Well, not seriously injured, but they did not like that. Um, Yes, that is, uh, and also, uh, if you want to quickly roll, um, Soraya, how much damage these guys take, it's about to be your turn. Uh, Mm -hmm. they're, the ones that moved, the rest of them, a bunch of them got blown away, and some of them are now flying in your direction, but essentially you're hearing now a chorus of wails and moans as, like, dozens of these things are flying off the roof. Some of them, the closest ones were blasted away, so they're unable to reach those of you who are right by the door, Mm -hmm. but they now start swarming down towards you guys. Uh, Soraya, you have the, some of them take the damage though from the the daggers. So, so that if was you ten ro- points of damage. Okay, so some of them you see this, a bunch of them are like cut off, like cut, and they have like little holes in their bat wings. They're flying towards you guys, letting out these moans. Uh, Soraya, you have double speed and two actions. What would you I'm like to getting do? Getting out of there, please. Thank you. Okay. So you just sprint. <laughs> all of it. Uh, all you're... of it is. All small, it's all moving. Okay. <laughs> so you make it real far. Uh, you have double move. Plus, you, I guess you can dash twice. Uh, so that's 120 feet. You just. Uh, so she's just, just like maybe off. grabbed something on her way out, just so she's got like a. Bit <laughs> yeah, you grab like one. You grab like one item and just take off with it. Yeah. Uh, the the fastest shimmy anyone has ever seen. Um, so shimmy. What? Uh, Mari, are you holding your turn again, or holding your action to see if everybody gets out? Yes, it's just a. Uh, hey, merci, merci, merci. Oh my goodness, Monsieur Bud, you are so beautiful. But she's going to be uh, hold, holding the line with Budge, wanting okay. everyone else to go out. She's standing All behind right. Budge, probably invisible, because she probably comes up to his kneecap. But she's there, <laughs> yep. tiny and ready. <laughs> and what it's is nice Carfi doing? <laughs> um, what is Carfi doing in this moment? Is it, I think, it's, it looks like it's time to go, I will say. Yeah, yeah. Garfi's like, yeah, I'm not going to be the last one out of this because uh, I definitely will die. Uh, so it's going to run. 
Um, and I think he's gonna cast Expeditious Retreat so they can dash three times. Because <laughs> um, oh <my> <laughs> so it really hit Shang like, wow, why? I have a fear that I do not remember having, but I, I'm not gonna think about it right now. I'm just gonna run. Um, and he's gonna, he's gonna. You just see like jets, um, like like little jets erupt from his, the heels of his shoe, um, feet, and he just starts running um, with amazing. Onyx in tow. Awesome. Uh, you even pass Soraya on your way out. Like, you outrun her. Um, what is Budge going to do, seeing all of these people sprinting? Um, yeah, uh, I think for, uh, yeah, action, is there anybody, is, uh, uh, any, are there any of the, um, the gnarly dead bat people, um, like, in the proximity of Budge right now? Yeah, right around Budge. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's hit them with things. Um, I'm gonna do that. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, meanwhile, uh, Zavine and Shadow, are you guys also sprinting out while you're yes. rolling that? I'm, I'm not just yeah. I mean, she's heading closer towards the door, but she wants to stay within range of being able to do things to help the others. Okay, because you guys, I think, at this point, are basically unstoppable mm -hmm. if you try yeah. to run. Mm. Uh, so, did you attack? Oh, uh, yes, sure. Um, so, first uh, claw attack. Um, that's gonna be... Um... Oh, wait, I gotta stop be... you there, buddy. Uh, oh. it looks like we're just about out of time. However, okay. I can tell you that numerically speaking, uh, we based there, it was not possible for you to lose this unless you just, just decided to stay. Uh, so, if you want to describe, <laughs> you can just very quickly describe how you slaughter these things, uh, and, and sure. Zavine, how you, what you do as you guys run away. Okay. Um, okay, so I, I'm gonna, um, uh, I'll be attacking them with my rhino horns, um, and my bite, so I get these three attacks that I do, and, uh, basically every kind of, I'm assuming they're all flying down. Um, so I'm yeah, just going to no, kind of... flown down next to you. Yeah, so if they're in a bunch, I'm just going to see how many I can get, like, skewered on my rhino horns <laughs> and try and make, like, a little kebab uh, with, uh, <laughs> with, the, uh, with, with as many of them as I can because uh, I've got mm -hmm. a cat waiting outside who I love very much and I, 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 think, I think that she'd like them, so I'm going to feed them to her. <laughs> so I'm going to grab as many as I can and then turn and just leg it as fast. Fast, like, awesome. Go. <laughs> you have these two. Yeah, you get you make it out of there with these two ghoul kebabs. Isa, what do you? Or excuse me, uh, uh, Zavine, what do you do? Yeah. Um. So she, when she sees the others turning to run, she like twists one of her hands around, and then the, the like sort of the spherical parts of the staff start whirring again, and uh, the ground underneath the bat starts warping, and a giant earthen hand comes out and grabs one of them as it's trying to chase us, and she's like, ha, bye, and Misty steps out and then keeps running. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, and uh, Shadow Beyond the Veil, uh, am I correct in saying that you also ran? Yes, I'm very much going. I have feline agility as well, which adds another load of oh speed God. on. So I'm just out. I'm, out. I'm, in, okay. I'm in speedy crew. <laughs> Amazing. So you guys book it right out of there. Uh, you managed to make it with, uh, with Soraya's incredible connections and Mari's incredible guidance all the way back, especially with how fast you're going. You make it all the way back to Adakal, completely unmolested. Uh, you have succeeded on your mission to steal as much stuff as possible. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this session. Thank you to all the players uh, so much. I don't think we have time for plugs, but go check everybody out because all of these people are amazing. Uh, this has been a really, really fun time. And thank you so much to D&D uh, &D for letting us do it. Thank you. Uh, thank I guess at that, much. I'll go ahead and say goodbye. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye. 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 Thanks, Jeremy. The most challenging week for me was, I think, week five was the hazards. I got that challenge. You, know, you see the videos and we see the host say, like, You now have the task of designing a feature hazard. And for a second, I was like, what is even a hazard? I didn't realize that, you know, things like quicksand and, like, 
green ooze and dungeons was technically called hazard. So it took me a second to be like, oh, that's a hazard. And then even just designing something that feels challenging, but isn't necessarily a combat or a trap is just a really interesting specific part of D&D design that I hadn't done much with. Do the bubbles seem the only way up? It was rather unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a hundred foot climb up a very sheer cliff you could attempt. Uh, ah, again, I feel like fate is against me today. I will try the bubble once more. Although I let all of them go into bubbles this time, because I see if any if it looks like it's going poorly, I'm gonna shoot shoot them down. So I will okay. actually go last. <laughs> so you're gonna hold yeah. up for them, okay? All right, mm -hmm. so Shava, are you gonna jump in a bubble? So it was cool to learn about that and just learn how it can enhance your games. So that was challenging but rewarding in the end. I want to. I've always said to myself, I'm going to try and start like designing Adventure League modules or something. And now that I know the good formatting, the way that you know it's supposed to be, I can hopefully start actually uploading content and stuff like DM skill. That's that is the goal. So I'm glad that this contest taught me the technique and the formatting. That's again that's just been valuable, and I'm happy I have that. Welcome everyone to Ask the Sage Live. My name is Brandy Camel, your community lead for Dungeons and Dragons. And I am joined today by the illustrious Jeremy Crawford, our fantastic lead rules designer. How are you doing this fine Sunday? I'm doing great. And I'm excited that we get to spend part of our Sunday together talking about Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, I've been I have been awaiting this panel all weekend long, and I'm sure many others have as well. Uh, I know that you're accustomed to doing these Ask the Sage Live uh, sessions at conventions and events. Um, and I think this is one of the few times you've done one online. So let's walk through what that means. Um, over the past few weeks, or actually really over the past week in particular, we've been gathering the most pressing questions from our fans across a variety of social media, pla media platforms like uh, Reddit or Discord or Twitter uh, and so much more on Dungeons & Dragons. We mostly looked at questions on rules clarifications or tips on playing the game, whether you're a player or a DM. So we've got a selection of the most frequently asked, interesting, or fun questions that we could find. And we've only got a little under an hour, so we're going to try to get through as many of them as we can. <laughs> Does that sound right? That, that sounds perfect. And I will do my best to not give an entire lecture on each question. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try to be fast. <laughs> I'm sure that's why people have tuned in, though, because they love to hear your insights on Dungeons & Dragons. So let's jump right into it, because I know we want to get through as many as possible. Uh, our first one comes from our Discord server. Uh, Bazim Gorag, the Firebringer, asks, uh, if someone is flying in a reverse gravity area, and then I cast Earthbind, which direction do they go? That is... Wow, what a great question to start with. So <laughs> the reverse gravity spell, and here I'm opening up my player's handbook. Uh, anytime I do uh, these Ask the Sage lives, whether in person or now online, I always have my books because what I always like to really show, not just talk about, people have heard me talk about this, is look things up uh, because D&D is not a memorization challenge. Uh, no one should ever feel like they've got to have this rich, expansive game entirely in their head. It's why we have D&D Beyond. It's why we have our physical books. We can look things up. I always share, too, one reason why I look things up is I've worked on multiple versions of all of these things. <laughs> so there's always the risk. If I just go by mem my memory, I'm actually going to be referring to two editions ago, mm -hmm. a playtest version that's not actually in the book. <laughs> so that's, that's why. Less of a problem I have and probably more of a problem for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it is a frequent, frequent problem. <laughs> all right. So here we have reverse gravity. And so what reverse gravity does, uh, is it makes it so that everyone in the region of this spell, where you've decided to just make everything topsy-turvy, uh, 
it makes it so that they fall upward. Now, the earthbind spell says that you descend toward the ground, meaning the earthbind spell counteracts reverse gravity. And because I know some people are wondering, does reverse gravity then cause earthbind to call, cause you to fall toward the sky? But in D&D, which is an exceptions-based game, meaning the specific exception that one rule makes makes an exception to other rules, whether those are general rules or other specific rules, essentially specificity wins in D&D. And so each of these creates this situation where reverse gravity is creating this exception where suddenly falling is upward, uh, but Earthbind has a different specificity, which it very explicitly says you descend toward the ground. And here's the thing. If reverse gravity was going to change how earthbind functions, reverse gravity would also have to redefine what ground is, but it doesn't. Uh, in reverse gravity, the ground is still the ground. Uh, all reverse gravity does is change how falling works. But earthbind, again, very specifically says the flyer descends toward the ground, meaning Earthbind is a great way to save a friend who might be uh, in jeopardy of falling up <laughs> into, <laughs> far up into the sky. You can try to earthbind them uh, down uh, with that spell. Fantastic. And I love that question in particular because it gives you more of the broader philosophy of, you know, this is this is how we look at rules, the the specific versus general and and how that kind of hashes out. Um, and 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 that that distinction if anyone's ever wondering why that like why do we design rules like that we do that actually as a mercy to to all of us who play D&D &D and DM the game because what that means is the words on the page or on your screen if you're using an online tool you can rely on them we write them to be your buddy to help you out when you're when you're playing or DMing, and we do our best to make it so that the rules aren't tricking you, uh, and that you don't you don't actually have to come to a person like me. That's our ideal uh, to figure out what the heck is going on in this game. We want the words to matter, and so that's why for us specificity matters. Uh, that the the words we choose we choose very carefully, so that. If we're doing our jobs right, and sometimes we we miss the mark and things aren't as clear as we would want them to be, but it, our goal is a clarity that will make play as smooth as possible. Awesome. Well, let's move on to our next question. Uh, this one also came from Discord. Basic Braining asks, if a fae paladin, for example, a fairy, uses channel divinity that turns a fae, such as in, uh, with Ancients and Watchers, what happens to them? Do they have to make the save? What happens if they fail? Do they run from themselves? <laughs> I, love, I love this notion of... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> having a big oops <laughs> as you as you turn yourself and make yourself run away from yourself. <laughs> All right, so let, let's take a look. I, I opened up to Oath of the Ancients, and I'm looking at Turn the Faithless, uh, where you present your holy your holy symbol, and each fay or fiend within thirty feet of you that can hear you must make a Wisdom saving throw. Now, that's a great question. Because you could interpret this as, well, I'm within 30 feet of myself, <laughs> and I can hear myself. So first, I'll tell you intent. Our intent is that, no, you are not turning yourself. Uh, and here, we are relying on sort of English idiom which is uh, one of the examples I often like to say is if, if I walked up to you and I said, Brandy, here is a box of 12 delicious donuts. Please hand them out to people within 60 feet of you you can see. In regular English usage, you would understand me to mean you are giving them to other people. Uh, and 
And that is sort of what we rely on here. Now, that serves us well most of the time in the rules, sort of relying on idiomatic English, which is just a fancy way of saying sort of the English we use every day. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes there can be some vagueness. And so that's where, again, in a forum like this, I can provide at least some insight into design intent. Our intent is not that you're turning yourself. And, and really, any, any place in the rules where you encounter a situation like this of, it says, do X to people within Y feet of you, we, unless it's a beneficial thing, we mm. almost never mean you. Uh, and it, whereas we view it differently when we're talking about uh, just sort of areas of effect, like you cause a big explosion over there. Uh, well, if you happen to include yourself in the explosion, okay. And But with that explosion, you're not actually choosing the people you're targeting, you're choosing a place, and then people within that, they are then targeted by that effect that blooms out. Uh, and so if you happen to be in that area of effect, well, I, I don't know why you decided to uh, <laughs> drop the fireball on yourself, but uh, you, that, that was your choice. I mean, I've I've definitely been in situations where it's been warranted. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, true. Sometimes the best way to get as many of those monsters in the explosion as possible is to just drop it on yourself. Yeah. All right. Our next question comes from Reddit. Uh, we, we took some questions from the D&D &D Next Reddit, and this comes from Bob Splosion. If you cast Aid, which increases your maximum health, then suffer an effect that decreases your maximum health does aid eat that health reduction and you get away unscathed or does it bypass it so those two effects are, it's basically as long as their durations overlap each other they both apply so aid you know if aid is and this isn't the actual number in the spell, but to actually, you know, not take time looking up every single thing. But <laughs> if aid will say add, increases your maximum uh, hit points by five, mm -hmm. and then another effect reduces your maximum hit points uh, by five, they would essentially cancel each other out. Uh, if aid does five and the other one reduces by three, well, then your uh, maximum hit points are increased only by two. Mm -hmm. um, but then this is where it gets interesting. When, let's say, the, the maximum lasts longer than the aid spell, the minute the aid spell goes away, then that maximum reduction hits your regular hit points in full. Uh, so basically, aid counteracts however much aid can while the spell's duration is active, but once the spell goes away, uh, then you're faced with the full reduction. What this means, by the way, is that aid is a very effective way to temporarily counteract a, a reduction because it can also go in the other order. Mm -hmm. Someone might be subjected to a hit point maximum reduction, and then if the group doesn't have magic that can remove that reduction, you at least, if somebody has the aid spell prepared, you can use that to temporarily counteract some or all of the reduction. I would not be me if I did not say, so it's like a Band-Aid then. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which aid really is. I mean, aid right. is an amazing Band-Aid uh, because, uh, because it's a hit point maximum increaser. That means you can keep healing back up. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if you lose those extra hit points, well, then you can heal back up. That's why aid as a increaser of your maximum is actually more effective than something that, say, gives you temporary hit points because temporary hit points can't be restored. Uh, once you lose them, they're gone. But, ooh, aid, you can just keep, if you have healing, you can keep restoring uh, that that extra cushion that that spell gives you. Awesome. Our next one comes from Discord. Uh, I'm totally going to murder this name, so I apologize in advance. I'm used to seeing these in text and not having to say them out loud. So, uh, Agwin Mock 
uh, asks, what is the decision-making reason for having errata that's not always being documented in the errata release, also referred to as stealth errata? So uh, it's never our intention to have uh, sort of secret significant changes. Uh, sometimes we've actually made a change and it just, it accidentally was left off the official change list, which is one of the errata docs we publish. And if anyone watching uh, has never seen the list of errata documents, which is, these are public documents that list any substantive change we've made to uh, rules or lore in a book that's already in print, uh, you can find those if you search for our Sage Advice Compendium PDF. In that PDF, we have links to all of the current errata docs. Now, sometimes, again, we'll make a change and we'll accidentally not include it in the, in the document. There are other times where we will make like typo corrections in a reprint of a book, and those don't go into errata docs. Because again, the, those documents are really meant to just collect substantive changes, things that could affect how your character plays at the table, how a monster functions, uh, or a significant piece of lore. So there's a little bit of a gray area. Sometimes in the process of fixing like a typo, we might reword something else in a sentence, really maybe just for like the beauty of the wording, you know, we're really just making sort of an editorial call and we might accidentally make a slight substantive change. And then only later when a fan points it out to us that, hey, this seems like a more significant change that maybe maybe belongs in, errata, in an errata document, we have then actually gone back and added those to the errata documents. Uh, so again, we're never, we're never like sort of, uh, you know, like a rogue doing a stealth check and like, all right, we'll see if we can sneak this change in. No, it's just, it's usually through our, either our vetting process, it slipped through, or uh, it was almost like a, a sideways change that occurred while we were making some other change uh, on the same page in a particular book. Uh, which, by the way, I'll, I'll say one more thing along these lines, because a lot of people sometimes wonder too about the timing of errata documents. Uh, uh, some people would love it if we were issuing changes more often. We time the release of those documents to coincide with the release of new printings of the books that actually contain those changes in them. Uh, because we want to make sure that whenever we publish these documents, there are actually books out in the world that reflect that version of the game. We don't want to be in a situation where the only place you can actually find the official wording of the game is in a PDF somewhere. Uh, mm -hmm. For us, it it has to exist, uh, you know, in in one of these <laughs> for for us uh, then to release to the world and say, okay, now this is for real uh, because in fact there are books now out in the world where this new wording exists, gotcha. which means sometimes we sit on changes until those new those new printings are are available for people. Yeah, and those new printings can take a while sometimes, just depending mm -hmm. on, especially in the, the world we live in now with many product delays and shipping delays and things of that nature. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, although as people will discover within the next few months, there's actually been a buildup of these. And so we're suddenly going to release a whole bunch <laughs> yeah, fairly soon. And oh. that's really because of, again, mm -hmm. uh, just the, the process of printing and getting those updated books out into the world. All right. Folks, I'll have to keep an eye out for that coming up. Uh, yeah. Our next question comes from Twitter. Um, I love this user's name uh, because I'm pretty sure it's meant to be Captain Free Time, and I want to be that captain. Um, so sending has become a bit of a meme in my groups due to how vague familiar is as a requirement. Could you clarify the intent of the spell? Is my fifth level dweeb able to prank the prank call the Xanathar because they know of them or have researched them a lot, or do we need to meet? So great question. Here is where our reliance on idiomatic English, which again just means everyday English, can create some unintended uh, <laughs> rules interpretation challenges. Mm -hmm. So when we say familiar, we mean the usual meaning of the word, which is mean, which means you know them well. Uh, 
Uh, you you are you are accustomed to interacting with them, which is to say, just knowing their name, you're not familiar with them. Uh, you know, I uh, I I know uh, many celebrities' names, but I have never met them. I am not familiar with them. <laughs> uh, I am I am aware of their existence, which is not the same as being familiar with them. Uh, now, even though uh, I say that and say, you know, that's the intent. That's what we mean when we say familiar. That is a great example of how if we were writing uh, the spell today, we would be even more specific. Because this is a question that has come up uh, a number of times since the Player's Handbook was released in 2014, which is always a sign of, well, we, we could have spilled a little more ink to make this the intent super duper clear. Uh, but again, intent is we we mean that sort of the usual sense of familiar, which is uh, you know them uh, like for real, <laughs> and, and not and not you just know of them. Probably slightly more than acquaintance, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, not not just uh, you were once at the same party and you caught a glimpse of them across <laughs> the room, like. Uh, I would hope you had at least one meaty conversation with them or were present for someone else having a, an extensive conversation. And you might have even made eye contact a number of times, uh, that kind of familiarity. Perfect. Uh, let's return to Discord for a moment. Uh, Niv Mixit asks a question on invisibility. Uh, I actually saw this pop up in a few different places, but this was the first one, first version of this question I saw. The invisible condition has the isolated bullet point attack rolls against the creature have disadvantage and the creature's attack rolls have advantage. This means that see invisibility and other non-sight senses don't stop the advantage on attacks from being invisible. Is this intended, assumed to be ignored, or a target for future errata? So uh, I love this question. It really drills into that specificity I was talking about earlier. So before I answer the question, uh, I will also point out there are abilities in the game that explicitly say the, the target of them, uh, like the fairy fire spell does this, gains no advantage from the invisibility condition, meaning the whole thing is shut off for them, uh, which would include the second bullet. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a situation where that bullet is not explicitly shut off and, and the questioner is astute in noticing that bullet does not explicitly rely on others being incapable of seeing the invisible person. Because we know in D&D, this, you know, multiverse of magic, mm -hmm. there, are, there are cases where you might actually be able to discern uh, a, an invisible person through some means. If the means that you're using does not explicitly shut off the advantages of the invisible condition, you can be in the odd situation of you can see them, yet that second bullet still applies. If you're wondering how to rationalize that narratively, and by the way, this is intentional. That's why we have things in the game that explicitly shut the whole condition off, but mm -hmm. other places we don't. Imagine an invisible person, say, uh, under the effects of the invisibility spell. Mm -hmm. Even if by some means you can sort of, you can discern them, Imagine that there still is some strange magical shimmer over them that is affecting your ability to target them effectively. If you've ever seen uh, the old Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, Predator, there were, mm. there were portions in that film where people actually caught a glimpse of the Predator, so you could actually see them but the predator still was cloaked and had this odd shimmer. You know, they were sort of uh, semi-transparent. Mm -hmm. Imagine that when you're imagining a situation, the odd situation where I can see the invisible person, but I haven't managed to overcome every aspect of the condition. So you're in this kind of in-between state in terms of your perception of them. Like, okay, I'm seeing their, their outline 
but they still some of the magic of their invisibility is is giving them the benefit of that bullet uh, that gives them advantage on their attack, attack rolls and others having disadvantage on their attack rolls against them. Uh, so yeah, there are there are some neat nuances <laughs> that come out. Uh, and what I encourage DMs and players when you encounter things like this, and this has always been a factor in Dungeons and Dragons, going all the way back to the 70s, where with all of these different elements in play, they'll suddenly interact and create these fascinating corner cases and whatnot. I, as a DM, taking my game designer hat off and putting my dungeon master hat on or my player hat on, I view these circumstances as an opportunity for creative narrative. It's a chance to decide what is going on in the world that's creating this fascinating interaction or this corner case, and sometimes rationalizing them and coming up with a narrative reason for them can come up with some of the most wonderfully odd moments in the game. And... And the thing I want to share with everyone watching is we on our design team, we consider that oddness to be a feature of D&D &D and not a bug. That's part of what makes it delightful, that things will interact in unexpected ways and create these situations that can be funny, whimsical. They can also be scary. Sometimes these interactions will create situations where it's like, oh my goodness, what's going on? Uh, I, you know, where the characters might suddenly be questioning reality. Uh, you know, why are we perceiving things the way we're perceiving them? Uh, so I, I view these things as uh, little, little seeds for creative, on-the-spot narration by the dungeon master or by a creative player who's coming up with, why is my magic working this way? Why, is, why am I interacting with my environment uh, in this particular fashion? Honestly, I feel like those are the greatest gifts as a when I'm in the DM chair is when I get that question, huh, how does that, how does that work out? Because it, it gives me an opportunity to be a little creative in the moment and spin a story with my friends. And that's, honestly, that's, that's the best feature of D&D &D as far as I'm concerned. So yeah, the unexpected, uh, that, uh, that unexpected element in D&D that come from unexpected interactions, but then also the swinginess of the D20, mm -hmm. that unexpectedness to me, again, I'm saying this now as a dungeon master and player, not as a game designer, <laughs> is one of the greatest gifts of the game. Uh, because it, even when you're the DM and have carefully planned out a session, always love that moment as a dm where it's like i did not see that coming mm -hmm. and and rather than that being like oh my gosh that's a oh, what a gift <laughs> it's <laughs> you know just endless delightful surprise so good all right we have a very important question from twitter this comes from phantom p0315 and they would like to know why is there a cat race and yet no dog race exists <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love this question. Uh, so, uh, first off, I, I I might blow some people's minds with this answer, but there is already a race option in the game uh, that has canine features. Oh, do you know what it is? Oh, I I'm gonna just blank because I'm on live stream. <laughs> the shifter. So the shifter in Eberron, uh, uh, because of the werewolf influence and whatnot, and because you as a player uh, largely can influence uh, this, your specific features and how they manifest, you can very easily have dog-like or wolf-like features. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know what people are really getting at is the, the dog version of the tabaxi. Right. Uh, and, when, and we have heard that feedback. Uh, there is no sort of uh, feline favoritism going on here. Sometimes when we design things, there's a very organic process that occurs. And things will appear in our books based on the need of that book. And then it's only sometimes after the fact we'll realize, oh, we created this situation for the game as a whole that was unintended. And this, the cat versus dog thing is one of those things. Uh, it's really just sort of an organic development. But uh, everyone, uh, take heart. If you really want to today 
play a dog-like or uh, wolf-like person, I encourage you to check out the shifter uh, in Eberron Rising from the Last War. Perfect. Uh, the next question also comes from Twitter. This is co coming from Jojo. Uh, do you, and this seems like a very timely question for Wild Beyond the Witchlight. Do hags in a coven share concentration or does each one get their own? Uh, similarly, if one hag dies, do active spells stop? So uh, the rules on a hag coven, and you'll notice I'm not looking this up. I'm being naughty, not following my own advice of looking it up. <laughs> but it turns out Hags and I are like this. So this one, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go with my, <laughs> my deep connection <laughs> with hags. Uh, the coven rules do not actually change how concentration works, and so the individual hags continue to have their own concentration, and. Uh, no spell in the game ends if it's cast or dies unless the description of the spell specifically says so or if it's a spell that is running with concentration. Uh, so, you know, if the if the soul caster of a spell and it's a concentration spell perishes, then yes, uh, the spell ends. Uh, but otherwise, spells with durations, like if you cast a spell that lasts for, it, you know, it says a duration, one hour. And then you croak. Uh, your your spell keeps going for that hour uh, because some magic, and specifically magic that is not relying on concentration, once you basically let the magic loose in the world, it just goes until its duration runs out. With instantaneous magic, uh, actually there is no magic that lasts. There's a magic event that changes reality in some way, and then reality goes back to sort of its only quasi-magical state. And I say that because really the DD multiverse is, even in an anti-magic field, there's still some like background magic because the entire uh, multiverse runs on it. Uh, Whereas concentration spells, you can almost imagine a concentration spell as being this spell that feeds on the caster. Uh, the caster is providing magic fuel for the full duration of the spell. And the moment the caster uh, perishes, uh, is incapacitated, or takes enough damage that their concentration is broken... It's essentially the fuel the the fuel supply got disrupted and the spell ends. Got it. That's a lot of great clarity on concentration in particular, which I know, especially if you're new to fifth edition, you might struggle with that concept. So, I love I love getting filled in on that. Um, the next one is another one that we grabbed from from Discord. Uh, this one is about gates and bags of holding. <laughs> So if I make a gate that leads to the inside of a bag of holding and then throw the bag of holding through the gate, what happens? Ah, uh, bag of holding questions. <laughs> these, 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 by the way, are a, a f part of the fine, many decades long tradition of sage advice. Because uh, mm -hmm. for anyone who doesn't know, sage advice uh, as a name for the forum where que you know questions are asked about D&D's rules, Sage Advice goes all the way back to first edition, and uh, bag of holding questions are a are a tried and true <laughs> part <laughs> of the Sage Advice tradition. Now, uh, I am going to throw a monkey wrench in the whole scenario uh, that was proposed, <laughs> uh, and often the bag of holding questions have some key piece that if you just pull it out, the whole thing falls apart, which I'm going to do here. Uh, <laughs> And, and what it is, is that the gate spell says, you conjure a portal linking an unoccupied space you can see within range to a precise location on a different plane of existence. The inside of a bag of holding is not a plane of existence. It is at most an extra dimensional space, which is not the same thing. Ergo, you cannot open a gate into the inside of a bag of holding, at least not with the gate spell. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there might be other magic that allows you to transport yourself into that, uh, that purse-like state, but the, <laughs> the gate spell ain't it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and yes, I, I honestly don't think it would be a sage 
advice or <laughs> ask the sage without some kind of bag of holding related question. So <laughs> yeah. I had to get one in there. Yeah. Uh, the next one comes from Twitter. Uh, Bob Ross and then a whole bunch of numbers. I'm not going to read off. Sorry, but you know who you are. <laughs> Asks, are the golems blind sight derived from divination magic? If I were to cast non-detection and invisibility on someone, could a golem see them? So uh, none of any creature's senses are reliant on a particular type of magic unless the description of the creature says so. So uh, unless a particular golem's write-up says this this vision is the result of divination magic, then that that sense is not affected by something that can then foil divination magic. So I'm sorry, that golem's going to be able to see you uh, in most circumstances. If you're within the if you're within the radius of its blind sight. Ah. Makes sense. So we have a, a series of questions that are coming up next. And this also comes from Niv uh Mixit. I grabbed this series because they are questions I saw pop up in a lot of places because it turns out people have a lot of questions about blade singers. So the next few are all gonna be focused on that topic. So get ready if you have questions about blade singers, because your question's probably in here. Uh, the first part is asking about the Bladesinger's cantrip. Uh, does the Bladesinger's cantrip in the extra attack proc Eldritch Knight's war magic feature? Ah, right. So this is a multi-class question. So if anyone's mm -hmm. listening and are confused, uh, <laughs> why why does the why is there a question about a wizard subclasses uh, <laughs> feature triggering? A feature inside a fighter subclass. So this is a this is a question that presumes uh, multiclassing is in play, and that this character is a wizard blade singer multiclassing into a fighter eldritch knight. Mm -hmm. All right, now that I've laid that that groundwork for anyone who doesn't typically multiclass, mm -hmm. uh, the answer is yes. Uh, the cantrip in the blade singer's extra attack does fulfill the requirement in the Eldritch Knights feature, because the requirement there is simply, did you use your action to cast a cantrip? And the Bladesinger ability is, when you take the attack action, you have the option of, uh, once you get that extra attack feature, of replacing one of your attacks with a cantrip that you cast. So you are indeed casting a cantrip as part of your action. Uh, so that is a a really, if you're multiclassing, that is a tasty uh, interaction that you can unlock if you decide to uh, combine Blade Singer with Eldritch Knight. It's definitely quite the investment. So it's good to know how that works. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because you do, you have to go pretty deep in both classes to unlock this combination. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next Bladesinger question is, can they use their uh, the attack action to swing a sword and then cast Mending in six seconds? <laughs> no. Uh, and uh, again, uh, for anyone who's wondering, uh, what what is this question actually getting at? Mm -hmm. So the Mending spell uh, has a casting time of, I believe, one minute. I think that's I think why that's right. this question is being asked. Let me confirm. Yeah, one minute. Uh, and the uh, the extra attack action of the Blade Singer lets you replace one of your attacks to cast a cantrip. But that extra attack feature does not explicitly change the casting times of uh, any of your uh, cantrips. And so if you started casting this mending, well, you just started a minute. <laughs> yep. Your next nine rounds of combat are going to be riveting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As you, uh, I'm still casting. What are you doing over there? I'm still mending. <laughs> Just you wait. <laughs> I'm going to mend this robe by, by the time this battle is over. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, this is another multi, uh, multi-class question related to, um, I suspect, probably a very similar build. But would a Blade Singer 6 Fighter 11 need to choose which extra attack feature to use, or would they get two attacks and a cantrip? Great question. So, uh, you and the multi-class rules touch on this 
obliquely. So the, the multi-class rules specify that if you get extra attack from two different sources, so in this case, you'd be getting it from the fighter and from the blade singer and the wizard. Multi-attack specifies that you don't add all the number of attacks together. Uh, now, this question, I say that rule addresses this obliquely because this question isn't about adding the attacks together necessarily, but mm -hmm. it's could, you know, what about this extra exception inside the blade singer? Mm -hmm. What that multi-class rule is getting at is that you essentially have to pick one of your extra attack features to use. That's the intent. Uh, and this is a great question because the rule doesn't hit this question head on. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly something we could clarify in a future version of that rule is really the intention is all up. If you have multiple extra attack features, you use only one of them, but you choose. You choose the one you want to use. Awesome. Uh, and I believe this is the last in the set of these questions for now. Uh, can a blade singer cast a cantrip and throw a net in the same attack action? <laughs> All right. This is getting at the nuances of the net. Yes. <laughs> if you were looking for crunchy oh, questions today, the by net. the way, guys, we've got them. So <laughs> I love it. All right. Our friend, the net. All right, so for those of you who are not up on your net lore, the net specifies, and this is why this question is here, when you use an action, bonus action, or reaction to attack with a net, and this, so this would include the attack action, you can make only one attack regardless of the number of attacks you can normally make. Now rephrase, re-ask the question, please. So now so, that we have this established. Now that we have this established, can a blade singer cast a cantrip and throw a net in the same attack action? So the blade singer, so now we're going to go over, and it's a good thing I have Tasha's cauldron uh, on my desk too. So handy. <laughs> <laughs> I came prepped. It's like, <laughs> what what questions are you going to throw at me? I better have my books here so I can I can easily find whatever it is. All right, here we go. Extra attack. You can cast one of your cantrips in place of one of your attacks. They use a part of the attack action. So the net says you can make only one attack, regardless of the number of attacks you can normally make. Mm -hmm. And the blade singer lets you replace one attack with the casting of a cantrip. So you can't do this. You can't do them both with the same action uh, because the net rule just said you get just one attack, and the blade singer rule is you can replace one attack with the casting of a cantrip. Meaning, so then if you replace that one attack, well, then you're not throwing the net, if that makes sense. Uh, it's, they, they essentially nullify each other. Uh, so, so short answer is <laughs> the Blade Singer cannot, using their extra attack feature, attack with a net and cast a cantrip uh, as a part of the same action. Got it. Let's move on to uh, another platform and another asker. This one came from Twitter. Uh, Kato Katonian asks, how do changes in spell presentation in the Wild Beyond the Witchlight stat blocks interact with other rules? Can these spells be cast at higher level, for example? So, in a, uh, by the way, in an upcoming uh, blog post, uh, should, I, should I talk about that, actually, as a little side thing? Sure, sure. Let's do it. Uh, so uh, my uh, my sage advice column is going to be returning to the wizard's website and actually very soon. Uh, and it's going to be a part of our D&D Studio blog series. And we decided we wanted to revive sage advice as a as a written uh, 
communication uh, and also a way to dive deep into some of the tasty things coming up in our books. And uh, in that upcoming blog post, I talk about uh, how spellcasting appears in some of our more recent stat blocks. So uh, did that, that tease uh, that people <laughs> have uh, Sage Advice columns coming up to look forward to and also that address uh, this question. But I'll go ahead and answer the question now, too. So uh, anytime you have spell casting in a monster that does not use spell slots, then they cannot be upcast because upcasting, uh, which is just sort of our jargon for use a higher spell slot uh, to cast the spell, requires you to be using spell slots in the first place. Mm -hmm. We, we have made a number of changes, not only in The Wild Beyond the Witchlight, but in a number of our upcoming books in how spellcasting appears in most monsters, really with an eye toward improving the DM's play experience. Because one of the things that's become very clear over the last seven years is many of our spellcasting monsters are simply too complicated at the table. And so what, we're, what we are doing, and you're going to see this as an evolution over uh, a number of books over the next year, is us coming up with new ways to keep spellcasting monsters uh, and NPCs exciting, still spell castery, but in a way that is much easier for the DM to manage. Mm. Uh, and one of the ways that we're doing that is we're making it so that spell casting monsters don't actually rely on the DM picking the right spells in a wall of spell choices <laughs> to make that monster be as dangerous as it's supposed to be. Because one of the things that we're addressing in this new approach to spellcasting is in a lot of our spellcasting monsters, if the DM doesn't pick the most optimal damage spells that are in that spell list, most of our spellcasting monsters in play will end up with an effective challenge rating that's way lower than the challenge rating printed in the stat block. That's, mm -hmm. That challenge mm -hmm. rating printed in the stat block basically assumes the DM picked all the right spells. We don't want that to be the case anymore. So what you're going to see more and more is spellcasting creatures who have uh, unique actions that spell out a magical attack or saving throw ability spelled out in the stat block so that it is way easier for the DM to have that spellcaster basically punch at their CR level because we were finding too many spellcasters were punching way below their CR because it was too easy in actual play to miss that in this wall of text hiding down here was Cone of Cold and the CR assumed you cast Cone of Cold every round. Uh, and or, you know, there and there I could use many examples of this. Mm -hmm. So what that means then is what we put in the spellcasting action, which is, by the way, now an action instead of a trait, the spells that go there are almost always utility spells. We're now making sure that the spells that are there, it's obvious that they are not for combat, uh, so that they're not sort of a trap for the DM. Mm -hmm. Or if they are for combat, we ensure that if the DM decides to cast one of them instead of the built-in actions elsewhere in the stat block, the monster CR is still going to roughly come out where it should be. In other words, we've made it so you don't have to worry about upcasting. Uh, and we also don't want you to have to worry about um, keeping track of slots uh, mm -hmm. in a monster because a DM is almost always managing multiple monsters at once. And this is going to be something as we continue to evolve our, our ever living game, <laughs> we're always looking for ways that we can make our DMs lives easier, keep the game exciting. And in many cases, scarier, because if you, one of the things you should take away from what I'm saying is we're simplifying how you play these spellcasters to make them scarier <laughs> because <laughs> we're, we're, we're making it so that it's going to be way easier for the DM to open up a, one of these stat blocks, make some quick choices and have this creature bring the hurt that their CR says they're supposed to be bringing. Uh, and so 
because we also don't want the gotcha of, well, the spellcaster will only hit its CR if you not only pick the right spell, but have figured out that you should upcast it. Mm-hmm. As designers, we do not want DMs having to uh, worry about gotchas like that. Uh, a, a monster, more and more we want it so that you, you open it up and it is going to deliver what its CR promises. And and so you're seeing this most obviously right now in our spellcaster design, mm-hmm. uh, but you're also going to start seeing it in our non-spellcaster monsters as well, uh, where monsters are just going to start feeling like, oof, they got scarier. Uh, and, and one of the reasons is we are now requiring a monster to hit its challenge rating in more ways than just sort of one golden path. Because, uh, and here, this is a look behind the curtain. In a lot of our CR calculations thus far in 5th edition, we typically only require a monster to sort of hit its CR through sort of one path of behavior. The downside of that is that, and by the way, that's because CR really is only a measure of how likely is this monster to TPK a party. That's really all <laughs> it's for. Uh, but what we found is by taking the approach that we did of calculating based on the DM making all optimal choices is, again, it's way too easy for a creature to unexpectedly for the DM uh sort of, again, punch below its CR. Mm -hmm. And we were correcting that uh, because we, again, don't want... I talked earlier about delightful surprise, which (laughs) D&D is filled with. We prefer the delightful surprise to arise from die rolls or fascinating rules interactions, not the kind of surprise that comes from, I chose a CR 11 creature. And it's sure is surprising. It felt like CR3. <laughs> like, that's not the kind of surprise we want. Uh, we want it to be like, no, the CR11 feels like CR11. Unless, and again, DMs, you still have liberty. If you decide to have the spellcasting monster cast Mending for three rounds, that is on you, my friends. <laughs> and you still have that liberty. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, the next one that we have um, comes from Discord. Primordial Trees asked uh, a tips and tricks question. What tricks do you have for remembering concentration checks on taking damage? It seems to be an often forgotten uh, uh, rule to remember at my table. So when it comes to spell management, I as a DM... And many of you who've watched me, DM Acquisitions Incorporated, have actually witnessed this... I treat each spellcasting player, and really the player of any type of character, whether they're a spellcaster or not, I treat each player as basically the DM of their character. And what Mm -hmm. I mean by that is it's actually on the player when I'm the DM to manage their business. And that includes if they're concentrating on something and they take damage, checking. I once in a while as a GM will remember, oh, wait, they were concentrating on something. They need to to make a roll. If I realize that after the fact uh, and the player didn't bring it up, I will almost never uh, uh, interject and say, oh, you need to make a retroactive concentration check. Sometimes I will. Maybe I'm in a mood uh, and, 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 I, and I'm, going to, I'm going to enforce that. But if everyone at the table forgot and we realize a few rounds later, I will almost never do it retroactively. Uh, and here's how I justify it. It's a, it's a random die roll. Mm-hmm. We're just going to assume they succeeded each time <laughs> and we're going to move on with our lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that to me is sort of the grace we can give ourselves as dungeon masters, remembering this is a game run by humans, and we're not always going to remember everything. Uh, even if we stripped this game down to like the simplest game on earth, and I've witnessed this playing because I play a lot of other tabletop games, super simple card games, simple board games, people occasionally just forget things. Mm-hmm. And the grace we can usually give ourselves is just like, let's just keep moving and and have a good time. And again, even that forgetting can be an opportunity to come up with some fun narrative rationale for why 
why it worked out this way uh, in the world. Uh, you know, maybe the spellcaster is unusually resilient that day, uh, or they they meditated particularly well uh, during you know the tail end of their long rest, and they they were mentally prepared for <laughs> all of these challenges that are going to be ahead of them uh, in in the coming day. So, getting back to the question, my mm -hmm. tip is DMs. Remind your players at the beginning of each session until they really internalize it, they are responsible for uh, keeping track of their spells' durations, whether they're concentrating. Uh, this also includes if you cast a spell that maybe does something uh, uh, to foes at the start of, your fo of those foes' turns, it's the player's responsibility to remind me as the DM that, you know, that, that goes on. One thing you can do, by the way, if you have a group that's notorious for forgetting these things, like I'm concentrating on a spell and taking damage, is you could uh, use a miniature or a token mm -hmm. or a card that you lay in front of anyone who's concentrating. And that can be a visual reminder for everyone at the table. Concentration is in play and we want to remember it. Uh, because it, concentration, to me, one of the fabulous things about it is it can create narrative tension. Oh my mm -hmm. gosh, are they going to be able to keep that spell going? And remember, that applies to monster spellcasters too, because if they're yeah. concentrating so on something, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, are we going to be able to uh, break their concentration and get this horrible <laughs> spell to stop? Uh, so try, if you have trouble remembering, put, putting some kind of token or card in front of the, the player uh, or in front of the DM if uh, a, a character they're controlling is currently concentrating on something. Excellent tip. I think we're almost out of time, but I really wanted to squeeze this last one in because I also saw Twitch chat asking a lot about it. So this one's pretty key. Uh, Stormbreaker on Twitter asks, does the Herringon's rabbit hop cost movement like a long high jump does? And people, by the way, also as another teaser for my upcoming Sage Advice column, <laughs> I answer a number of Herringon questions uh, in that. But as a preview, I'll answer this question. So uh, the rabbit hop does not expend movement. And you can see our, our design intent here if you compare the wording of rabbit hop to the wording of the high jump and the long jump. The high jump and the long jump in the player's handbook both explicitly state they consume movement, whereas rabbit hop does not, which is also why we specify in rabbit hop you can't do it if your speed is zero. That's why we <laughs> had to put that in, because otherwise the otherwise the herringon who's uh, petrified could somehow be hopping. Um, <laughs> Because the 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 purpose of rabbit hop is for this to be extra. It is a fabulous trait, which is also why it's limited. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I've seen some people noting, "Wow, this is amazing," which was also feedback we got after the unearthed arcana. Well, that's why Herringons uh, can use it only a certain number of times per day, uh, <laughs> because it is a potent trait, uh, and I think uh, ones. Uh, one that uh, uh, Herringon players are going to love using. Absolutely. I can't wait to start. I'm, I've Rolling up a Herringon is one of the things that's next up on my list, so that'll be a ton of fun to play around with. Uh, that is unfortunately the last question that we have time for today. Man, this blew by. This was wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. Those of you in chat, thank you for joining us today, Jeremy. I, we all appreciate your time. We know you're busy. <laughs> oh, I love I love being here. Thank you, Brandy, for hosting this. And thank you, everyone who sent in questions. Absolutely. Awesome. So thanks again for making the time to join us at D&D Celebration. Up next, we have the incredible B. Dave Walters and his monster squad of misfits coming together to help a dragon reclaim her hoard in the dungeon and the dragon. So stay tuned for that. That is going to be an absolute unit of a game. So enjoy the rest of the show and we will see you next time. Bye.
Here we have a rogue, an expert in stealth, cunning and agility. A rogue's curiosity helps spot traps to disarm and to pick locks, allowing them to navigate dungeons and safely open chests of treasure. They strike from the shadows with precision and speed. They are the epitome of a dashing rogue. Now gather your party and do your best. Adventure together on an epic quest. And welcome to the Dungeon and the Dragon, our mm, experimental D&D session this week, where normally in Dungeons and Dragons, you play the role of a hero going on grand adventures, righting wrongs, slaying beasts in the service of some higher power. Not today. Today, our heroes maybe aren't heroes. Our heroes are monsters. This is not a story of glory and adventure. This is a story of revenge. And let us meet our monsters. Hello, you wonderful people here. Uh, before we get started, what I would like to do is I would, I'm gonna go around the horn here. I'm gonna let you introduce yourself, tell me, who you are, who you are playing, and why the other monsters have heard of you. What have you already done that's gained you some notoriety here? Uh, so we'll just go in the order that you all on are, on, are on my screen. I'm so excited I can barely word right now. Uh, and start with Mr. Matthew Lillard. Uh, hi, my name's Matthew Lillard. I'm playing uh, Hobbs, the Lord of Blades, and this is his visage. <laughs> Arr! He is a warforged that is thrown off the mantle of ownership from anyone else, and he started his own nation of warforged. So we are the nation of warforged, and we are rising up to destroy all good in the world. But I am Hobbs, the Lord of Blades. <laughs> And immediately, every time you see him, he's got blades swirling around him at all times. I look forward to destroying good at every turn. <laughs> uh, Alicia. Hey, everybody. I'm Alicia Marie, and I am playing Bailey Rude. R-O-O-D. So don't, don't get cute. She's a 29-year-old beholder. She's like pink and purple. And the reason why other monsters will have heard of her is because she's one of the founders of beastlysingles.com. It's a website for monsters to meet other eligible single monsters. Um, she was She's known at, under handle uh, Thick and Wicked. So you can find her there. And Bailey's basically adventures because she's looking for love and revenge. <laughs> Por que no los dos, right? Uh, Deborah. I love that she's 29. Not 32, not 37. She's 29. Yeah. 29. Only 29. Uh, some of us have um, been 29 a number of times, actually. Yeah. It's just perfect. I love it. Um, so yeah, uh, my name is Deborah Amble. Um, my character, when you first see them, is about the shape of like a VW bus with sort of, you know, old old timey kind of wagon wheels on the side and just shutting out of it are like knives and swords and daggers and spears and all kinds of pointy things, barbed wire wrapped around the front and impaled on all of these different sharp pointy things are various cadavers in different states of uh, decomposition position. And as it kind of rumbles up towards you, uh, it stops and all of the eyes kind of simultaneously follow anything moving <laughs> in the room. And in unison, all of these dead cadavers say, we are Mecca Boss. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I, yes, I'm playing Nekabus. I am a construct with some sentience, but you will have known Nekabus because just the greatest like necromancers and, and evildoers of all history that you've heard about will call upon Nekabus to enter into a battle, into a siege and help them mow down just masses of heroes. And uh, every single hero that I collect on my spikes and spires becomes part of this sentient, uh, you know, creature uh, in which I can call upon their spirits to fight for me. Amazing. Uh, Mega balls. Mega balls. Mega balls. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Todd Stashwick. Uh, I am playing. <laughs> of the Bone Bramble. <laughs> but he goes by Cutie Pie, and uh, he was born in the good the good part of the Bone Brambles, just south of the Arches of Ulak. Uh, he, uh, he's a beautiful Nalfashni, and for the uninitiated, yeah. Uh, yeah. somewhere in the abyss, a, uh, a gorilla got busy with a warthog crow. <laughs> And thus born the uh, the Nalfashni. He is he is a he is a fiend of about fifteen feet. He's short for his family, um, uh, but he is uh, he's he he sees himself as refined. Um, why the other monsters would know him is is he slew the great and powerful Glurm, and in a live arena event he did a paid cooking show as he prepared and devoured the great and powerful. <laughs> Uh, in last and always eats with cutlery. Carries it with him. Carries it with him. So when something is slain in battle, he won't. He'll bite it, but then in order to devour it, he must. Mm, mm, it's also very because you have to chew it. <laughs> that, yes, yes, and, and, and he has to chew what he eats, and that is cutie pie. Because well, you saw. There is no reason we cannot be civilized, yes. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, Patrick. Uh, hi, uh, my, uh, I am two-time author Patrick Rothfuss, um, <laughs> and I will be playing uh, uh, Persimmon, uh, who is a Tarrasque. Um, uh, how, however, uh, he, is, he is not a mature Tarrasque, um, and and he prefers to be called Dark Raven. I'll throw this out to the group. I would either like either you you guys know him from TikTok. <laughs> um, he's about fifteen and a half, and so you you've seen him on TikTok. I imagine like he does some of the dances, but also like he probably has a series of videos where he's destroying something like really just <laughs> plowing into it um but or i would i would say maybe he didn't get brought into this gig because you knew of him from tiktok uh what um, i would also say as an option what if he had just pinged mechabus on uber and yeah. then like has just sort of like like not like heard about this gig and awkwardly asked if he can come along and he's so enthusiastic <laughs> you didn't say no well yeah but, so mecha bus of course is a land vehicle um and as a side gig because there aren't always great necromancers asking for a siege bus uh so i do uber <laughs> on the side um i, I just want to ask share. yes is yeah. percy a teenage mutant ninja to <laughs> Oh, no. Nice. I mean, um, he is now. <laughs> he, I, I will say he is, he is wearing a T-shirt that says T oh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Turtles, but it's an older one he got from Goodwill. He's yeah, wearing it, no ironically. Because <laughs> he's a hipster. Because he's yeah. a hipster. Gotcha. Yeah. To before they sold out. <laughs> <laughs> Still the black, the black and white, uh, the old ones. Mm -hmm, yeah, right, mm -hmm. right. Oh. Flaming carrot uh, days. Can Ooh. I just say one thing before we dive in? Uh, when I, I first came up with the idea of this and I reached out to these beautiful people, I wasn't quite sure on the tone of how the game was going to go. And then they started picking their monsters and I was like, oh, oh, we're telling that story. Oh, okay, right. Uh, <laughs> Cutie Pie, the Nelfashi, and then the Teenage Tarask. Then I was like, well, the die is cast now. This is, this is where we're going. All right. However, you five 
interesting individuals have been summoned to a cave on the outskirts of the Underdark. Many of the surface dwellers mistakenly believe that the Underdark only extends right underneath Waterdeep, when the truth is it extends up and down the Sword Coast far beyond and far, far deeper. You were each reached out to with a mysterious summons promising you three things that you value. Wealth, knowledge, and power. Uh, ice. As you've arrived in a cavern that abuts a dark, calm, eerily glass lake, you hear a voice echo from all directions. Good. You're all prompt. I can work with this. And down from the ceiling, what looks like a fleshy, mushroom-like pseudopod extends downward right to the surface of the water and opens up and out of it a very very large gray-skinned dragon emerges but it looks like no dragon you've ever seen before instead of scales it looks almost more like a salamander with large gray eyes and its wings hold tight to its body which you can tell would allow it to wriggle down caves and crevices of the underdark its body is covered with odd spores and mushroom-like fungal growths that line not only its body, but the walls of this cavern. You've not seen, but you have all heard of Shakwaira, the deep dragon. And it eyes each one of you in turn. <clears throat> You've heeded my summons. Good. Lord of Blades, welcome. Thank you. And he takes a deep bow. It is such an honor to be here, oh evil one. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes, yes. Bailey. Of course, a beholder is always welcome in the Underdark, but you especially are a joy to behold. <laughs> Cut it out, Harold. We went on one date. I tried to block you on like four different platforms. I have no idea why you summoned me here. I mean, I think it's you, isn't it? And she like adjusts her one big eyeglass that she has on her. <laughs> I, I've known many forms, and I thought it was a great date, really, but no, 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 Harold, I don't know any Harolds, no, no, but thank you nonetheless, it, Mecca bus. Um, I don't know which pair of eyes I'm supposed to look at when I address you. Um... <laughs> As you do that, a, a, a blast of like green smoke of gas comes out the back of this sort of wagon bus. Excuse <laughs> <laughs> you. Well, but yeah, it smells terrible. If you were in that blast zone, it would be really horrible. Um, but it watched on it goes, we are Point us to the battle! Ah, yes, 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 soon, soon, there will be. In one of his other wing, one wing covers his nose and the other wing sort of just beats in the air. Soon there will be glorious battle, yes, 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 yes. Although, um, Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Hey, now, Vashni of your stature is, of course, always welcome in my presence. 
And from behind him, a blast of green gas <laughs> comes out of him ah. as well. He says, oh, I'm sorry, I thought that's how we were choosing to greet each other. Nice! No, yes, no. And he's, he's tying on a bib, and he's like, you know, this seemed like a smashing way to spend any weekend, and I'm promised there's going to be food, yes? And he takes out really rusty knife and fork, and he starts sharpening it. All you can eat, um, however, am wrong. Could you, um... Please call me Cutie Pie. <laughs> Yes, you are quite handsome. It's the jowls, I think. They're too lovely. Um, is that a very small Tarasque? I, 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 I'm he's curious. just very far away. Was I was I was I part of this, or am I like looking out the window of Mecca Bus? <laughs> I feel like you're looking out the window of Mecca Bus. <laughs> has one star rating. <laughs> Tip generously, please. I was led to believe there's only one Tarask, and it is of significant size, but um. You seem diminutive by comparison. So I, I, I actually had my family had a VW bus. So this is a great image. The door <laughs> slides open, and the Tarask gets out, and and it's a little too big to be in there comfortably. So awkwardly gets out, and he says, "Lord." My, my lord, uh, I am larger than I seem, and I guarantee that anything that you need done that a, that a Taras could do, I am up to the challenge. My name is Dark Raven. Wait, don't we know you from TikTok? Is this another one of your challenges? <laughs> uh, well, I was, I was heading... Uh, to the mall, and 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 Nuckabus mentioned that there was going to be like, I mean, I just I can't stress enough, sir. I'm just such a fan, and you know, and I heard that what was on the table was like knowledge, and power, and and money, and like if you could introduce me to Hank Green, I was just thinking that would really, you know, I, that's all I would need, and I'm here for you. Like I, I, you, you might, I might look small. I can, I will swallow a guy. I could, don't think I can't. I will swallow that why does your Why does your name tag say Percy? Seen you on TikTok. He's so nice. It's from Pizza Hut. <laughs> you know? It's from Pizza Hut, and he, like, he, he rips it off. It's on his Teenage Mutant Ninja shirt. He just rips, he rips his shirt, and then he looks really sad because he ripped his shirt. Uh, and he's like, ah... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, if we're going to be working together, uh, you know, Percy is fine. I'd I'll go with Dark Raven. I don't have a problem with him. But... I mean, I would prefer Dark Raven. Fair enough. I assure you, when Respect. you complete this mission, you shall have sufficient wealth to buy all the ironic vintage clothing you <laughs> And he nods. Like, I imagine the horns. Yeah. Like, he's just like, all of the <laughs> awkward teen mannerisms are so amplified <laughs> by this terrasque body. Every fidget of tail and claw and these horns. Oh, it's, it's, it's unpleasant. It's unpleasant to see. He's so uncomfortable. Oh. Joker out of it. Hopefully. Hopefully. You are, of course, welcome here. The five of you gaze upon my cavern, and I ask you, what do you not perceive here? Joy. Slime. Oh, a woman's says. touch. Lighting in a GoPro. <laughs> my hoard. <laughs> my tremendous <laughs> wealth. That was my second guess. <laughs> That's why we're here. As you can see, it is no longer here. I joy. Kind of <laughs> it was my joy. How dare you? It is gone. I was just boomeranged me. I boomeranged me. Perhaps I also wish to know the soft delicateness of a woman's touch. Perhaps Fair really, enough. maybe we Fair enough. never mind. Oh, man, I get you. No. Focus on the task at hand. 
want revenge. A group of heroes. They call themselves Champions of the Light, if you can believe such a thing. Came down here, assaulted me in my own cave, in my own home. We did glorious battle, and unfortunately I was forced to retreat. And they stole everything from me. And now I want you all to steal everything from them. I mean, yeah, that seems... Sure, really that's how it's going to happen. That's not going to action. I mean, uh, just in the direction of these heroes, right? Uh, uh, Percy is holding up his phone um, and recording the whole, like, and he keeps, he, part of it is he's really trying to be intent here, but he's also looking at his phone and get, making sure he's framed up in the background. <laughs> is, is that some manner of sending stone that this young beast... I, I, <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I just, I, for posterity, I'm, uh, this injustice shall not stand. Yes, correct. For structure purposes, I refuse this call to adventure. Then, no, yes, now I've accepted yes. the call to adventure. That's what, oh, yeah, are we meeting with a Very, very small right gap now, between, no, but I did both. Refusal of the call, yes, right. Yes. The rising no, action it. of the narrative, yeah. Here we go. Yes. Here. Baby, Buckle up. As long as there are things to kill, <laughs> we will <laughs> pursue. <laughs> I like Macabus. I oh, yeah. deeply enjoy your overall <laughs> aesthetic. I'm still not clear which eyes to look at. I'm being very respectful. <laughs> Same with I'll you, also... Bailey. Do I look at the central eye or one of your stalks? Is it? Am I being rude? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. I'll be honest. Respect. I know what I look like, and Mechabus creeps me out. <laughs> <laughs> These are your foes, and it motions with a wing. And out of the wall, you see six full-size carved mushrooms emerge <laughs> from the darkness. Someone is crafty. I had a lot of time on that. <laughs> with, his, with his mini painting light. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to get every detail correct so I would not forget these faces. The first of them, he motions towards a carving of what looks like a small elf with a partial mask over her face and two knives in her hands. It is unmistakably a drow. This one is called Razor Edge. Can you believe it? What kind of name is Razor Edge? I mean, that. Oh, I wish I would have thought of Razor Edge. <laughs> Ask uh, the Lord of Blades. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's cool when he does it, though. Not completely. <laughs> he will not mock the Razor's Edge. Yeah. <laughs> who, who is number two on the list? This well, one the Razor's Edge is a drow assassin of incredible skill. It was her initial use of poison that hindered me in the conflict. Mm. I knew her as a child growing up in Minzo Baranzan. I actually helped her escape to the surface. I suspect it is she that told them where my lair lay. But perhaps... She could be reminded of the fact that she has far more in common with us than with those surface dwellers. Yes, ungrateful. Yes, ungrateful. Give, give, give me your speaking stone, Tarak. Five star review. Five star. <laughs> Thank you. Bus. Yes, tip generously. Yes. More gas. <laughs> I, oh, that's, I no, join. Is that, yes. um, okay, <laughs> let's speed this along. The second one, yes. he points to a tall orc with a double-ended axe that is mouth open with spittle coming out of the mouth that he's carved out of slime. They're just like, ah. That Very is... Very impressive. Oh, man, he looks cool. I could... Oh. 
That one is called Gravel. My claws barely was able to scratch his flesh. He was so strong when he gripped me about the neck, but he is dim-witted and easily misled. I believe you could trick him into doing almost anything, but beware, if he becomes angry, he's nearly unstoppable. Yeah, I like him dumb. <laughs> I mean, I haven't read a book in, in a, a very long time. I'm more of an art vibe. Uh, uh, um, yeah. I'm, Cutie Pie is already eating the mushroom <laughs> stack, the first one. <laughs> Careful, you might start seeing some weird stuff if you eat too much of those. <laughs> I, it wouldn't be my first rodeo. <laughs> the third one, Dillowell the Magnificent. You see a carving of what looks like a wizard hiding behind a stalagmite, but with a hand extended as light is coming out of it from a glowing rock he's planted in its stone, in its hand, a glowing stone. Dillowell is a wizard and a powerful <laughs> one. He was capable of all manners of things. I believe he was even able to control time itself. But he is prone to fits of nervousness and indecision. You can pit his prodigious mind against himself and fill him with so much doubt that he will not act at all. <laughs> Spent a lot of time thinking this through. I wasn't ready the first time. I'm ready this time. Then he points at another one, a statue of a gorgeous woman that looks like a cleric that has a halo around her with a shield in a mace. He says, Dawn the Lightbringer. She's the founder of their little group, and she was so oh, god of light this, Bahamut that, the whole <laughs> time. I hated it. She is madly in love with Razor Edge. She thinks uh, people point. don't know about this, but I have my sources. However, Don is hiding something. Besides this, their secret love is their own business, but she has something else she doesn't want the world to know. Perhaps if you discovered her secret, you could use it to motivate her to be of greater assistance. <sighs> then he points in, you see a large, heavily armored man with a pot helmet that covers his head completely with just a slit for eyes and a broadsword on his back, a huge blade that reaches almost to the ground. Sir Diligent, his blows were especially painful, erupting with light and radiance and goodness and other stupid things. <laughs> However, Sir Diligent is more... All the thumbs down. Yeah, uh, uh, three of the corpses vomit out of, <laughs> yeah. out of neck of us. We shall give Sir Diligent a very poor cool rating, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> However, he is more concerned with the law than with goodness. You could use this to your advantage. Perhaps he will frown upon the fact that they outnumbered me six to one and robbed me. And maybe he could be an ally in this. The last one. And, and I will, yeah, I will yeah. say at this, like Percy has been over it and he did like, is like quick filmed each of these. But then when it got to the paladin, he was kind of, he's, he's like, look, he's like, he's like, oh, he's like, I have, mom's told me about paladins and like, oh uh, yeah, like I, I, I'm not afraid of this guy. I, I could, I would swallow him 
and he's kind of you know that thing that that bros do when they're out at the bar and they're drunk where they they're kind of puffing up their chest they're trying to like like get real chesty on somebody uh-huh. and tarask is doing that except it's obvious that he's trying to imply that he could swallow this guy um mm-hmm. but you can see the scale isn't right if this is kind of to scale or, or is this smaller than like one-to-one scale are these smaller you, you, mushrooms you, you, you think they're scale they, they're, they're people size yeah and so he's like he's like i do it i could swallow i could swallow this guy i'm gonna swallow this guy you know and he's like and he's like it's kind of trying to chest up to him except he's like really opening his mouth as wide as he can like and kind of like but he doesn't also want to ruin this really very good sculpture um <laughs> also you're far too young to consume these particular types of substances you're only 15 year old to ask last but not least he points to one that you kind of didn't notice because it's in the back and it's laying on the ground with like an arm up and a liar in the other hand. Just sort oh, of he's dead. Over to the side. Stinger St. Kitts, a bard. Oh. Ah, we have found our first victim. <laughs> <laughs> we should take out the bard first. He is ours. She I see you sculpted her like you sculpted the French girls. And that is what she <laughs> looks like, okay? And mm-hmm. she is a hedonist mm-hmm. extraordinaire. Mm-hmm. She cares more for drink and song than wine or riches or anything else. <laughs> she was actually kind of cool, but yeah. You can eat her first. But that's it. That's the sex of them. I can tell you where they were last seen is you tell me which one you want to pursue first. But be advised. They are in contact. If you dawdle or take too long, they may be able to call for reinforcements and you do not wish to face them at their full power. Use your numbers and your wits to your advantage. Find my horde, get it back, and get revenge. Ah, call to action is complete. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which oh. shall we vanquish first? If we go with Stinger, mm. the other ones will have time to strengthen. Uh, What's the hanging <laughs> fruit? Fruit? Uh, I, I could eat some fruit, man. I'd eat. I'd eat all of that bard. Um, but like, I'm not afraid of that paladin, man. We could do that paladin, or we could we could tell that paladin that like property and 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 the the right to own property is an important pillar of our society i mean as a libertarian it's really all uh, the only reason society works is because people use capital to support are you rolling right now dark raven are you rolling right now i I mean are you live is this live (laughs) but but like, I mean, if he's lawful, he'll have to acknowledge the validity of the ownership of property, and that's the foundation of society. And then he'll have to cop to that, and then he will have to come and help us against his friends, right? I would, I would just like to say that Tarask is now canonically a libertarian. It is. <laughs> so, there you go. <laughs> mm-hmm. Salamander dragon. Salamander dragon. Um, do we know who the uh, head of the like like if we were to cut the head off the snake first, uh, who would that be in the group? Who who was the alpha? Dawn the Lightbringer. Dawn the Lightbringer. He points to the statue of the cleric, which is missing an arm, and I kind of burst. <laughs> <laughs> mm. uh, I shall busy myself restoring my masterpiece while you're away. It was delicious. It was a delicious masterpiece. Mm. <laughs> Ten stars. Mm. <laughs> when you say that, it does sort of laugh uh, a little bit. And you see on the walls of Char- Chuck Wyra's uh, haven here, some of the mushrooms open up these like bright colorful flowers just bloom when it's like (laughs) 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 Shall we put it to a vote? I'm a democrat (laughs) There there are six of them we could roll for it We could All I know is if I hear a loot everyone dies (laughs) That's another thing we have in common This is so weird (laughs) Dark 
Craven has a point. If we go after the head, the rest shall fall. And just think how scrumptious. Yeah, that was that was my that was my point. But again, who's counting? I mean, it was a, it was a group effort. <laughs> uh, so I, I I'd go for I'd go for the head. Um, you know, cleric of uh of whatever, like whatever. What whatever. Yeah. <laughs> As a, fiend, that she's I, as a fiend, I have a bit of a problem with paladins and clerics, I'll That's be honest. What, what I was worried about, we were worried about you. Radiant Dara! Yes, yes. Are yes. you some sort of autonomous collective <laughs> member? <laughs> we, we do not like radiant damage! <laughs> no, we don't. Well, well, okay, okay. So, like, what if, right? Just, I'm just spitballing here. What if we, uh, we go, we, we, we flip, sir, for, sir, vigilant, and vigilant, diligent, 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 and and we we go and we're like, hey, man. Uh, capital is the foundation of all society. You're, you're a lawful man. We know you understand this. And then we flip him. He comes on board, and then we get him to come in, and then we bring take out the Dawnbringer. Having okay. the paladin work for the evil people, that story structure. I mean... <laughs> oh. You could also go to the bard and tell him or her, tell her that she has the ability to capture these incredible deeds. Oh. Wow. Oh. 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 That's, That's a story. One. That's a good one. one. Uh, I also That's think she, I also think she'd make a delicious smoothie. Oh. She would, yes. No, I, I actually bard. Like, yeah, like we go bard. Bard, yes. And we're like, let's hey, this is a story for the ages. And, and also, do you want a duo? Let's duo on TikTok and they will, because I've got like so many. I, 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 and, but like, we duo on TikTok and they come along and we just roll up on all, all these. Yes. We start that. That is where we begin. <laughs> so, so uh, Mecha Bus goes, all right. How many for the bard? And like five of the cadavers <laughs> are there. Yeah. I How agree. How many for the cleric? And like three of the other cadavers <laughs> are there. Yeah. All right, the bard it is. <laughs> You, I take out my little vial of bard spice. Shock Wyra says, Good, yes. There was one of my treasures that those buffoons didn't manage to take. And it peels its wing back further and extends it fully. <laughs> and under it, you see what looks like a like a bronze uh, collapsible something, like a system, a couple of bars. And he pull it out and goes, shunk! And you see a gate opens. And he says, this will take you to the outskirts of town where Stinger St. Kitts was last seen. You should still be able to approach fairly easily with the magnificent Mechaba. But be advised, if they see you, you'll have to make sure they don't raise the alarm. And he motions, and on the other side of the gate, you see a forest. And in a clearing, a small village. And in the middle, there is a building that you can kind of hear laughter and singing coming from, and smoke pouring out of the top of it. But you all will appear out in the trees, some distance from town. And as we're as we're vanishing, I go, you buried the lead! <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was implied. Look at all of you in the game. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet shortcut. <laughs> and you all see uh, again the the town. It doesn't seem huge. Uh, there are um, sort of some sharpened posts on the outskirts of town. Uh, there is uh, a, a, an area that could have had a gate, but it's open. You see a guard standing there. There's probably 25 people in the town. It's by no means like a huge village, and it is obvious to all of your senses that some kind of party is going on at the building right in the middle. What would you all like to do? <laughs> or not a subtle group. I don't really, I actually don't know. What do you <laughs> I, <don't. laughs> I mean, I, I'm Jesus. really, I'm really scary. If maybe if I get in the bus, like we could avoid terrifying them unduly until we're in, in there. Uh, the bus the is bus. totally normal. I'm pretty, I'm actually fairly 
dexterous. <laughs> so with everyone in me, I could maybe sort of sneak up. I don't you, know. Oh, I love the thought of all of us trying to get inside there like a college students in a phone booth. <laughs> Sorry about my brain. Sorry about my brain. Yes. Mecha bus, I, I will say, yes. uh, the road is, is, the gate is wide. You very much could mm -hmm. drive in. You yeah. could attempt to uh -huh. drive in sneakily if you chose. Yeah. Um, you think, I mean, it... We should tell this god we're on the list. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is it... There's, metal, a, there's yeah. a party going on, you said? Yeah. There's a there's party. A party. Yeah. yeah. There's a party. We're on the list. And I, 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 if we pull up, and do, do you have windows that we would hold down? Because <laughs> <laughs> I, am, I am riding shotgun. All 15 feet of me is riding shotgun. Yeah. Uh, I, yes. I, can put, I can try and put the, the thought, because I can telepathically communicate, to tell him <laughs> that, uh, that we were on the list. All right, well, let's do it okay. then. Uh, okay. I appreciate that you're a mecha bus of holding that you guys fit. Because, oh, yeah. Yeah, right there. Just, just get in there. It's a, it's a TARDIS. There. Yeah. You get on top and you can hold on to the spikes, you know. In, in, important point of clarification, Mechabus. We know of yes. the cadavers on the outside. How yes. many cadavers are on the inside? <laughs> Most are on the outside. There's one, you know, completely just at the at the the wheel. Um, I'm sitting on one. Yeah, absolutely. They're stinky and smushy and like, yeah, it's all. I notice the, the seats are actually cadavers. Now, now Me Mechabus, <laughs> I, I, yes. I, I, I know we've, we've We've gotten some uh, some idea of what this is, but as you come driving up to this poor guard, uh -huh. what does Mecha Bus look like emerging out of the woods, coming towards this guy? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm 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 plum colored with wood panels <laughs> along the side. Oh. So I keep a little bit of pledge in the in the dash to kind of keep that shined up when I need to. One of the cadavers is white. Yes. <laughs> oh, 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 can I make no, a no, Can I make a pitch here? You know yes. those things that you'll see in town like during a convention? Where it's all the people who are like peddling a trolley and drinking beer. Yes. 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 Arrange your people like yes. that where it looks like like, oh, we're the party bus. You, you know? Yes. Oh, yeah. Totally. Uh, all of the cadavers try their, you know, undead darndest to put on like a happy like party face. Um, and I even, uh, I, you know, I don't have a stereo or anything. I'm, I'm mostly a wagon, but I, I have kind of a VW shape to me. Um, but uh, all of them are going to start singing, um, you know, Who people wants on the bus the go round and round. Party bus, yeah. Party bus, yeah. So they're gonna try and, you know, drop the beat. Yeah. Um, so the cadavers will make it feel like, and it's gonna jump like this. Oh no! <laughs> all the cadaver butts are twerking. Oh yeah, it's just flap, flap, flap. All of it's oh, going on. I want off this I, thing. I just appreciate you're a cadaver collector on hydraulics. <laughs> Absolutely, on hydraulics. There's a pole in the center that was a big lance spear that if you wanna, you know, have some fun spinning around on that, you can. So the cadavers are trying to make it look like it's a really fun time. Oh my God. I just, I just, the, at the risk of breaking the fourth wall here. Yeah. Viewer, we need fan art of this. Please give us. <laughs> <laughs> Who's a good artist? Hey, Julia. Julia. <laughs> the party cadaver bus. Yes, I will take it all. I'll take, I'll take pencil. I'll take lion art stick figures. We need this commemorated. Okay. Uh, all right. As, as you come rolling up, <laughs> you guys kind of, Look, and they mm -hmm. hear, and they just sort of come out into the middle of the road, Who and they kind of cross the there. The boom, the boom, Who puts they the cross. in the lemon, lemon, ding, dong, poo? <laughs> Their spears you are one only of do this much before we have to get the rights. That's right. Yeah, I'm stopping. Yeah, legally distinct. <laughs> legally distinct. <laughs> um, <laughs> and she's like, um, halt. So I, I lean out, and, I, uh, and, um, and I, uh, I say, oh, we're the band. Um, oh, yeah, we're supposed to. We're supposed to see Stinger Saint Kitts. Uh, we're we're the band, and then I and then I telepathically put in my head, you put into their heads. You remember, 
If you forget, you'll be in trouble. You were told this hours ago. If you, what? Did you guys drink too much last night? I did it again. I completely forgot. Oh, oh, you know what? We should let them in. We absolutely should let them in. Uh, give me persuasion or intimidation, whichever is higher, with advantage. Bum, 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 bum. But you know what? Let's see. Second bus is going to add, we are not the <laughs> monsters you're not. <laughs> <laughs> Look, sir. Droid. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that is, uh, that's an 11. <laughs> Amazing! How does it work? Uh, You've convinced me! <laughs> they, oh. they, they, they sort of look at each other and they go, uh, <clears throat> Well, it's customary in these parts to pay a certain um, toll to get in on the road, right? You all are famous ma musicians, magicians, some sort of like theatrical act. That is an incredible Beholder costume. Wow. Um, <clears throat> but we're going to have to insist on some uh, um, conversation. Oh, Dave, I'll jump out of the bus. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, here you go, man. Here you go. I'll take two blades. <laughs> I will, I will, as I get out, I will cast, I'm going to cast fly. I'm going to take two blades because I remember I am the Lord. <laughs> oh, I am the Lord. I will. Gouge them and fly into the air 500 feet and drop them because I am evil and I can do whatever I want. Is, is, Innocent is, man and women. Is it your intent to drop them in the woods where they won't be? May I collect them? them? I um, <laughs> them. And then drop. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Cadet. Yes, Mecha Bus. Mecha yeah, Bus absolutely. is excited. You very much shank these two dudes. They are defenseless before you, Lord of Blades. <laughs> and two new cadavers are acquired as you guys roll into town. As you do, you see all around people stop and are looking at you. But, you know, one thing that you will find in both fantasy and reality, if you walk in like you belong, you can get into a lot of places. <laughs> and so people are like slowing and looking at you, but they're not screaming and running and things as you pull up to this, what looks like a tavern. <laughs> Act normal. I, I feel like they're all off the, like, normal. Like, 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 like each one of them, like two of them are doing the Travolta yeah, thing yeah, from, yeah. you know, like. In, Sure, sure enough, you walk up is that the front door swings open and a man comes out and immediately starts relieving himself on the wall right next to the uh, to the tavern and turns and looks at you all and goes Is is that a little terrasque? Uh, and like I'm assuming the side panel is open, that that side door, and I'm like there's nothing nothing little here little man don't don't start nothing uh we're we're with we're the with the band we're the band oh yeah yeah oh then you guys need to turn and he turns and immediately pees on your feet percy oh. like, point, like oh around back the back door oh. And, uh, and, oh, oh. Oh, 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 and he's, he's like oh oh yeah. man you did it you did it <laughs> You know the thing where the guy is does wants to look like he wants to fight, but he doesn't, and he's like, he's hoping his friends hold him back. He's like, that's it, man. That's it. That's it. And he, he kind of backs up to the bus, hoping that the arms, and he like takes one of the arms. He's like, no, man, don't. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna get him. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm, <laughs> Mecha bus. And he looks around. Nobody's holding him back. I, I assume oh. nobody on this bus is trying to actually stop. Him. Mr. <laughs> Yeah, the arm very much loveless, like limply flops out of your hand to continue <laughs> uh, Ah, Yeah, right. Fine, 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 fine. Uh, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> no, no, no I, don't, I don't want any trouble, buddy. You put a lot of work into this costume, clearly. And, and I, those, oh, wow, those horns are so shiny. Wait, no, let, let me tell you, hey, I, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me. Is that dude a warthog crow person? 
<laughs> close enough, close enough, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me, let me take take you around back to the to the entertainer's entrance. You yep. are a peach. Uh, uh, and he does like motion. The most the delicious <laughs> of fruits. <laughs> he does. Gonna, I love peaches too. Him. He does. Mm, I don't want him to swallow. Him. <laughs> <laughs> leads you all around the side and there is an entrance that you can see to the kitchen. You can hear like the clanging of cooking. You can smell um, food coming out of there in the middle. There's a giant pot with like a hundred year stew in it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And of course, as you all, uh, well, first of all, do you get out of Mecha Bus? <laughs> this I'm out. Won't fit. <laughs> This dude is like barely standing here, but he's like, yeah, right, 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 but he's trying to go through the door. I say, I say, go get, go get St. Kitts. Uh, Cause we need to, we need to get our, our, uh, our, our upfront money first. You know, can you do always that? Get paid, always get paid first. Yeah. Yep. And we have to have our set list approved. Yeah. Oh. Okay, okay, I'll go get her. Hold on, I'll go get her. And he just sort of like stumbles inside. And all of you give me perception checks. Mm. Well, it's 15. 19. <laughs> 24. Ooh. 24. Yeah. Uh, wait a minute. Oh, oh, no. 23. Ooh. Oh, Holy. I mean, of course, the beholder shouldn't miss much, you know? Yeah. <laughs> right over there. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> that is plenty. Um, you guys see sort of inside, you see this guy kind of stumble into the room, and there is kind of this raucous get-together going on. And he walks up to a table where there, it's difficult to tell from here, although you've seen her full-size uh, statue. She is a halfling. Beautiful red hair. Drinking a, from a Stein that is almost the size of, size of her head, and she's got her feet kicked up. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, who you see dabs? Cutie pie, you said you're in the front <laughs> seat, right? <laughs> You hear, she points right at you, um, cutie pie, and <laughs> you hear in your ear, like she's whispering in your ear, mm -hmm. um, can I help you, mate? Is it, you got a bus full of monsters at the back door. What is this? Uh, and, and do we recognize do we recognize this halfling? So no. Oh no, you've seen the statue. It's her. Yeah. That is, oh, it's that's her. That's her. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I, I then talk to uh, I talk to Mechabus, not out loud, telepathically, mm -hmm. and I say, grab her. <laughs> yeah, she's in run her over. You can, you, I mean, you can try and punch it and drive through the kitchen if you want, Mechabus. I mean, you see through the kitchen. <laughs> I do as I am. <laughs> all, all of these walking dead arms coming <laughs> off, reaching for. Really? And we're like, we're like pulled up right along the board, oh, yeah. and she, right the or back. she, or she's across the room. Yes, yeah, she's, yeah, across, she's the across the room. Oh, yeah. see, I thought she was right up there. Oh, oh no. so. Too uh, late. <laughs> all of the cadavers do this, and they go. We <laughs> and just punch through that back room into the main space, Mecha mowing down whatever's in my way. <laughs> uh, give me athletics if you got athletics. If not, athletics. Check, uh, and you can give it with advantage as you just punch it. <laughs> 24. Mecha bus just boom through the wall. People are screaming and jumping out of the way. Uh, you see uh, how we roll. Literally, literally. Literally. Uh, literally. And, and you come pouring into this room. You see guys start reaching for swords and weapons. And Stinky oh. just jumps back and says, "Well, this is gonna be quite a story." And everybody roll initiative. Oh, <laughs> nice. Oh, I think we did. Yep. Dave, I'm down. Dave, I'm blown down at some point. And Oh, and yeah. land on the back of Megamon. Oh okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I say you you rejoined them when when she recovered the cadavers. You're you're absolutely there. Um. All right. Uh. So I got it here. Cadavers are Wait. all singing heavy metal as best they can. I will. Oh. I, I, I got. I got. Uh, absolutely. 
<laughs> got here in chat uh 15 for cutie pie 11 for mega bus 11 for hobbs 11 for percy and 10 for bailey uh this is what i'm gonna get you guys to do mega bus hobbs and percy roll again just to see who goes wait in the midst of i'm you. last yep. i'm last and uh, oh i hit you at 11 hobbs at bailey at 10. yeah i'm last no i'm mm -hmm. saying I did, i'm the of the last of those three oh, oh, okay. okay all right okay Okay. So, so I um, guess I'm first. Uh, okay, then Hobbs will go in the middle. Perfect. However, Stinger is actually going to go first. Uh, she jumps back and uh, says to you all, uh, I'm not quite sure what's happening here, but um, I guess you can fry. And chain lightning shoots out and hits the bus. It goes through all five of you. Uh, everybody give me a deck save. Man. She has no idea who she's messing with. <laughs> Dang it. She really doesn't. All right, let's see. Oh! Hold it, give me just one second here. I need to just uh, get something real quick. She definitely hits Mega Bus. <laughs> <laughs> How dare she? That's true. All right. How dare she? <clears throat> metal man. I'm gonna it's okay, use. I'm, it's I'm, metal. I'm pulling up another one of my characters here to 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 approximate mm -hmm. approximate what oh, she's doing. Uh, that is gonna be a save of 19. Fail. Oh, 22. Baby. Hits mm -hmm. Mega Bus bad. Super fail. All right. Super yeah. fail. But. Damage resistance to lightning. Oh, so oh yeah, wait, I have a, I have advantage. Uh, yeah, use all of, you got all your money. It's so, not okay, better. So here is where <laughs> things get a little bit tricky because most, I'm pretty sure all of you have legendary actions. You can use a legendary action after someone else does something. So either after she acts or one of your other people acts here. However, um, if you, she did not roll terribly well. Uh, if you did not save, it is 42 points of lightning damage, uh, not counting your resistances or whatever. If you did save, it is 21 points of lightning damage. So uh, resistance, I would just go with the 21. Uh, yeah, if you fail to save, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, do any of you want to use a legendary reaction at the end of her turn? I don't think I have any action. I don't have any. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I have an action. And I'll oh, sorry, go ahead, Patrick. Or no, uh, Bailey, do you, yeah, do you have ba one? Bailey, you have a legendary action? I do. I have three legendary actions. Would, would so I can like take one? Yes, I would like to use the I ray option. Mm hmm. Because um, she can. Exactly. Okay, let me think. Use one it's random. So I can just choose. Reactions. I can just choose an eye ray. Uh -huh. So, yeah, so she just, I mean, she's this big eye in the middle and she has a bunch of little, like, tenderly <laughs> eyes, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> so she would like to just, like, all of them, all the all of her little eyes just sort of look at her and they narrow all at the same time. <laughs> and it just shoots out, <laughs> paralyzed, just for fun, because she likes playing with her food. <clears throat> is that <clears throat> is that an attack for you or a save for her? I'm attacking her. What are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, well, ro roll your attack bin, yep. Okay. Let me pull up a little holder here. <laughs> uh, see, 13 plus. Wow. You know, it's already wild because 18. <laughs> le level 20 is already ridiculous, and then now we're yeah. Running, so yeah. Oh, what's like, the training? Yeah. I um, I am wow. I am sorry. Yep. Uh, I forgot that lightning is a line attack spell. Plus five to hit. Uh, chain 18. lightning is. Yep. So hang on. Let's see something here. Let's see something here. Because okay. uh, uh, as as a real Tarasque. Uh, I do have reflective carapace. You do. Not only do you have reflective carapace, uh, I rolled and I actually got the six where part of the <sighs> lightning shoots back at her and she does not make the save. So as she shocks all of you, it oh. bounces. Oh. Uh, and, uh, and I lean in, I go, we're rubber, you're glue. <laughs> Whatever chain lightning you shoot at us bounces off. 
and sticks to you. <laughs> I do like to imagine that it comes in the form of a dab. Percy dabs and the lightning bounces off of him. <laughs> you, hit, you sh your beam shoots out at her and you see she pulls up her cloak and just blocks it for a second. And she's like, ah, oh, don't take more than that, sweetie. Although I give you a wink back, all right? <laughs> uh, she is not paralyzed. I'll, I'll stand up and say, I'm the Lord of Blade! <laughs> allow me Quick. to say, allow me to introduce myself. My name's Hobbs, and I just want to give you one last opportunity, Miss St. Kitts, to travel with us and tell one of the greatest stories ever to be told, the vanquishing of good by all the most powerful evil creatures you've ever seen. Why are you hiding under your desk, child? <laughs> Stand up and look me in the eye. I dropped the contact. Um, uh, uh, Lord and I'll fly up a little yeah. and I'll uh, say, um, in sooth, imagine the stories. Imagine what we can do together. Together we will capture the most glorious defeat of good you've ever seen. Bad guys never win. Uh, Till today. <laughs> Give me persuasion. Punctuate that. Per a persuasion check, Lord of Blades. <laughs> uh, you, you are uh, you are up, Cutie Pie. Talking is a free action, so I'm letting him in. But he's saying this. What's Cutie Pie doing? Uh, I go, bamf, and I disappear <laughs> in the uh, in the micro bus, and then you hear micro bus, mecha bus. <laughs> <laughs> like a bus. Did I say micro? Uh, and then I, and then you hear, bamf, and I appear behind her, and then I go, a horror nimbus, and then I create a horror nimbus of swirling lights and colors that she must succeed a 15 wisdom saving throw, or Ooh. she will be terrified. Terrified, I tell you. Terrified. Uh, how, what did you get? There? He said, as Doctor Smith. Twenty-seven. Twenty. You know. Uh, hang on. This. Let me check something here. My blades swirl around. You were, she sort of looks at you <laughs> for a second and she goes, mm -hmm. wait, I don't have to fight my friends. I just get to tell the story of what happened. Yes. They're, they're, kind, they're kind of sticks in the mud and then bang, cutie pie, boom. Ah! <laughs> so while terrified, I grab her again and I bamf back into the mecha bus with her. <laughs> you reappear with this screaming, uh, squirming handling. Uh, mecha bus, do you throw it in reverse? <laughs> Punch it! Punch it! <laughs> or do you the rest of the uh, No, I'll tell you, if there are people ahead of me. Yep. <laughs> Like a, like a thrasher yeah. in the, yeah, screw in the field. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I'm. Is it? It's not. Is it my turn? It's not my uh, turn. Oh, well, it might be. You know, uh, actually, uh, it, it, it can't, Yeah, it is. Fabulous. Yeah, As right. I move thirty feet forward, I'm gonna slam twice mm -hmm. to just take out whatever's in front of me. Mm -hmm. all, right, all these, up all more these corpses along the way. Yeah, exactly. The I, I would just. Um, like, I would like to say. You guys would be amazed at how tangled I've managed to become in my cord, in my chair here. I'm, I'm, I'm just like, I'm over here like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, somebody roll for me. No, no, I'll manage. But if you see me like looking down, fighting with something, I am an absolute mess over here. Uh, yeah, well, go ahead and make your Mecha Bus has a 19 and a 27. Uh, yeah. Mecha Bus, do me a favor. Give me yeah. one, roll 1d8 for me. 1d8? Mm-hmm. Six. You were able to acquire six more <laughs> cadavers. Oh, people have been run over, impaled, grab with arms, screaming on the outside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can, can one guy be on the roof of the windshield wipers, wiping the blood <laughs> of all of the other guys? Yeah. Um, and as I yeah bounce forth, all of the heads are like. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> the kidnap the kidnappers welcome the new friends. <laughs> uh, like this way. Change Rawr! names. Yeah, um, and just pick them up and just barrel out the front, back down that forest road with all of my friends. 
is you guys speed outwards. Uh, your fear lasts about a minute, right? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Uh, you, between all six of you, it is easy to re restrain uh, Singer, <laughs> who after a moment kind of snaps out of the fear and just looks around and pulls out her flask and goes, okay, right, right. I had a dream like this once. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so what's the trick then? I'm not looking to die in a cadaver bus with a tiny dress. So, um, what, what, what you lot want from me? Is the thing. You will stay as far away back as you so desire. Yeah. You are going to reach out to your friends and tell them that you want to meet up for a drink, each and every single one, and we will meet them there, and we will destroy them. You'll <laughs> capture that story and regale the world with these accomplices. But you like, don't have to... You like, don't have to get... Yes, yes. Listen, mate, I'm not here to tell you how to do your job or nothing, but I... Would... Actually, we could use some advice. We would really... <laughs> narratively... <laughs> Apparently, yeah. it's this is a little muddy for me too. I, I yeah, I kind of came in part way through. I, I would advise against fighting them all at the same time. A lot of them are dummies, but they're powerful dummies. Um, oh, yes, but, yes. Might I ask? That's not no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you tell them one individually. We'll meet them someplace. Ah, right. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, might I? Might I ask? Um. You you have stolen a horde. Mm, yeah, like last time. Yeah, which you gotta be more specific, mate. The the <laughs> dr dragon mander, dra dragon <laughs> salad dragon. Shock, uh, shock, 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 shock tricks. No, it does not shock. roll off the tongue, mate. It's shock wire. The deep shock wire. Yeah. Shock tricks. Shock. Right. Sh sh and then, shock of course, shock wire. Uh, I was right. testing you. I was testing. Uh, Shakwaira, yeah. the, the horde of Shakwaira, all of this could just go away. You want me to tell you? If you tell us where the horde is. Oh, right, okay, yeah, sure, but here's the problem. Like, I know you might not look like it, but I'm actually a little sharp up here. And if I just tell you where the horde is, what's gonna stop you lot from just eating me? Like, that terrasse bloke keeps, like, extending his jaws to see if it'll fit me head in it. Why? Well, I say, I promise, and I smile just this hideous, <laughs> toothy, tusky, little bit of green. See? Oh, All the cadavers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Turn towards her and smile. Like, sorry. We look like this, yeah. and that guy creeps me out. <laughs> Wait, 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 Be behold it, you cutie over there with, with the eye beam. That's a great trick. Um, do you, I know beholders like to keep their word, reputation and everything. Do you promise if I assist you in this matter that you're not going to let any of them harm me? Yeah, I, I I'd agree it. to that. We could put, I put it up on the gram and once it's <gasps> on the gram, man, it's, it's, there's no going back once it's on the gram. This, I've. I'm Maybe it'll go viral. I'm it's a pentagram. I'm it's, unaware uh... of the existence of an internet, but I do know it's forever. Yes, that's true. <laughs> right. I'll tell you true story. Hand to God. You tell if I'm lying, however, you know how to check. I don't know exactly where the treasure is, but I do know where they took it last. For some reason, they didn't want me to know because they thought I would nick the whole thing, which is simultaneously <laughs> insulting as well as that. <laughs> So, down, okay, Razor Edge, you guys, you guys know who my, my, my friends are, right? Razor Edge, you know, about... Uh, it's the like Glenn Close film. Right. Yes, we're very excited to meet them. Razor lives on the outskirts of town, right? She got a little cave she lives in. She's so dark and edgy, right? I keep trying to get her to come out and drink, but she wants to just go brood all the time. Under there, there's a tunnel that connects to Dawn's place. The two of them are sneaking around. They think nobody knows. Worst kept secret in the world. They took the treasure down somewhere in that tunnel between their two places. You get in either side. Dawn's side, Razor's side, whatever. You get down in there, you find what you're looking for. Um, uh, how about this? Which one do you like less? <laughs> oh, Dawn, she's such a stick. Just asking. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, no, no. Ra <laughs> Raisa, I mean, okay, Raisa and I, we got an understanding, right? Like, Raisa likes to be sneaky and stabby. My gift is with words. I can hurt people, not just their feelings, just when I say stuff. My words are very cutting, you might say. Well, you and did call me tiny, and I've been waiting to say something because I didn't want to derail anything, but you've done it twice, and I'm really... <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, I barely fit in here at all. Hey, look, mate, I'm a halfling, right? It's nothing wrong with being tiny, okay? It, like, it, hey, you know, sorry, man, I didn't mean to insult you, truly. Also, oh, well, that's to, really kind to of Lord of To Lord of Blades' point, is there a way that you could send a message to Dawn and draw her out? <laughs> yeah, I bet I could. I just, like, hey, wait. Counterpoint, counterpoint. I'll get Dawn out. If one of you can figure out what it is she's hiding, I would love to know. It would add a very narrative depth, a B story, as it were, if you just knew what it was. I can get out for you, I can, but. Uh -huh. We're, we have ways of making people talk. Uh, well, okay. We could, I mean, we could, we could go. Razor would probably know the secret. So if we got Razor, then we could just extract the story from Razor and then you would give us Dawn. Yes, well done. Yes. Uh, okay, all right. So here's what we're going You're to You're not do tiny at all. <laughs> I, I, no, you got a big brain in that Only appropriately tiny size. on the outside. Yeah, that's an appropriately <laughs> sized terrestrial skull you got there, mate. Um, okay, I can do a little bit of magic by a spell called sending, where I can send 25 words. I'll say whatever you lot tells me to say, but you got to tell me what 25 words you want me to say. Oh, yes. Hey. So it's like uh, forty characters. We're gonna ask <laughs> Razor Edge about Dawn's secret, yeah. so we can get Dawn out of her house and go to the horn that way. It's foolproof. <laughs> she may not know it's, the secret. It's a great plan, I think. I think I never thought I, it went really. I if we said if we if we sent to Razor's Razor's Edge that we have Razor. Dawn. Th that she has been taken. <laughs> like, oh, no, 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 no. It's, we just say it's about Dawn. It's important about Dawn. Mm. H hashtag, does a hashtag uh, count as a word? What? Well, then it's going to open up a subgroup <laughs> of messages, <laughs> and <laughs> that's going to use up all of our characters. I don't know how to send a pound symbol via <laughs> sending, right? You're right, yeah. <laughs> But that's it, the plan. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. All right. Uh, okay. And, and actually, here I'm in my element. I just I, I thumb type it out. I'm like, I'm like Razor. Tw Twenty five words. Uh, uh, shit. In, Razor. Remember in Saint Kitts voice. <laughs> 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 That's the problem with texting. You can't tell dialect or nuance. <laughs> no, tone. <laughs> no tone. Important news about Dawn. Need to talk immediately. Meet me at maybe danger. <laughs> Leave weapons oh, at home. No danger, no danger. She'll bring oh, friends. Me at, oh, oh, me at, and I look around, I, I look at her, I'm like, meet me at, like where, where would you meet? Out in the forest. Um, um somewhere romantic. Well, yeah, yeah, the, moon, the Moonstone Clearing, mate, is lovely, yeah. Moonstone Clearing yeah. is lovely. Um, uh, uh, and then, um, uh, 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 hurry. Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, uh, those count? Uh, really? Do those count? Right. Hurry. No, it's, hey. Hurry. It's hey. urgent. Hey. Hashtag, uh, hey. well, up like this. Hashtag no filter. Hashtag, um. No, oh, use uh, a filter. YOLO. <laughs> hashtag actually filter. Hashtag right. come quick. Has, hashtag blessed. Right. Got it. Hashtag mate. blessed. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's it. Yeah, okay, um, hold on, it's gonna come back. Oh, wait, um, you, the cutie mate, um, I, I like you with the jowls and the horns, yeah? Uh, you do the brain talk and stuff, can you, like, hear me thoughts or just sin thoughts? Are you just intrusive or do you actually want a dialogue? And you just hear in your head, what would you like to tell me? Uh, 
listen, because here the message is coming back uh, now. And you hear in her head, <sighs> fine. I'm busy, you know. I can't just drop everything when one of you calls. What if I was on a mission? Fine, I will meet you in the romantic glade for whatever Dawn wants. But let me tell you something. I... And it cuts off. <laughs> <laughs> well, she seems a bit over it. <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, but yes... She will meet us. There's more to it that I'm sure we'll get uh, prior to us eating her. You all drive. Do you do anything before you... Two questions. Do you do anything before you go to the Moonstone Glade? And when you arrive... In the, well, first, let me ask you that first, because I'll describe the Moonstone Glade once you tell me. Is there anything before you go? I'm snacking on one of the cadaver's feet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, my bad, my bad. <laughs> totally sorry. It feels good. <laughs> oh. Oh, hey, I'm not here to yuck your yums, cadaver wagon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else before you go? Uh, is anyone healing? Does anyone need I don't have healing. I mean, no one has healing, but evil characters. <laughs> <laughs> There's yeah, no a little, healing. A little beat up. That's uh, one of the drawbacks of evil. <laughs> Uh, when you arrive at the Moonstone Clearing, it is as described. It is very romantic. The moon is shining down on this obelisk-like stone in the middle of the clearing that it looks natural, but that was stood up somewhere along the way. It glows very faintly in the moonlight, and there's a small brook that runs past it. Excellent place to propose. Uh, but at this time of night, no one is there. So what is our plan? We're going to grab her? <laughs> <laughs> and then use and then use her to get the secret out of uh, to get her to get Dawn. Dawn's secret. Dawn's secret. Mm -hmm. That is the currency we're using, I suppose. And then we'll give the secret to Kits and maybe use the secret to also blackmail. Yes, yeah. Yes. 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 I, I mean, secret. It's an excellent plan. I, I get. I like. Foolproof. You, I like you, Lord. I really do. I just. I. I feel like m my betrayal and murder is somewhat inevitable, but I just like to say that perhaps uh, we can work with each other going. Forward. It'll be a great story <laughs> yeah. if you die. Um, <laughs> oh, that might turn out that I'm not the main character of the narrative then. I might actually be support. Hmm. Mm hmm. Never uh, say that to yourself, man. Don't do that. Uh, no. <laughs> We're uh, all our own main character. And secretly, Percy's telling that to himself. <laughs> all of you give me perception checks. Yeah. I have a passive perception of 19. Yeah. No, bro. 11. 26. 26. I'm, I'm high on fermented foot. 22. So. 22? Uh, I'm not, I'm I will say, with this, with this stat block... Rotten flesh don't go well together. It's, <laughs> it's nuts. I think I just got a 30. What? Well... Oh, shoot. That's good, because she got a 30 also. Uh, <laughs> Percy, you're aware someone is sneaking through the trees in your direction. Um, is, are, are we are we still in the bus or are we sort of? You, you tell me. Um, are you wait in the bus. Have you got now? I would say once we got there, we would probably. We be, got. Yeah. 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 Um, and. Loading. <laughs> um, I'll I'll say. Um, oh boy. Now is this like sneaking with intent to like ambush, or is somebody scouting like kind of far I mean, away? You're aware that Razor Edge is an assassin. That is something you've okay. been told. <laughs> so, so, so I'll say, I, I've got a. I'm just gonna go. I gotta see a man about a horse. Um, <laughs> so just specific. Briefly, I'm a little nervous. It's just before we before all this happens. Now I'm, I'm gonna picturing a terrorist riding a horse. Hit a hit a horse <laughs> real quick. Uh, uh, <laughs> and and I head off in in that direction, mm -hmm. like toward them with the with the assumption that they're going to assume they can ambush me. Mm -hmm. um, except I'm gonna I'm gonna like get and like try to start peeing, but before they ambush me, <laughs> I'm gonna try to like then I'll turn around and then I'll get them. That's that's my brilliant plan. Ah. I am fifty. Oh, 
Bailey. I'm gonna split the party yeah. as quick as I can. I'm gonna go one v one. The old piss fake out. See, right. Yeah. Uh, Bailey, were you about to say something a second ago? Sorry. <clears throat> Okay, perfect. Uh, one last question <laughs> before this goes where it goes. Um, uh, where is Stinger, Darren? What are you guys doing with her? We're not going to eat her. No. I, I um, imagine I'll a bunch of hands her. are holding Stinger oh, inside the bus. Mm -hmm. I she's, will hold. She's like, I, I, I'm kind of into this. I'm not going to lie. Can she get one of them to pull me hair? Just a little bit. Now, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, right. And I'll even, it'll it'll rumble a little yeah, bit. Oh, 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 oh. Like those old hotel beds. Oh, that yeah. That you put quarters in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, this, this is taking an unusual turn for my evening. Yeah. Um, great. Um, what are the rest of you doing as, as Percy dips off into the shadows? Mm -hmm. Take a whiz. Is that My little crow going? wings fly, and I go up. Flying up, uh, Hob. Yeah. Where's, where's Hob's gonna be? Um, I will be sharpening my blades. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, I'll be sharpening. I'll be sharpening the blades of Megabus. Um, <laughs> a little rough. That's my sort of my yeah. past. That is like my <laughs> skill set. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Skill set of sharpening. We, 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 all, cure. we got our we got our arts. Uh, what is Bailey doing? Oh wait, so is this like a clearing that we yeah. just like pulled up into? Uh-huh. Okay, is is there a way for Bailey to sort of set some sort of romantic scene? Like maybe like Absolutely. like to set up like so she somehow is able to get a big like toadstool and make like a table with like some little toadstools with, like on the outside and she sort of pokes cutie pie and it's like do you have anything we can put on the table it's like a dish since we're setting up a date do you have anything you can do oh yes and he's got a little he's got a little fanny pack of holding uh that he opens <laughs> and and he starts pulling out like a full plateware but it's filthy <laughs> just filthy never been washed yeah. Rusty cutlery. It's what he has, and you asked. <laughs> so, All the cadavers. We'll say oh, rustic. We'll say oh, rustic. Rustic. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and two of them are nibbling on an intestine. <laughs> Uh, if you... I translate. I tra uh, Hob, Hobbs, are you, are you flying all... Oh, yeah, you're on the ground, okay? And, 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 uh, it's just ching, ching, ching. Perfect. Ching. Is, God. Oh, my God. Her children. For the first time ever, I look at Bailey. So, again, to make it to make it clear here, <laughs> this I'm not saying this plan is going to work, but he How knows that this person is a professional snake. He knows that he spotted them, and he's going to assume that this hero knows that they will not be seen. So he's giving them the opportunity to make an attack, knowing that if you catch somebody in the middle of that unprepared, then you have the, so that, again, that's his plan, is to, is to be aware of where they are while he positions himself, and then they come, and then it's like, ha ha. Right. A defilade. He thinks it's called uh -huh. a defilade. That's not what a defilade is. Um, but that's what he thinks of this as. He's thinking the word defilade as he pretends to get ready to pee. <laughs> Percy, you're aware that this person is creeping towards you. And over your shoulder, you can see this romantic clearing. And they stop. You just don't hear anything. No, no movement, nothing. And so, uh, you know, honestly, then I'm like, oh, no, did I lose track of them? And so I assumed that they got way more stealthy. And then I'm like, I, that, this is my moment. And so I turn around anticipating to get them as they leap towards me silently. So I turn around, I'm like, ah! <laughs> Percy, when you just say, ah! Everything goes completely jet black, midnight inky black. All the rest of you see around Percy just darkness. Like it is nighttime and there is a black sphere around him. Just nothing. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna freak all the way out and attack in every way possible. <laughs> yeah. So he goes full full feral cat here. Uh, <laughs> cat is perfect. Here, I'll zero it up. Yeah. Uh, hang on a second here. <laughs> Bailey. Yes. As you are floating there nearby, 
you feel somebody grab one of your stalks. Oh no. And you feel a knife in the back of your body. And you just hear a low voice say, what the hell is this? And who the hell are you? <laughs> Percy, Percy literally forgot that they tore ass through town and like left people like dead and whatever. And he's and, like, I, I, li- I also Pat didn't think of that, but I'm gonna blame it on Percy. Oh my God, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Bailey, okay. that's what happens. So, yep. Bailey's floating, and she's here the knife, and she's like, Stanley, I told you I was not into that kind of rough play. You were doing it, I wasn't, so cut it out. Uh, right? Gonna, Is that you? I'm going to say your other ice dogs can rotate around <laughs> and see. You see oh. the, the elf from the statue. Uh, oh. She's behind you, and you see, like, she turns and sees that your eyes can see her. And she says, Don't do anything foolish, and you can still get out of this alive. Where is Stinger? Hmm, who's Stinger? The half Do I know kid, Stinger? Oh, no, you, the Stinger St. Kitts. You have her kidnapped in the Mecca bus. <laughs> 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 Do you guys see? Do you guys see Bailey floating? Yeah. Are you just I'm, sort of I'm flying above. This is in the clearing, uh, clearing uh, yeah, right? I, we I, see I, it happen. I would say by the time she's revealed, yeah, you all see that mm-hmm. she's on top of it, that she has Bailey, and it's like using Bailey like a shield against the rest of you. Percy okay. is plunged in darkness over there, and she. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll say. Ah. Now then, there's no need for violence. <laughs> there's so much that, so much more that brings us together than separates us. You <laughs> look around you, you are outmatched. Let us just parley for a moment before death and destruction's welcome again. Let us just have a moment of friendship, shall we? I feel like the Mecha Bus cadavers all smile. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Acquire townspeople. Give me that persuasion, uh, Hobbs. Uh, 19. Keep smiling. Keep shining. <laughs> Legally distinct. Legally distinct. Legally distinct. That's it. That's, yeah. all, that's it. Yeah. Oh, um, she doesn't let go of Bailey, but all Fair of it. you give me insight checks. You all okay. can. Uh, even you, Mercy. I can. Uh, yeah, everybody can. Edit. Oh, nice. Hold on. Seventeen. Seventeen. Perfect. Less than that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Inside is inside is intelligence. Twelve. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Twelve. Twelve. Yeah. Twelve. Eleven. Disturbed. Seventeen. Oh, I got fifteen. Fifteen. Um, Twelve. So all I got is the you, you're, best, all, so you're, all, you're all experienced <laughs> monsters. You all are aware. She's a, you know, you know that she's an assassin. If she just wanted Bailey dead, she'd be dead right now. So the fact she hasn't let her go, maybe mm-hmm. something Hobbs said is getting to her. She does not release Bailey, but she also doesn't kill her. <laughs> she's just <laughs> still holding her there. Can we assume that Percy, like, just furiously screamed and attacked his way to the other <laughs> side of the bubble of darkness? Yes. After about 15 feet of smashing down trees, yes, you emerge back into the moonlight. <laughs> and, and it's like, he's like, ah! like really embarrassing, scared screaming noises. Of and then he comes, he comes out the other side and he's like, <laughs> And then he just like, and then he walks over. (laughs) (laughs) She always stops and watches you run out of the blackness. She looks at you, Hobbs, still kind of peering around Bailey's body. What do you want? Us to work together. We have so much in common. Look at you, you're an outcast, are you not? These heroes don't look at you as, as everyone else does. You're an assassin. You are as evil as we are. You're pretending to be good. It's ridiculous. How much fun do you have when you get to use your poisons? Huh? Quite I a mean, lot, actually. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Because <laughs> you're from the Underdark. But friendship, your friendship, your 
You betrayed your friend? To get their hoard? That's, that's lousy, man. I mean, I mean, that's lousy. Right. Ah, fine. Listen. Where's Dawn? Do you have her here? Yes. No. No, we don't. No. <laughs> yeah, no. Because <laughs> right, she wouldn't go for this particular, like, she, I mean, she doesn't need to know that you were friends with them, right? That's not going to help your relationship. Don't help. I'm tuning in to uh, their thoughts. Nice. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm waiting to hear if someone springs the, hey, what's what's uh, Dawn's deep, dark secret? I can Yeah, I'll it. say, I'll oh. literally say, we know she has a secret. We must discover what it is. You don't know them, do you? And I'm beaming it all back to all my friends. So whatever I hear, y'all are going to hear it. Yeah. Uh, here's, how we're, here's how we're going to do this. Hold on a second here. Um, uh, you are me. Nope, that's not uh, what, what, what is uh, Cutie Pie? What is, what is yes. your, what's, what's your spell, DC? Just your difficulty on anything. 15. Hold on one second here. Let me just check. <laughs> Again, I'll have you know. The only I reason meant I'm not 18. <laughs> oh, 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 say what, Bailey? I was going to say, the, uh, have you know, the only reason I'm not completely shooting her down with a death ray is because I know we need her for something. But otherwise, she'd be as good as a marinade for the next, you know, dinner or whatever. Thank you for your restraints there. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, Bailey. Um, cutie pie. Mm. You hear her think, mm -hmm. there's no way they know about that. There's no way anybody knows about that. And then she starts thinking about spiders, huge spiders. So she's, she's, so what I'm deducing is she's afraid of them. Um, um, I, I said, I sent another message. I sent another message. Uh, well, oh, go ahead. So please. With, with, uh, with her role to resist you, uh, mm -hmm. you don't get fear. If anything, you get the opposite of fear. Or, oh, she might uh, be in cahoots with a loth or some sort of. Or she's in cahoots with evil. The drow. Well, this is this. This is Dawn's. That's secret, what I'm saying. Right? This is Dawn's secret. Dawn's yep. secret. That is so, so I go, yeah. hey, uh, Lord of Blades. This is all telepathically. <laughs> I'm like, uh, press further. I'm getting something. As you see, spiders. We need more information. Increase. Sharpen your blades of interrogation. <laughs> I like listen and then start. I mean, of interrogation, metaphoric, metaphoric, <laughs> blades of interrogation. Um, and I'll say something that we know about the spiders. Yeah, good, good, good. Hmm? We know. Do you? I can see by your face you do. We just Ooh. don't know how many and when. You have to understand, she did it for me. She thought it would have brought us closer. I didn't ask for this. I hey, what do I see? This. You see. Sorry, my, God. <laughs> my God, she's rolled so terribly. She rolled a six the first time and a one the second time. <laughs> oh, she just spills the beans. <laughs> Honestly, dream sequence inside of her own mind here. Um, you see, she is, you see this very clearing. You see a blanket laid out in her with this beautiful elf who has taken her armor off and put it to the side. And mm -hmm. she is holding in her hand a holy symbol of Loth. And she looks Razor in the eye and she says, I've said Bah Bahamut for so long, my darling, but there's a whole world, a whole nother world underground. I could go there with you. I could be of use to law. I realize that normally my kind aren't welcome there, but I would do it. I would do it if it would make you happy. And you see Razor is actually kind of pulled back a little bit. And she's like, I don't know 
that the Spider Queen would welcome either of us, that I don't... We might just be killed the moment we appeared at the gates of Minzo Baranzan. Ah, but it would be worth it to live by your side or die by your side. Once we finish this, once we have the dragon's wealth and their power, we can go anywhere. We can do anything. And that's the extent of what she thinks about. Cut scene. So she's willing to convert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. To, you know, her parents want to prove if I don't convert. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what you get in uh, your mind, cutie pie. And, then I, and I've also like yeah. beamed this into everybody's head. You, you so we all got it. Yeah. And and I beam it over to Stinger. Oh, nice. reminder. Ira Stinger has like pulled one of the hands to kind of choke her a little. Yes. Oh no, oh, no. And, she, and then she sees that and she goes, son of a, and then yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah. However, Razor, who is not aware that you know any of this, mm -mm. says, mm, fine, listen. I didn't want to do this to shock Ryra. I don't care. I don't care about money. I never cared about the money. I just wanted to be able to apply my skills. I didn't plan on falling in love, which is stupid. Also, she looks at one of your eyes, Bailey. She's like, big man, actually. <laughs> <laughs> we met on your site, believe it or not. <laughs> I just... Okay, look, Stinger never did anything to me. What do I have to do to get Stinger and Dawn out of this alive? The others, I don't really care what happens to them. Well, then let's take care of that, shall we? What if we set up the others and put them to death? Wait, oh, that just sounds delicious. <laughs> I just, a little green drool. Yes, we are oh. evil creatures. That's what we do. I am Hobbs, the law. <laughs> we do the monster mash. This is the monster mash. It's the I'll also, monster mash. I'll also say, this is, this is a great pitch for how this all wraps up. Very good. Very good, good on the gram, the pentagram stories. <laughs> what, what we're going to do is this is all for love. And so if yes. you, if you help us get the horde back, we take it back. You apologize to your old friend and Get they me. realize that and and to Bailey really, but but then your old friend can can intercede for you, and the two of you can have that life underground that you want. You need friends, not money. Cause that's when, the real treasure. Yes. Yeah, the when, real friendship was the was what was the people we swallowed along the way. <laughs> Dabbers. <laughs> when when you say friends not money she lets go of your tentacle bailey but doesn't drop the knife she just sort of like lets go and holds the hand up and she says wipe a tear is that what that was <laughs> no she's emo she <laughs> 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 She just says, in exchange for Dawn and Stinger, fine, I can take you to the treasure or I can help you with the others, but we don't have time to do both. Oh. 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 Was that meta? Don't uh, we have to kill good guys? Isn't that I mean, why we're here? Yeah. Um, then I, I eyeball her and I say, eh, but, um, but. But do you do you wanna fucking do I'm sorry? Uh, do you wanna do you wanna kill them? Because like we'd be down for that. We'd be down for that if you wanna get them out of the way. Clean slate! Clean slate, come live down below with your love! Right? You don't want them chasing you into the nether regions? Right? Nether regions. <laughs> that sounds ominous. <laughs> Stinger's like, you can chase me into my nether regions whenever you want. <laughs> and she, uh, Megabus. Yes. Do, do you let Stinger move around? I mean, outside of like the, the restraints she asked for, I mean, are you uh -huh. actually trying to hold her or do you let her move a little bit? 
I mean, I would let her move within me. Right. I don't know. I, I wouldn't let her exit the bus. She's got to stay behind the white line. She does <sighs> sort of like lean over to the window and she goes like, Hey, Raisa, thanks for not throwing me under the bus, metaphorically. <laughs> You've been holding on to that yeah. since the beginning of the game. Sick. <laughs> yeah. She's like, eh, yeah, you, your secret's safe with me too, love. Yeah, we like, maybe I'll go to the underdog. But I don't, I mean, I kind of like staying with this bus, really. And then you see some of the hands kind of grab her again. Uh, she, she's had a few proposals. <laughs> oh. Um, you see Razor just sort of holsters the dagger. And she's like... I'll help you kill them if you like. But I can find them in their beds whenever I want. A week from now, a year from now, ten years from now. I think what you really want, what you are supposed to come and get, is the treasure first and revenge second. I don't care about either. I only care about God. Me too, child. Yeah. Me too after I kill people. You're good at this. You're like, really? You've done this before. Like, good job. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. I can help Let's you. Let's get the gold. Ah, don't we want to kill good guys? I know. Back up, bus. <laughs> Is there a difference? Well, I mean, Never let's... Let's legendary actions. No, 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 let's, <laughs> let's get that. Let's get that money. And like, who knows what will happen when we show up to get it? Because like... Uh, what would I? I mean, uh, but let's get the money. We first. accepted the call to adventure. Which one we did. What is My guess is. Thank you, boss. We'll go. Let it's me check my notes and see if there's an order of importance. <laughs> what did Shaka Zulu tell, tell us? I want the body. One, find and retrieve the hoard. Okay. That was that was no, that was the numero uno. Never listen to authority figures. We go against all the things. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna I'm going to find some uh, uh, Mechatrix, not Mechatrix, Stillerix. What's the Salad Dragon's name? <laughs> Shockwira. She's got Shakira. stuff on me. What she's got say? stuff on me, and I can't. I have to bring the horn back, <laughs> or else she's gonna go wide, and I can't have that. I have a family reputation to protect. I'm going for the gold. <laughs> she has, Mecha, she, uh, she has etchings of you, cutie pie. That you <laughs> yes, want. and they are very unflattering. Macabus <laughs> <laughs> will do as they were summoned. <laughs> Racer. Let's do this. Let's compromise. What? Let's go for the horn, and we send a little message saying, if you want to protect the horn, show up here. <laughs> Come and get it. Yeah. Right. Oh, my God. Razor. Razor guides you all uh, through the night to... I didn't shop at these blades for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> to... Uh, and, hold on a second here. Yeah, as we're traveling, I position myself close mm -hmm. to Bailey and start mm -hmm. asking, about her interests, <laughs> sort of like her her background and her family, and what she you know, what she's looking for in someone. And I saw her like, yes, you know, I'm looking for someone who enjoys long walks over dead bodies of our victims. Oh. I haven't taken long walks when you ain't got no legs, darling. <laughs> long floats, long floats. Let me just say and think about it. Maybe this is why you haven't found it yet. Every every corpse <laughs> laughing in yeah, okay, terrible yeah. unison. Right. I, I still got it. I still can control the room. Right. Uh, Razor <laughs> guides you all through the woods to her cave, and as Stinger told you, and as you were you were informed by Shakwira even, uh, at the back of the cave there is a tunnel mysteriously large enough for you all to enter. Yes. Uh, that does... It's a setup! <laughs> <laughs> and then the fans, the lights come on. She guides you deep into the earth until finally you do enter a room that is just littered with gold. Gold, <laughs> gems, items of all manner just sparkling uh it's a significant haul you actually think it's probably more than just shock virus horde it is probably uh, all their haul in their time of adventuring guess what good thing what i'm a boss 
Will this fit in your fanny pack? <laughs> yeah, I, I do have the fanny pack of holding. <laughs> uh, what would you all like to do? Take um, the money. It, yeah, like, we probably just start, like, shoveling treasure into, <laughs> into the bus. The fanny pack of holding. Did, uh, do, the did, do we have the gate <laughs> that, uh, that we came oh, through? Oh, yeah, to get back. How do we get back? We could yeah. just sort of shovel it through that. Yeah. Is you all are standing there trying to figure Stone out, sending. Um, what, you know, how you're going to get all of this money out of here. All of you make intelligence checks. Oh, this one will be a smoke show. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, no. That is a zero. If you can... <laughs> no, you're kidding me. I, just, I, I like rolled both. a three with a minus three. <laughs> this time. I feel like 13. The open mega bus and the arms are loading and just throwing it through the mega bus. <laughs> <laughs> Make it rain. <laughs> uh, what, what was that, Bailey? No, 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 no Mecca bus. 22. <laughs> 22. What, 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 was, what was Bailey's intelligence there? Uh, 27. 27. Deepers. I'm uh, very smart, as well as attractive. It's all you brain. In there. It Literally, all brain. <laughs> um, Bailey, as yes. you see everybody start <laughs> scooping all the gold up, you and Hobbs realize something at the same time. Something is wrong here. You're like, you can't quite put your finger on it. And suddenly, Bailey, you recognize some of the gems turn and look at you and the gems are eyes. And tentacles erupt out of the treasure hoard and start grappling all of you because this is not the hoard. It is a giant mimic. Mimic. Oh. However, I will say... Third time this week! I will say with that roll so high, especially you, Bailey, and you, Hobbs, recognize the tentacles go after Razor also, and she jumps back. She did not seem like she knew what this was. Yeah. And inside the bus, Bailey's also like... Lord of Light, what was that? <laughs> it all comes out. Uh, all of you, give me deck saves. Uh, man. What if this is Shock Wyra's treasure? <gasps> Twenty-two. <laughs> yeah, you're surprising. Deck Dexter's saves. Zombie bus. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'm just like you punch it, <laughs> Mega Bus. <laughs> they're trying to grab you. You're like speeding here. Um, <laughs> I, I, you grab I miss you it, but I use a legendary resistance. Legend what does it look oh. like when you do that, uh, Percy? When one of these is about to grab you and you will it off of you, what's it look like? Um, I I think he, uh, he he's, he's starting to be overpowered and he's like, oh no, I'm not as big as I thought. And then he realizes <laughs> that he, he starts to floss and uh and it it it, it allow it just sort of it's it's almost like tai chi except he's flossing and the tentacle it just slides right off of it oh perfect perfect um you know what what did you get there cutie pie i've got a 16. all right and hobbs 30 20. and Ooh. bailey Ooh. 18. uh Actually, only Cutie Pie gets grabbed by yes. one of these as the rest yes. of you are right, out of the freaking way. Yes, right, a freaking cotton and, <laughs> and it wraps around you and starts to lift you off the ground, and it squeezes you for sure. 15 points of damage, Cutie Pie. Yes, and yes it does. As it lifts you off the ground, Cutie, it uh -huh. you rises up and there is an alcove, and standing on the alcove, are four people. Oh the no. Four of people you saw in the statues. In hey, the Blades, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> and yes! Are not alone. Shockwira is there with them. What? And Betrayed! Shock That's two Shockwira. Shock. Honestly, you see Razor and Stinger do both look up as Shockwira looks down and says, Fine. I've paid your toll. I've delivered these notorious monsters so that you wouldn't have to track them down. Give me back my horde. And you see Dawn looks down yeah. at Razor and Stinger, and she says, no harm is to come to my beloved. Destroy the rest of them. And Shakurai just says, ugh, fine. Fine. 
breathes a cloud of poison down on all of you. All of you uh, give me... This is so rude. I'm okay. gonna... <laughs> did we lack foresight? I How did, did we not, not see this coming? I did not see this coming. I should have assumed it's a twist, a twist. Oh. The story structure was perfect. We should have anticipated the twist. Curse their sudden but inevitable betrayal. Uh, all of you give me wisdom saves. <laughs> It's poison, though, yes? Uh-oh, uh, Mecha Bus, how we doing? <laughs> for I am immune to poison. Well, right, but it's going to do psychic damage. So oh, you still you're immune! If you're immune to psychic, yeah, you know, you're I'm good. a construct! <laughs> you're, you're good. I'm a bus! Uh, wisdom save. <laughs> And is it is it magic? Uh, it, it's a breath weapon. It's, it's a it's a this is a deep dragon at the risk of being meta. This is the new Fistbane's Treasury of Dragons. It's a new kind of dragon. It's a deep dragon. Ooh, I like it. Mm -hmm. The I reason I ask is is it, uh, magic resistance and no. immunity to poison. Uh, nice. Neither 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 would neither would matter on this. I mean, Mecha Bus. <laughs> Uh, if, you have immunity, if you have immunity to psychic, uh, that counts. Uh, so no what you, get, what, you, <laughs> what you get? What you get, Hobbs? I got a critical save. Perfect. Oh. Uh, uh, you know, we've made it this far, and I didn't say. I only play with one house rule, that a one always fails and a 20 always succeeds, even on skill checks and saves. So you're, you're, you're safe, Hobbs. Uh, exactly. Bailey, what, what do you get? 25. Perfect. Uh, cutie pie? A very proud nine. <laughs> <laughs> and Percy. Uh, 15. Fifteen. You not made it save all night. I was right there in the line of fire. <laughs> yeah, no, Cutie Pie, you take it point blank. Uh, yes. Cutie Pie and Percy. Yes. Yes. You both take 49 points of psychic damage. Yes. And are frightened of Shock Waira, which means you have disadvantage to attack him and you cannot willingly go closer to him. Um, <laughs> for those of you that made the save, you take half the damage and you are not frightened. So that's what, uh, 24. 24. Okay. 24 points of damage and you are not frightened. Mechabus, you are, of course, fine. Don't even realize anything. <laughs> Happened. You know, it's my <laughs> Mega <laughs> Bus is still another, throwing things. Another pleasant uh, gaseous <laughs> expression here. Uh, your your other your other legendary. Uh, I'm gonna use my other legendary uh, uh, resistance there. You can. Then it's gonna be 25 instead, and no fear. Yep. Uh, 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 I can use a legendary action after he attacks. You absolutely can. Uh, it's a cantrip of um, it's a firebolt mm -hmm. and uh, it plus ten so uh, twenty nine to hit. Uh, that absolutely is a hit. Way two damage. Perfect. You Fire. blast shock Waira, who ah! <laughs> Fire! Ah! Um, you oh, hang on. Let me check something else here. You see, uh, all of you see that Razor is like turning and twisting to get away from these tentacles, and she looks up at the ledge and just vanishes. You, inside the bus, Stinger is like, a oh, mega bus, if it's all the same with you, can I stay in here? Because there's a lot <laughs> happening out there. Thumbs up. For what it's worth, I believe in you, mega bus. And she gives you bardic inspiration with a D12. Hell yeah. Oh. D12? Yeah. I D12. love it. D12. Uh, so again, I know the action economy gets very weird. So both... Uh, Razor and Stinger have acted. So if any of you have legendary actions that you wish to use, you can. It's, it's af after another person goes, you can insert them. Yeah. Can I get, how far away is this ledge? How high up is it? Only about 20 feet. It just, they was just sort of set back a little bit. And then once they sort of like look down <laughs> ominously, it's, it's easy to see them. Um, can I, uh, yeah, then I will, uh, at the end of each of those, can I can I close with them uh, to make a tail attack? Do you have a do you have a move legendary action? Uh, I do not. Uh, then you could not. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm so small. You know what? Um, I'll, I'll say I'll, I'll <laughs> say that when Shock Ryra pulls his head out to breathe fire, he's close enough to hit him with your tail. He's big. Um. Okay. Then then I will. Um. Then yeah, I'll do I'll do that. Perfect. All right. 
uh, any other legendary. It's it's about to just be Cutie Pie's turn, but just legendary actions. Any any because to uh, I took two and missed both cantrips. Fire, gotcha. Fire. Yeah, pew, 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 pew. The the remaining fire bolts. It seems like Shock Wyra knew to expect it now and is bringing his wings up as he just oh, bounces yeah. off as you're um, shooting at him. Uh, although uh, those will refresh uh, uh, on your turn. We'll just keep it simple. On your turn, your legendary okay. actions refresh. Uh, however, mm -hmm. Cutie Pie, it is your turn. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead, please. Don't tell me. I was just gonna say this tentacle has you grappled, but not restrained. Right. So, like, so, so but I'm held. I was so. Let me. I, I just geography. I thought like there was this ledge, mm -hmm. and then the thing brought me up like yep. face to face with everything. That is exactly what's happening. Mm -hmm. And your friends are all right. at the bottom. However, so I'm so I wait, can't wait, escape. On, Go ahead, me, please. Let me give you one other piece of important information here. Uh, give me perception with advantage, cutie pie. Ooh. That is a. Uh, that's an eighteen, or. That's an 18. Uh, you are aware, Cutie Pie, that unlike most mimics, this horde mimic is not unintelligent, and you sense an awareness in it. Mm hmm. This is just. So, you, I, as, as I feel the awareness. Yeah. Our, right. Yeah. So, so, uh,. As as the this is all sort of happening simultaneously, I get the doom breath speed a bit. I I, I open my mouth and a, a small child scream comes out of uh, out of my large self, um, and I can't help but emit horror nimbus at at the uh, champions that are standing there. Mm -hmm. It just kind of comes out me like a like a poosh, the flashing lights and dazzle. So whoever is in in fifteen feet of that horror nimbus has to roll a fifteen, uh, so or else they are frightened as well they got a one and a 20 so uh what you see happen there in front of you is uh the paladin sir diligent just slams his sword down and doesn't move however gravel the warrior goes ah, 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 and turns up against running out down the hallway leaving the field of battle so so then so then Telepathically, I say to the mimic, you were a pawn. You were played. You deserve more than this. They used you. The tentacle turns in down towards the mound. At this high up, you can see a full face in the treasure. And it says in your mind, will you free me? A honey percent. The tentacles immediately go out and wrap around Shakwaira. Yes! Like, Whoa! Yes! Ah! <laughs> it is pulling I can't get close to the dragon. Have at, gang, monster squad. Because I'm still frightened. Oh, wait, I can roll to see if I still am. Unfortunately, we are so close on time. So we're going to do this super quick. I'm going to give each of you one chance to tell me what you do in defeating Shakwaira and any of the heroes of your choice. I'm actually going to go around the horn in the other direction, starting with the Please. Mecha Bus. What does oh, the yes. Mecha Bus do in your glorious victory? So, Mecha Bus goes, <laughs> we are Mecha Bus! <laughs> with St. Kit inside, it's just, she's like, oh, we just pummel forward towards Ashwaira, Ash, Ash, what, Sha Ashwaira? Shakwaira? Shakwaira. Shakira, Shakira! <laughs> Shakwaira. Mm -hmm. um, we do two slams with the front with all the pocket wire spikes <laughs> while they're restrained. And they're um, sharp, they're super sharp. Oh yeah, the, all the sharp, <laughs> extra sharpened things, and my D12, which would have been a freaking 11. Yes! So it would have been a whole, yeah, very vertically inspired. Inspired, um, and yeah, bang bang. And uh, as a bonus action, <laughs> I fart out six yeah! vectors that are going to appear right next to those other heroes and start fighting those other, keeping those other heroes from going anywhere. Spirits of the dead engage them. Yeah. Excellent, Percy. Um, I get up there and I look at the paladin and I uh, I do my multi-attack, which is claw, claw, bite. But instead of the bite, I do, I can try to swallow. 
And so, but, and so I want to know, like, like Percy, let me help you. It's terrible. It oh, takes yeah, like, longer than it should. <laughs> <laughs> an ambitious python. Yeah, there's, uh, and, there's an arm <laughs> that is sort of like... Uh, honestly, what, what I really want is to like claw, and I do swallow, but I only get his arm. <laughs> and like, and so he is looking at me and I'm looking at him. <laughs> and, and, and normally I have frightful presence, but I would like to re-pitch it, pitch it as just, extre- everyone is extremely uncomfortable <laughs> being around this at all. Awkwardly consuming him. Uh, yeah. Bailey, what, is, what does Bailey do? Uh, actually, okay, so Bailey, I just wrote a 20 in persuasion, so she sort of charmingly, with all of her eyes, like, just sort of bedroom eyes, she floats over toward <laughs> uh, Shock Wyra, mm-hmm. and, she said, and she sort of rubs up against him and says, you know, Harold, for a second I thought maybe we could have had something. But since you tried to play me, it's not going to happen. And she would like to throw petrification right on him and just turn him to stone. It's he looks at You'll you look good in hand hand to God. I literally rolled a one at a dramatically <laughs> appropriate moment. <laughs> and looks at you and says, So what you're saying is there's still a chance we <laughs> No, because I heard you call me fat. <laughs> and finish it off, Lord of Blades, Hobbs. But what what do you do? In conclusion, I see who I will only now refer to as Dark Raven, <laughs> struggling with his <laughs> And I go and I climb up the side of the of the wall, and I go up to him, and I and as he's trying to gag down the palpit, <laughs> I just I reach behind him and I sort of start massaging his <laughs> shoulders. <laughs> And I just whisper in his ear, you can do it. <laughs> Ooh, dark Raven, I believe in you. <laughs> I believe in you. You're so strong. Hey, give me your camera. Give me your camera. Give me your camera. I'll start. 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 i will i Two hours would not have been enough. I feel like four hours would not have been enough. But here, having defeated <sighs> the traitorous Shakwaira, and afterwards locating the real significant treasure hoard, the six of you having defeated the only good power in this region and the predominant evil power, and now controlling all the wealth, have a pretty good foundation with your newfound friends, Razor's Edge and Stinger St. Kitts, to become the dominant force in the region. But that will be a story for another time. Thank you all so very much. Please enjoy the rest of DD celebration. Thank you, Dave. Good night. Thank you, Dave. Good night, everyone. An adventuring party is gathering. We have a spell-casting wizard and a cunning rogue, a brave fighter and skilled ranger, a mighty cleric and musical bard. Off no doubt on a daring rescue or to solve ancient riddles. Maybe a quest for magical treasure or to defeat a deadly foe. They will make stories with friends that can be told for years to come. Your party is gathered, now do your best. Adventure together on an epic quest. I have to say, I have been 
counting down the days until this very panel because today we will be crowning the first ever Dungeon Master Challenge champion. I am so excited for this. Now hopefully you know exactly what I'm talking about and you are just as excited but if somehow perhaps maybe you were in a coma for the last couple of weeks you might have missed that we have been running the DM challenge. So this was a competition to find the ultimate DM. We launched it and we had 600 people apply from that, we had the very difficult job of whittling it down to 10 finalists who would take part in the actual show. So week to week, we had our fantastic contestants tackle a variety of classic D&D &D designs. So over the seven weeks of the competition, we saw them take on an adventure setting, a villain, an NPC, a magic item, a hazard, and a monster. Each week, we had our fantastic panel of judges, Jennifer Kretschmer, Amanda Hammond, and B. Dave Walters, anonymously review each submission before deciding who to eliminate. In the final week, we had a shocking double elimination. And from there, we had our final three contestants who had to tackle one last challenge. They had to run an encounter for our fantastic panel of judges and two very special guests, Christina Ariel and Matthew Lillard. Of course, there was a little bit of a twist. I'll get to that later. But first, let me introduce you to our three fantastic finalists. We have Sergio Solazano, <laughs> Andrew Bishkinski, and Brad Thompson. Welcome all. Hello. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It feels so strange to finally meet you. We have had weeks and weeks and weeks of the show and I've never actually yeah. had a conversation with you. So I'm going to take the opportunity now. I'm going to jump right in. Brad, I'll start with you. What has it right. been like? <laughs> How has it been in the competition so far for you? Oh, um, well, great fun. Um, definitely challenging. And the kick in the pants I need to really kind of get those ideas finally out of my brain and onto the page and submit it. <laughs> you know it's all go with this challenge i mean all go is exactly right because mm -hmm. sergio for each challenge you had just 72 hours didn't you so tell yes. me what it was like to design with such a tight time frame <laughs> it was just like being a ball of anxiety for those 72 hours like <laughs> thursday to sunday but it kind of in a good way because uh, you know I, i've been the kind of person that likes to create things and then sit on them you know, I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll fix it later. But if this deadline, I had to like, no, you have to get it to a point where you let this go at some point. You say, I did my best job and then let people look at it. And that's part of the process. I think I needed that. Like Andrew, uh, like Brad said, it was the kick I needed, I think, to actually create stuff. <sighs> oh, I'm glad you finished there and not with the, the ball of anxiety, <laughs> which is kind of how I imagined that it was. Yeah. And for you, tell me a little bit about your process. How did you find being in this competition? Uh, well, it was really fun, like the, uh, Brad and Sergio both said. It was really interesting to have the 72-hour window because you knew what the window was. You knew when you had to get it in and sort of the actual writing process, so like putting it down on the page and editing and all that, I figured it takes three to six hours, but it was nice. So I kind of got into a, um, a habit of just like coming up with something, thinking about it for a couple of days, and then on the last day kind of doing all the writing and then getting it in. Andrew, I'm, I'm just going to stay with you. What is it that, you know, drew you to DMing in the first place? Because it's not for everybody, is it? Some people choose to be adventurers, but clearly, you know, you are a DM. I think participating in this challenge proves that beyond anything. So why does it attract you? Well, it's a, it's a storytelling and it's collaboration and it's I think it's facilitation I've always been drawn to things where you get to facilitate something and that's what DMing is it's basically getting other people to have fun and letting them kind of do that by you know guiding them on providing a canvas for them to sort of paint on so it, it's just fun to see other people's light up when the uh, eyes light up kind of when they see the things that you kind of have planned or sometimes things that they do and that you come up with on the spot for them or out of what they've created. Just like bringing it all together is really cool. 
Well, speaking of people's eyes lighting up, Sergio, how did you find it working with Domains of Delight as your source material? Oh, yeah, it was very surprising when I got that, but also, yeah, it's very, very inspiring, I think. Um, you know, the, the very randomness and whimsy of the Feywild just gives you so many ideas, and it's just... Mm -hmm. I think it just stimulates a certain part of my brain that you know I don't often use. I tend more toward like action adventure or like you know darker stuff maybe. So this idea of like domains of delight and things are random and whimsical, anything can happen. I really had to like trigger a different part of my brain and be like, okay, you know, throw some sprinkles on there. <laughs> That's what I need to complete this this, this Sunday that I'm making is the metaphor now, I guess. <laughs> I love it. I, I literally <laughs> love that metaphor. <laughs> a delicious DM Sunday. There you go. I like that. <laughs> Brad, for you, did you have a favorite challenge? Because there were quite a few and they were very varied, I think, really tested Ooh. all of your DM prowess. Favorite? Well, I think, as tempting as it is to say the villain, I'm going to go with Hazard. Because at first I was like, mm. what was it, like quicksand? How do you add narrative with that? How, you, how does a quicksand have a story? And um, But then uh, it just struck me, uh, rampant dreams, these dream bubbles that I can utilize to... Uh, to convey backstory of characters and as well as personal plot for for player characters even. Um, and then from there, just the ideas just ran wild. I mean, I love that one, I have to say. I mean, mm. you, you can kind of, you can see how this 72 hour um, restriction has really forced you to be creative quickly. And I think that's why the three of you are here where you are, because as you said, the fact that you got from, how do you make quicksand interesting to something as great as that is, yeah, a perfect yeah. example yeah. of why we have you three sitting here today. Now, before we move on, I want to quickly ask each of you about your settings. So Sergio, tell me a little bit about Potassio. Yes, Potassio is uh, basically dr I made of my dream to make a banana man somehow a character in D&D. It was, I did a uh, video game battle royale one shot once. Uh, I had like the idea of this banana person, people responded to it. So I'm like, how do I make a banana man a Feywild domain? Easy, I make it a giant rainforest, throw in some of my uh, Nicaraguan folk tales, you know, from my heritage, make it about giant fruit, and there's fruit bats, and, you know, it's, every week there's a new thing, okay, what do I do now? You know, there's colorful clothing, there's giant fruit, there's a giant step temple, so... The top ends up becoming this giant vibrant rainforest where the fruits are the key and anything can happen. <clears throat> I mean, sounds absolutely gorgeous. I, I like that we've got a bit of a, a food theme as well going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I loved it. There's a lot of that. It seemed like everybody had a yeah. kind of similar inspiration, but it was cool. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. Andrew, tell me about Neverfall. Uh, Neverfall is a domain of stars and wishes and magical stardust. And uh, uh, so for me, when I started thinking about what to do in the Feywild. So the Feywild is all about whimsy and silliness. And whimsy and silliness are not really the things that, the ways they usually go. So I started thinking, what else is the Feywild? And it's magic and it's awe-inspiring. And so I I thought of this um, archfey that's like a combination of the moon and a jellyfish, which could be just this amazing thing that you could see coming out of the darkness in a domain where everything is translucent and everybody looks for falling stars and collects stardust and tries to undo wishes or claim wishes. And I thought that would be a really cool way to capture the feel with, I guess, less whimsy, if we're allowed. <laughs> <laughs> You're definitely allowed less whimsy. Although you say amazing, I think terrifying. That sounds like <laughs> like gorgeously terrifying and truly D and D. Well, Brad, it's down to you now. Tell yeah. me about Slumberwood. All right. Well, um, Slumberwood is this uh, spooky, silly domain um, where nothing is ever as it seems, and the themes are going for throughout the setting. Um, you see, Slumberwood is this domain. It's in turmoil. Um, its Archfey Dreamweaver has vanished and her son Yolnir is uh, in charge. And with that change, this happy-go-lucky forest had to swiftly change to these new rules this new Archfey has put in place. All these cute fey creatures now trying to be scary with mixed results. They're not not the best at being spooky. And um, <laughs> and But yet, if you scratch the surface just beneath, um, players will find themselves embroiled in a web of mystery and intrigue. Um, involving the gloaming court uh, against the summer court and uh, yeah and things just sprawl out from there <laughs> I mean that sounds incredible I, I have to say you can really see how difficult it has been for our judges because those are three completely different settings 
all sound fantastic in completely different ways. So yeah, it's safe to say our judges have had a very hard job, as have our contestants. You know, these 72 hour challenges are no joke and they have produced fantastic work week after week. So I'm sure you're wondering what we plan to reward our winner with when we crown our very first champion tonight. So let's take a look at what they will be taking home. Ooh. I mean, yeah, look <laughs> at this. So tonight, our champion will be winning a Dungeons and Dragons Icons of the Realms Gargantuan Tiamat Premium Painted Figure. And that name is longer than the competition was. And it will, of <laughs> course, be mounted on a custom trophy base. Now, this premium figure was provided by our friends at WizKids. And it is just, oh, I mean, you can see how spectacular it is. Really gorgeous addition to your miniatures collection or display shelf. And it's sculpted with incredibly <laughs> detailed features. Premium paint. I mean, it is just the most perfect foe for any adventure. Also, by the way, because I know we're all geeks here, we care about this, it is 14 <laughs> inches high and it has a wingspan of 28 inches. I feel like that's very important to mention because that's the thing we care about when it comes to not so mini miniatures. <laughs> Rare. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you have room on your shelf for that. Give, give that to me. <laughs> 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 yeah, don't worry. You've got time to quickly go and clear some shelf space because what we're going to do mm -hmm. is take a look at how the three of you handled your very final challenge, the encounter, including the aforementioned twist, which was, of course, that our intrepid contestants were DMing each other's designs rather than their own. Let's take a look at how it went. All right. Welcome, everyone, to Slumberwood. I'm Brad Thompson, um, and I'll be running Neville Fool today. And I will be DMing this wonderful session set in the Domain of Delight of Patasco. So shall we lunge right in? Our intrepid adventurers find themselves in a world of darkness and twilight. Like many great adventurers and even more foolish ones, you find yourselves deep within a dark cave. It looks like a lush green forest, beautiful. There's uh, b large birds in the distance and everything. The only thing that's a little bit odd is that the sky is pink, which kind of tells you that, you know, you're not where, you're not in Kansas. But tempted with promises of treasure, magical secrets, and maybe a fearsome monster to be slain. So you see immediately behind you, there is a large dog. Large, horse-sized bats. And one of the trees appears to be shambling towards you. It was branches moving like it's almost sprinting at you. This adult star dragon now towers over you, its scales glistening like the night sky. I am Kilometer Lux, the Star Eater. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. What would you like to do? You were built to serve Dream Wisp. If you don't get out of our way right now, your lady will be lost forever. And I will say, open the door and scream as loud as I can. I'm just going to get really mad. I will roll intimidate. Let's do a wisdom perception check. Roll me persuasion and try and try to shake this this butler. It'll it'll work out, Shiz. Just back me on this one. I promise. I, it's gonna be right. fine. I rolled a four. <laughs> so, so you take three points of fall damage. Makes sense. Makes sense. Is, Go away, you <laughs> crazy orb. Oh, it's been so long since I've let it go. Hey, Lombard. This Now the Have healing we? can begin. As you kind of look up at the castle, like a bolt of lightning suddenly crashes, and you can suddenly hear like a little organ just going. Shit. Tweet, tweet, tweet. <laughs> noise with no chill whatsoever. <laughs> People are preparing lunch. I'm going to look yes. around to make sure we're not to be uh, about to be destroyed. Do I have a sense of what the holy banana does if one were to eat it? Um, My name's Keith, by the way. Um, I really <laughs> not a, not a uh, name you hear too often in the Feywild, Keith. Cool. Not our party party, but our actual party having a party. <laughs> are we starting a multi-level marketing scheme with these cultists? We absolutely are going to narc on all of these people. You know, a Dark Lake, you have enemies in the lobby. There is a dragon and cult is intending to rob you. All right, there's a flash. And with that, 
Thank you for playing Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> uh, well, that is it. <laughs> you sold my waiting room puzzle. <laughs> Finally. Oh yeah, it just took violence. Oh, that looks absolutely brilliant. Don't forget that you can watch those games. You can watch those encounters. They're all up on the D&D Celebration website, uh, dndcelebration.com forward slash challenge. Do go and check them out. As you can see, absolutely hilarious. Really showed off the DM skills of all our fantastic finalists. Of course, it also showed off our esteemed panel of judges who were Amanda Hammond, B. Dave Walters and the wonderful Jennifer Kretschmer, who is joining me here to give us a little bit of insight into how the judging process worked. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. And congratulations. You are all so brilliant. And it, this has been so amazing. <laughs> it's been so incredible to watch your journey here. I Thank mean, you, it Jen. sounds like it has been such a difficult, such a difficult job for, for the three of you. Tell me a little bit about what it's been like to judge this week after week. It's been incredible. I mean, it's been so amazing to watch the process and see all of the creativity and the ingenuity that's gone into these designs and the inspiration that it's it's created. Um, every week it was so exciting to see what people had in store and, and to see how they would surprise us and, and create new challenges. I mean, I have so many new ideas. I, I almost felt guilty going, Oh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna use that, and I'm gonna use that, and I'm gonna use that, um, because there was so much wonderful material that that week after week uh, these incredible finalists brought to us. Um, you know, from week one, I, I'm I'm gonna make a confession here in the in this. So week one, um, never fall in slumberwood were my top two. Uh, right off the bat, I was like, oh, these are incredible. And Potassio, I loved, but I didn't think it was sustainable as a setting. And then. As we went on, I was like, this is incredible. And, and all of a sudden, it was becoming this incredible world with so much dimension and nuance. And so seeing the journey of, of these different places and how they developed and how th these designers dug into the world and, and built them out was so remarkable. Um, and, and we got you know, we got NPCs like Dusty and we got and the Mr. Twinkle who just uh, my face when I saw that, it just, I was so <laughs> overjoyed. But but the creativity of, of things like Slumberwood, which I talked about in so many of my videos, and the fun of that, and, and El Platador, and the Morise, like, it, it just was so much fun uh, to to see where where you all were drawing inspiration from, what you were putting into your stories, how you were choosing to hone what we we got to see of your world it, it was remarkable and to do it in 72 hours was was just phenomenal that is that is not an easy task and you all blew us away every single week um but as, as judges it was it was incredible to, to see what we all uh when we would come together to discuss things what what resonated for each of us uh, because in the beginning i think we were much more kind of the first few weeks, we tended to sort of have the same sense of things. Um, and as we got closer and closer to the finals, it really showed how, how difficult these choices were because we, we all really kind of would get pulled further and further apart uh, on what we, you know, and, and really have to, have to explain why we were, we were choosing the things we were. Um, but evaluating was amazing. I mean, every um, week it was just a joy. And here we are now, you know, having made it through that process week after week, we've knocked out contestant after contestant, despite the work being so brilliant. And it is time to name our champion. And this is how we're going to reveal who the winner is. I have to say, this is one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite reveal methods of all time. So all three of our finalists have been sent a rather mysterious locked case. So inside two of the cases are mimics and only one of the cases is going to contain the spectacular red dragon that signals victory now i know all three of you have posted photos of your cases on twitter because as i said oh so fun to get a mysterious case through the post although probably slightly more anxiety inducing for the three of you than me but it is finally time to find out what is inside and to crown our dm challenge champion well right after we watch just one more video about the judges journey 
to the final three. This was fantastic from the very beginning. We definitely came down to the correct three final contestants. Uh, it has been a game of inches this whole time. It was a game of inches today. And the fact that they all could come up and DM someone else's written campaign on the fly, like after all of the work they put into their campaigns, like to be able to turn those over and it be so understandable that any of them can come in and DM that campaign. I think it speaks a lot to their ability. I thought that Sergio did a phenomenal job. I thought he, he really integrated all of the lore of Slumberwood, uh, got that across, he got a lot of the depth across. He set up a bunch of hooks by integrating Dreamweaver and, and setting up Maybell, um, giving us some good challenges. I also love that he gave us really fantastic options on how to circumvent those challenges if they weren't going well for us, um, like with the bubbles to give us the option to climb up as well. Andrew's skills as a DM are completely on display. We saw all those in spades here. We saw him show off how good he is at collaborative storytelling, uh, doing what I love to see DMs do, which is have the players actually create their own fun experience and pulling out pieces of the players coming up with the decisions about what they've done and how they've been um, moving the story forward in the past. I feel like that's a really difficult thing to do, but he made that seem so easy. Brad, I thought, did a great job giving us puzzles and NPCs and setting up a really interesting um, kind of locked room mystery. Uh, I loved getting to see Dusty and the Misters Twinkle. I mean, I, I adore them. Uh, and I thought it was, it was very interesting to see the way that he was setting up. I didn't ever think to do basically a bank heist scenario with with the material of Neverfall. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that applied and they were the last three, so I think they should all feel very well. Nobody goes home a loser to me, that's for sure. All right, judges. Well, it's been some tough discussions. We've had a lot to think about. Everybody did a fantastic job, but at the end of the day, we can only have one winner for our Dungeon Master Challenge. Do we feel like we have them? I think we know who the winner so? is. Yep. Yeah. But they're all winners. They're all they winners. They are all winners. They are all winners. Yeah, but yes. we can only have one, one, one but official winner. I, but everybody there can did. only be one. I, I do, Such I do an want, incredible I do job. I just want the two who didn't win to know it was this close. Literally. You were all I fantastic. Was close. Was so close. So Take it difficult. Away. Uh, congratulations to all of you. And the winner is. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> well, congratulations, Andrew. You are officially our very first Dungeon Master Challenge champion. So, along with the amazing gargantuan Tiamat trophy provided by WizKids, I'm about to read you a long list of prizes coming your way in the incredible prize bundle. So you are getting a package full of D&D &D DM products and accessories, including copies of The Wild Beyond the Witchlight, Fizzband's Treasury of Dragons, Strixhaven, Curriculum of Chaos, WizKids D&D &D Icons of the Realms miniatures, and Beadle and Grimm's The Wild Beyond the Witchlight Platinum Edition. And to top it all off, you are going to be featured in an article in Dragon Plus magazine. So, as I said, a long list of prizes. I'm gonna give you a second to compose yourself because I'm sure this is quite a lot. And I'm just gonna take a moment to say an enormous well done to Brad and Sergio for making it to the finals. As you heard in that video, it was an incredibly tough decision. I know that the judges were wrestling with it. They loved <laughs> your work. You three really stood out as absolutely fantastic finalists. So, you know, I just want to say, well done. It was enormously close and you were brilliant. And no one has to take my word for it because all your content along with that, along with the uh, work of the other DM Challenge finalists is being compiled as a benefit for Extra Life. We'll have more on that later, so stay tuned. But Andrew, I'm gonna come back to you. How does it feel to be our inaugural DM Challenge Champion? Uh, it, feel, it feels amazing and um, 
unexpected. Th thank you so, so much, uh, Brad and Sergio. Your stuff was amazing, and Sergio running your domain was very easy <laughs> and like easy to put together an adventure and like made my job as a DM a thousand times easier. Thank you. And a shout out to all the other, especially top 10 contestants we've been chatting throughout and communicating. And it's like a little community and like, I want everybody to succeed and I hope they all get to show their stuff, which it sounds like they will. And like, I'm just excited to see other people's things and for people to see some of the stuff that I wrote. What are you going to take away from this? Because I'm sure that this has felt like a journey into who you are as a DM. Um, I've always thought of myself as a designer first and a, maybe a player second and a DM third. And I, I, I think maybe, maybe I'm more of a DM than I thought. So um, <laughs> I think that's gonna be my, my takeaway. The, the other takeaway is just for, from a design standpoint is to always try to subvert anything. If you, if you have to make an archfey and you think your archfey should be a banana and uh, you, all your creatures should be other fruit, go with that. And if you think, uh, if you have to make a complex trap and, you th and your first thought is I should submit a thirst trap, like go with that because that's how I got to where I am. Just like let your imagination take you to the edge and then like use your skill to come back from there with all the cool things you find on the edge. Well, thank you so, so much. What a wonderful way to put it. And I think go ahead and nudge DM up the list a little bit there. I think you have proven yourself worthy. And of course, as I said, Andrew Bishkinski, our very first DM Challenge champion. Thank you all for following along. It has been a wonderful seven weeks. Of course, a huge thank you to our judges who really had quite a difficult job deciding. I am so thrilled that we finally crowned our very first champion. <sighs> okay, I think we're all gonna need a little bit of a break. That was incredibly <laughs> exciting. So go cool down, wipe your brow, and I will see you back here after the break for our final panel of D&D &D celebration. And we have saved a good one for you. It is the future of D&D. See you in a second. the gods flows through these champions. They channel divine healing magic that can protect their allies. Defenders of others are bastion against the unholy. They can even call flames down from the skies to battle their enemies. And when all else fails, a powerful mace is sure to make their foes run for the hills. Now gather your party and do your best. Adventure together on an epic quest. Well, here we are. It is the very final panel of the very final day. I'm smiling, but inside my heart is breaking a little bit and I'm sure yours is too, which is why we have scheduled one of your favorite panels for this slot. It is none other than the future of D&D. This is where we do a deep dive into what is on the way for your favorite role-playing game. We're going to discover what we've got to look forward to, not just this year, but in the years to come. And so, for such an important panel, we need an equally all-star lineup. So please welcome Ray Winninger, Liz Hsu, Chris Perkins, and Jeremy Crawford, who I'm sure you all know and love. So fantastic to have you all with me. 
Thanks, Al. Wonderful Good to be here. Super no. excited to talk about all things D&D. <laughs> exactly. This is my favorite panel. I can't wait. It's the one that I just, I stop being a presenter and I start just being an excited D&D fan who's got a secret notebook of questions. <laughs> so I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm going to get straight to it because I know everybody wants me to pack in as many secrets as I can find out into this panel. So Ray, I'm going to start off with you because you have hinted before, haven't you, that D&D is going to be exploring the multiverse and obviously if you watched the dragons panel yesterday i might have vaguely mentioned i'm a big fan of the multiverse so i'm very excited what can you tell us about that yes well last and last year's panel l you may recall that we uh we talked about uh that we had plans to revisit some of D's classic settings i mentioned that there were three of the the old classic uh D &D settings that are in development in the studio uh, we released the first of those this year with Ravenloft. Um, uh, the fans all saw that, I'm sure. Uh, that book did really great uh, and, and turned out really well. Uh, I've also since said that next year, uh, the other two settings I was referring to are both coming out next year. So look for the returns of two major classic D&D settings next year. Um, both of those are going to uh, actually be published in formats we've never uh, we've never really published products in before. Um, so we have very new ways of presenting each of those. We're very very excited about them, and uh, something new that I can add. I can add a couple of new little little pieces of information. First of all, next year, um, in addition to those two classic settings that we're going to be uh, revisiting. Um, you're going to get just a little wisp, a little, little peek at a third classic D&D setting. So there's like a little cameo appearance from a third setting from D&D's past next year that, that you'll see. And I can also confirm that uh, the following year, in 2023, there's yet another classic setting that will be coming out in 2023. So two uh, re revisiting two classic settings next year, peek at a third, and then yet another classic setting in 2023. All right, here we go. We're straight in. We're straight in with the exciting news, <laughs> with the hints being dropped. Oh, I can't wait. This is what I was here for. Jeremy, I want to come to you next because it does feel, doesn't it, like we're seeing an evolution of D&D, &D, particularly over the last few years as we welcome new audiences, new players, people who didn't perhaps grow up with D&D. &D. Absolutely. And because of that constant influx of new players, we're always listening because we want to make sure that we're not only crafting play experiences and rules and stories that appeal to our longtime D&D fans, but that also are inviting to people who have just discovered D&D this week. And because of all of that listening, people can see that not only are we exploring new styles of play, like in The Wild Beyond the Witchlight, where suddenly you have an entire campaign where you can resolve just about every conflict in it nonviolently, but we're also refining how we present our monsters, how we design our spells. This is a living game, and it is an ongoing conversation with our community, and as a part of that conversation, the game continues to grow and evolve. And over the course of this panel, we're gonna talk a bit about some of that growth and evolution. And this also connects to us exploring different formats. As Ray mentioned, we have new product formats coming. We have more adventure anthologies coming uh, as a part of our listening uh, to the audience. After coming out with Candlekeep Mysteries, we heard loud and clear people love shorter adventures that they can drop in and then, you know, a few evenings of play. More of that and so much more is on its way. Liz. Is this this idea of finding new and innovative ways to engage with D&D something you're actively pursuing as you welcome these new audiences and as you find ways to to keep older players, I'm not going to say older players, um, veteran players engaged? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I think you'll probably hear a few themes threaded throughout the panel today. And uh, Ray and Jeremy both mentioned new product formats will be appearing in 2022. And you know, we really felt like the return of a few classic settings was the perfect time to experiment. Uh, you know, you're gonna see uh, 
our goal has really been, how do we make our products easier to use at the table? How do we introduce new play experiences for fans, both uh, veteran fans and our newer fans? Uh, and, you know, this is really, we're exploring ways to create the best possible experience for players around the table. And uh, you'll see us experimenting and, you know, we're, we're kind of looking into ways that even technology can make your games easier to run and more fun for everyone to play. So uh, all of that is, uh, it, it, these are all things that we're looking at based on player feedback, based on our own experiences around the table. And uh, so, you know, some changes rolling out in 22 and, you know, you'll continue to see more and more of this as time goes on. Chris, what goes into ensuring that players at the table do have that great experience? Tying into what Jeremy said earlier about um, sort of paying attention to what our fans are saying, uh, what they're what they're looking for, uh, what they struggle with, with uh, uh, in terms of products we've released in the past, we we pay attention to what they're saying and we try to refine our products accordingly, not just on the inside, but also in terms of how they're presented as uh, in packaging. So. Uh, if you picked up the Wild Beyond the Witchlight, for example, you may notice that we've made some interior decisions. We've put some stuff in there that's designed to make that product for the DM more accessible and more digestible, as well as giving you tools and uh, other things that you can use to make actually running the adventure at the table an easier experience, um, particularly for, for DMs who don't run adventures th that are that big. Uh, we wanted to make it, even though it's a big adventure, feel like something that you can you can handle and you can manage and you can adapt for your own needs and uh, help you internalize better all the information there with things like the story tracker that we put in and the guidance that we put in the introduction to help you as a DM understand what inf information is important to share with the players versus keep from the players, that kind of thing. But Beyond the book, beyond the the books, uh, we've also want to make the the products just uh, different and varied, and um, sort of tailor the packaging and the form factor to the product in question. And so, even though we're known for making big hardcover books and the occasional box set, as um, my fellow panelists have already alluded to, you're going to see some things that are different from that, uh, where we present our products using different form factors in a different way, all designed to make them more digestible and accessible for their intended audience. And Chris, I'll just come back to you quickly. What, what can we look forward to? So as you said, you kind of listened, you've made these changes. Is there anywhere in particular, anything in particular we should be looking out for? Is there anywhere where we can kind of uh, see a little bit more of what we can expect from from the changes to how players experience this at the table. Yes, you're going to see a blog post coming out soon that will detail some of the changes that we've uh, already rolled out, uh, with more to come in future posts. I can't wait. So do, of course, go and check that out on the website if you haven't already. I know we always throw a lot of information at you in these panels. Don't forget, you can always head by the website to check up on everything that we've said, because I know even I can't fill out my little D&D secret notebook that fast. Now, Ray, <laughs> I want to come to you because in 2024, we have a super exciting milestone coming up. It is 50 yeah. years of D&D. And I think, you know, you can't imagine a more exciting milestone for such a unique, seminal game can you really so what can we look forward to because i'm assuming it's going to be big 50 years it's incredible isn't it and yes it's going to be very exciting for a whole bunch of reasons um one of them is i know there's been a lot of speculation about this but uh you know i can actually reveal today that we have earlier this year we began work on the next evolution of dungeons and dragons uh, new versions of the core rule books, which will be coming out in uh, 2024 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, you know, you probably noticed, the fans noticed that we released uh, a bunch of surveys asking for feedback on various pieces of the player's handbook over the last year. And I know a lot of people were wondering what those were about. Well, this is what those were about. That's us beginning work on this, you know, this, this sort of, as I said, next evolution of the game. 
uh, many thousands of people responded to those surveys. So we really, really appreciate that feedback. It's, uh, you know, again, that's one of the themes through the panel. We listen, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, doing the best to give you the version of the game that you really want. Um, so we can't really say much more yet about, you know, what, you know, what our plans are. We're still making them, uh, but you're going to continue to see more surveys like that. Um, next year uh, is basically the timing will work out. So next year we'll have plenty to say about, you know, these new books and what they mean for D&D. Uh, we'll talk about how, um, you know, one, one thing, by the way, I can assure you is these new versions of the books are going to be completely compatible with all those fifth edition products you already own and love and all the products were released between now and then. So don't panic there. But, uh, you know, uh, next year we'll have lots more to say about the future of D&D. Uh, um, we'll talk not only about the new books, but about some cool new things we're doing in the digital arena to uh, deliver some exciting new uh, Dungeons and Dragons experiences. And, uh, you know, again, probably most importantly, when we're ready to talk more about our plans next year, we'll have a lot more to say about how the fans can contribute and can help us shape this game into all that it can be. Ray, you have managed to master being both incredibly cryptic and yet incredibly exciting. I'm like, oh my God, I'm excited, but I don't know what for. <laughs> I try, yeah. Uh, all right, all right. Well, Liz, is there anything that you can tell me that's perhaps a little bit closer, a little bit more concrete, slightly less cryptic? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you asked because we have a new gift set coming in January. It is the D&D Rules Expansion gift set, and it's really the perfect way for DMs and D&D players, uh, you know, whether it's a gift or for yourself, uh, to really level up your library beyond the core rule books. Uh, so this set contains new printings of Xanathar's Guide to Everything, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and a new volume called Morden Canaan Presents Monsters of the Multiverse. Uh, so this new volume collects tons of D&D material that we've released since the launch of 5th edition into one convenient tome. And there's also a Dungeon Master screen with all new art. And all of this is contained in a beautiful slipcase. So, you know, it's a gift set, which, of course, we would have loved to release it in time for the holidays, but you've probably heard that there are all kinds of challenges around the global supply chain. And uh, so we had our own challenges with production and shipping, which really forced us to delay the release until January 25th. But the good news is you can pre-order this now. And so go to your friendly local game store, uh, go to your favorite online retailer and pre-order this uh, set. Uh, you can plan to save up some of your holiday gift money, perhaps, to, uh, to give it to yourself or to someone, uh, a gamer that you love. Uh, so I, I can't emphasize enough how gorgeous these are going to be. The traditional covers have an extra foil treatment, and we've got this gorgeous alt version uh, that has all new cover art. So, uh, you know, these are just amazing sets uh, and it really gives fans a quick way to create a library of all of the setting agnostic material that they might want for their D&D games. Uh, we put all the expanded roles in one place. And if you've got uh, the core rulebook gift set and you add this new uh, rules expansion gift set, then you really have all of the foundational rules for the fifth edition of D&D. So it's, it's just a really handy way to build your library. I mean, it looks absolutely gorgeous. And weirdly, I kind of like that it's coming in January because January is that boring bit of the year, right? When I've, I've opened all my presents, we've had Christmas, you know, it's that bit when everything seems a little bit more dull. So I feel like it's quite nice yeah. to have something to look forward to, you know. So I think exactly. actually, yeah, January I can do. Jeremy, can you tell us a bit more about the content in this? Because we've seen what it'll look like. We've heard when it's coming. What can we expect on the inside? So fans are already going to be familiar with the content of Xanathar's Guide to Everything and Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. But yes, there is inside this gift set this new volume that Liz mentioned, Morden Kanan Presents Monsters of the Multiverse. And this book is a treasure trove of creature-related material that has appeared previously in other products for 5th edition, but are now all being brought together into one book and updated. 
we, as we wanted to create a single book that would be a sort of one-stop shopping of monsters and also playable races, which I'll get to in a moment, we thought not only can we bring all of this into one place for this gift set, but we can also update some of this material because as Ray revealed, we're already working on our 50th anniversary plans, which will include those new versions of the core books. And as we're working on that update, we thought now's our opportunity to update some of the material that people can use now to already give a feel of where we're headed over the next few years with Dungeons and Dragons. And so as we gathered monsters uh, from various sources into Monsters of the Multiverse and also playable races, all of them have benefited from playtest feedback we've gotten over the last seven years. So we made improvements in clarity. We made, we've added new abilities. We've rebalanced things. We've made some of the material easier to, to digest at the game table. There's new art in this book as well as uh, familiar art. Uh, I think people are going to just be delighted to have over 250 monsters uh, in this book, and over 30 playable races. As far as I know, no D&D book has had ever had as many playable races in one book before. And if people are curious, and I know they are, what those races are, these are all of the playable races we have published outside the player's handbook that are setting agnostic, meaning different playable options that are not tied to a particular D&D world, but people rather who you can find anywhere in the multiverse and the multiverse. That's the theme of this book. As we, as we looked at not only the playable races, but the monsters, we wanted to make sure that everything presented here speaks to the multiverse as a whole. Uh, and so th this is a place where you can find folk and monsters, friends and foes, who you can encounter really in any world of the D&D multiverse, making this the perfect supplement for any of D&D's official settings, as well as for DM's homebrew settings. So there's a, it, it's a lot. Uh, this book, uh, we have been actually working on not only in tandem with our work for the 50th anniversary, but actually also in tandem with the other books coming out this year. So there are things that appear in The Wild Beyond the Witchlight, in Strixhaven, A Curriculum of Chaos, and in Fisben's Treasury of Dragons, all influenced by actually work we were doing on Monsters of the Multiverse. I sort of think of Monsters of the Multiverse as like the secret project we were working on all year that was uh, helping us as we also worked on all of the other books. So it's super exciting for me that we finally get to announce it uh, and people will be able to get their hands on this book uh, first in the gift set and then later on its own next year. It really does feel like everything's leading towards something doesn't it and and they stand alone they are products that you know they have a specific purpose you know they'll definitely whether you're looking to kind of build your world or you know whatever reason you're looking for to pick something up these all have a very distinctive reason for existing but it does feel like they are coming together they are leading towards this kind of new iteration of D D. and i have to say that's the thing that gets me really excited. It always feels like there's something going on I don't know, I have to say. But Chris, I'm gonna to come to you for our final question because as I said, you know, it does feel like we're heading somewhere. So what do you what do you see coming for us in D&D in the next couple of years? What should we be looking out for? What are the highlights as we move into 2022 and beyond? Before I answer that, I'd like to skip back to my partner in crime, Jeremy, who, um, I believe has some additional information to share about <laughs> monsters of the multiverse. That that's right, because uh, for this book, not only are we happy to announce it today, but I would actually love to show some pages from the book, uh, just so that people can see uh, some of the evolutions that await them uh, in this volume. So, how about uh, to start? Uh, we bring up the Bard, and what we're going to do is we're going to show you 
uh, the Bard NPC, as the creature first appeared back in Volo's Guide to Monsters, and then you now see it uh, on the other side of the slide, the version of the Bard that appears in Monsters of the Multiverse. So first, you'll see new art. Uh, this delightful piece with this dragonborn bard uh, uh, entertaining uh, their companions. But you're going to also notice some other things here, and this is going to be true in all of the slides that I show, that the stat block has changed. And also, uh, there's now a table over there uh, where the DM can roll to determine what is a particular NPC bard's uh, preferred performance type? Now, there are all sorts of interesting new things in this stat block. I'm not going to do a deep dive on this one. I'm going to wait to do that on one of the, the later pages I show. But what I'll point out right away is not only are there new abilities here, uh, but also the information has been uh, reorganized to make it easier for the DM to use. And we also have rebalanced all of these monsters so that they're, they are as resilient as they really should be uh, for their challenge rating. And when they're uh, meant to be a scary foe, they're gonna be even scarier uh, in, in this new book. Let's look next at uh, a new version of the Warlock of the Great Old One. We see on the left when uh, this, this NPC first appeared in Volo's Guide to Monsters, uh, the, the poor Warlock had no art at all. But now uh, this NPC has this uh, wonderfully spooky piece of art as this Warlock gazes off into the void uh, to draw on uh, the magic of their patron. And again, uh, if, if, you, if you look carefully at the text of, of each of these, you're going to see there are some pretty substantial changes uh, between these two uh, stat blocks. The one that appeared some years ago in Volo's Guide, and now this new one that appears in Monsters of the Multiverse. Something else I can tell you about book organization uh, that is also new in Monsters of the Multiverse for our bestiary products, and that is we decided to alphabetize uh, the creatures throughout. So what that means is if you've ever found yourself in the situation of, ah, this adventure tells me to use a Glabrazoo, but you don't remember that in the, the monster manual that that demon is hidden in the demon section, and so you forget that you need to look for the G monster in the D section. Now G monsters are in the G section. It's a simple quality of life thing, but I think it's going to make a big difference when DMs are looking monsters up uh, during play uh, as well as during their prep. Let's look at one more. Uh, let's take a look now at the War Priest. Uh, I love showing pages from our, our beautiful books. So the War Priest on the left-hand side, again, bereft of art, but now in multi Monsters of the Multiverse, this gorgeous piece of art uh, showing this war priest uh, channeling divine power. Uh, you can see, like the new version of the bard, this war priest has a handy table for the DM to provide some new story texture. In this case, uh, the cleric uh, gets to have a different type of holy symbol uh, depending on the DM's role or the DM's choice, because uh, the DM, of course, can always uh, just decide. Uh, and now we have, uh, again, a number of changes in the stat block. And here I want to pause and actually do a little digging. So first, if you compare sort of the before and after, You'll notice that the War Priest back in Volo's Guide to Monsters had this really chunky spellcasting trait. Lots of spells, fifth, uh, five levels of them, in fact, along with some regular attacks and a reaction. You'll notice that spellcasting trait uh, does not exist in the new version of the War Priest. Instead, the War Priest now has a spellcasting action uh, that is much slimmed down. And this is going to be a, a design theme that you'll see in all of our newer books, where we 
listening to the community as well as a, as experiencing running our monsters ourselves since we play and dm dnd so much we've discovered spellcasting monsters can sometimes require uh a bit too much prep, uh, and sometimes you have to have a bunch of books open to figure out, okay, what spells uh, can this this NPC cast? We have slimmed down the spellcasting trait into a spellcasting action that really focuses on utility magic rather than combat magic, although as shown in this War Priest stat block, sometimes we'll still sprinkle in some combat-relevant spellcasting. You'll also notice that the War Priest no longer uses spell slots, and that is also a common theme in our upcoming uh, NPC spellcasters, mm -hmm. is we're no longer having DMs tracking spell slots. There's something else you're going to see here in this new War Priest, and that is this Holy Fire ability. Rather than squirreling away a spellcasting monster's heavy-hitting, challenge-rating, carrying damage abilities inside a spell list, we now make sure that if a DM doesn't even want to bother with the spells and just wants to use the regular actions in the stat block, we're now making sure that a spellcasting monster has a combination of regular actions that the DM can just read right there in the stat block that deliver the oomph that in the past would have been handled by the spellcasting trait, but are now being handled just by regular actions. And so that's what you see here with this holy fire action. And you'll see we also have sprinkled in uh, a little bit of magical uh, spice, even in this war priest mall attack, because we, we want to make it as easy as possible for a DM to pick up and play with a stat block. We also want to make sure going forward that it's easy for a monster to hit at its CR level because in some of our previous designs, it was often a little too easy, especially in a spellcasting monster, for a DM to pick a particular combination of spells which would actually cause the monster's effective challenge rating to be far lower than the challenge rating printed in its stat block. And so what we're we have made what we've done really is to sort of guard the printed challenge rating so that it is much easier for a DM to run the monster the way it's presented and have that monster be the challenge that it was designed to be with still allowing there to be, particularly again in these spellcasting creatures, some fun utility options in the spell list that the DM can deploy in non-combat situations. Because monsters, and when we say monsters, we really just mean any DM-controlled creature, Monsters, of course, can be the adventurer's friends uh, just as often as they can be their foes. And so often the magic that appears in a stat block is there to help uh, the adventurers rather than to hinder them. So all of, all of these elements and far more uh, people are going to be able to find uh, when next year they get their gift set and open up Monsters of the Multiverse and really encounter what I, I expect will be some old friends. You know, these monsters, these playable races. It's like, oh, we've, we've used these in our games over the last few years. But it, basically, your friends are going to now show up with a makeover. And I think, I think groups are going to be delighted by uh, the improvements to playability, uh, the brand new abilities that give many of these playable races and these monsters an entirely different feel now at the table. I think this is going to be an exciting addition uh, to people's campaigns, especially when combined with the rules options that are also in Tasha's Cauldron and Xanathar's Guide. I mean, I think that's something I've really enjoyed, particularly this weekend, is looking at the ways that D&D &D is making the game accessible, making the game easier to pick up if you're a new player or perhaps a new DM, but still maintaining the feel of the kind of wonderful complexity that is the world of D&D &D and that kind of granular, detailed, you know, universe that you can dive into. I love 
the as you said the kind of quality of life improvements that just tweak so you can keep track a little bit better you're perhaps a little bit less daunted if you're coming in for the first time but it doesn't make the world any less magical any less full and i feel like that's really the theme of of what we've seen in these new releases that we in particular this weekend have had a chance to have a sneak peek at so thank you for that because oh who doesn't love new pages? Who doesn't love having a sneak peek in? And those looked absolutely beautiful. So, Chris, I'm going to come back to you. Hopefully you've had time as well now to think of a really great <laughs> final answer. But I'll come back to you and, and reiterate the question, which is, you know, just what for you are you looking forward to in the next couple of years? What should we be getting excited about, as I said, in 2022 and beyond? I'm I'm a pretty good person to ask for this question because I exist in 2022 and beyond right now. Um, uh, the the projects I'm working on now uh, will appear uh, in the future, and so as we look forward, um, you we can expect more adventure anthologies, as Ray mentioned. Um, another classic setting to return in. There, fairly soon um, next year, as Ray mentioned. Uh, plus, we're exploring two all-new settings for future publication. These are settings that have never uh, been presented before to the D&D audience. Um, so this is the first time since we introduced Eberron in 2004 that we've gotten to be able to um, come up with uh, completely new settings, but they are in, they're in a stage that we call development. And it's important uh, for me to note um, that uh, we work on many things for future publication, but, uh, and many of these things aren't actually on our schedule. Uh, they're in development because we're in an exploration phase. We're sort of testing the viability of them. We're trying to figure out whether we can make real products out of them. And so we've got two settings that we're kicking around currently that are in this developmental exploration phase. And so maybe they'll see the light of day. I hope they will because they're both exciting concepts. Um, but we're still working through that at this stage. Um, we're very excited, I must say, about the work we've done on them so far. Uh, and there's a lot to be excited about um, from beloved, familiar settings uh, that we're doing to nostalgic content that we always um, uh, bring back uh, from the dead and uh, retooling that nostalgia for today's fan base, but also blending that nostalgia and those familiar settings with new stuff, with new ideas new concepts, new settings, new adventures in places we've never seen before. Uh, so what to look forward to in summary is sort of a blend of things that you know that we've done before and that we're good at doing and things that we've never done before uh, that we we're sure will excite you and will um, expand the D&D multiverse in ways you've never seen before. So now in the short term, in the very short term, uh, keep your ears open for uh, more news next month about a new product that we're releasing in 2022 that goes into a, a new place we've never been before. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful, scary, um, uh, players are going to be absolutely terrified when they go into it, uh, setting <laughs> and, uh, um, and, uh, beyond that, uh, I can't say. Lots of secrets. <laughs> Always lots of secrets. Well, I know that you have one little secret that you're keeping for Sunny. <gasps> You've got oh, something that you're working yes. on for 2022, and I want to see it. So please okay. share. Share All just right. one secret. Okay. Uh, yes. So um, let's see it. I'll, let's see it. Just let's pop it up there. Okay. <laughs> So, this is a very loose sketch of a cover that uh, one of our artists, Hydro74, who many of you know and love because he does many of our alt covers, uh, turned over just days ago. And so, um, this, is, this is going to be an alt cover for a book uh, in a product that we'll see in 2022. Uh, 
what you're looking at <laughs> is a hamster. In, in case you in case you didn't know that already. And as, as you know, Al, <laughs> hamsters are the most dangerous mammal in the animal kingdom. And uh, so uh, whatever this product may be, it's got this figure on the front. And those who don't know the old Baldur's Gate video games very well might not recognize that this is actually one of our most famous D&D characters. This is Boo, the miniature giant space hamster. And now I know you're going to ask, so I'll just answer right away. What is the difference between a miniature giant space hamster and a regular hamster? None. <laughs> They're the same thing. Um, so Boo, Boo will be coming back in 2022 in a secret, top secret product that I'm working on now with a bunch of other folks on the team. And I can't wait for you to see um, Boo and his friends in this mystery product next year. Well, what a way to finish up D&D &D Celebration. <laughs> Did anybody have bets on Boo coming back? Did anybody <laughs> think that was how we were going to see things out? But actually, as it turns out, I can't imagine a better way to finish off this fantastically wacky, wonderful <laughs> weekend that we have had. So, I mean... Uh, I love the future of D&D &D panel. I, you know, I've said throughout it, it is so exciting to me. I, I totally switch back into just a D&D &D fan desperate to find out secrets. And I feel like we got some there. I know we're going to have everybody on social media immediately deconstructing everything that's been said, zooming in on those <laughs> images, deconstructing the sketch of Boo, I'm sure. So lots to delve into there and lots to look forward to. But as ever, I am so thrilled to have been your host for the future of D&D. &D. What a wonderful panel. We've got so much to be excited about. Thank you so much to Ray, Liz, Chris and Jeremy for joining us here for this. So this is it. We're at the end. We're almost there but we're gonna have a little wrap up. We're gonna talk about some of the highlights. We're gonna celebrate how much fun we've had over the last couple of days. So I will see you right back here after a very quick break. <laughs> Thanks, Al. I'm just going to, I'm so devastated. It has been the most brilliant weekend. I have absolutely loved it. I hope that you have too. And of course, we finished up with that future of D&D &D panel. I promised you I was going to do my best to dig out some secrets. 
and look at what we have got. We've got some fantastic new setting news. We've got that gorgeous gift set. We might just have a new edition of D&D on the way to celebrate the 50th anniversary. And of course, we have got Boo. I've had a little look at social media, just quickly had a sneak peek. You guys love Boo. I knew that you would. What a wonderful panel. I love the future of D&D panel, as I said several times during it. So I'm so glad that that's how we could wrap up this weekend. Now, as I said, I had a quick look at social media because you have all been sharing your favourite moments, your thoughts, your feeling, your fantastic art over at the hashtag d and celebration. So I just picked a few favourites that I wanted to share. So first up, Colt S. Taylor said that they played a few games of d and and now they wish that they had started d and earlier. Well, I have to say, we are so glad that you finally found us and that you're here joining in. Also, they did point out that this gives them a lot of experience to flesh out a character that's going to surprise the younger players at the table, which I think is an excellent attitude. Um, Al's rights, ALS rights, made a new character during the during D D celebration, which I loved. So it's an homage to their good friend Tea Leaves, and the character is a dragonborn fighter named Brew who loves coffee and travels the realm looking for coffee recipes, which I think is absolutely adorable. And lastly, at Geek in the City said, I'm glad that this is the community now. I can only imagine what this would have felt like in my early RPG years, which I just thought, what a gorgeous sentiment. That is exactly what D&D Celebration is all about, celebrating not just D&D, but this incredible community. You have been so wonderful, so welcoming to new players, new DMs, people venturing into the D&D world for the first time this weekend. And it has been an absolute joy to be here celebrating with you. Now, before we wrap things up, let's, let's chat highlights because, you know, it's been a packed schedule as ever, everything is up on YouTube. So don't worry if you had to miss anything this weekend, it's all still available for you to watch. I'm just gonna run through a couple of highlights. The full schedule is still on the website, dndcelebration.com. So you can check it all out there. But I wanted to start off by highlighting High Rolling Ox Venture, which was of course, a meeting of two different groups, High Rollers and Ox Venture. They're from the UK. They are absolutely fantastic, really funny groups. And this was their crossover for the very, first time ever. They managed to get a whole new catchphrase, a catchphrase, smash the system going on social media. So if you want to know what that's all about, you'll need to watch that one. We also had our Star Trek panel. I know everyone was very excited about it. Not just me. I'm not the only space nerd here. We had Disco Does D&D, which was, of course, the cast of Star Trek Discovery here to play D&D. Absolutely wonderful, a really fantastic crossover. Really lovely to see actually when I looked in the Discord and on social media that we had Star Trek fans who'd never played D&D and then D&D fans who hadn't watched Star Trek and they were discovering both sides. So yeah, a wonderful set of worlds colliding there. We also had a, uh, a really fun game called Hermes's Heist, which was set in a mythological setting with Asgard meeting Olympus. This was just beautifully put together by the DM, Joe Fudge. Loads of detail in there, really did a spectacular job. So if you love mythological settings, and you should, this is a mythological setting with a heist. Makes it even better. You'd have thought it. So that one is up to watch now if you love that kind of thing. Of course, we had really informative panels this weekend. I particularly wanted to highlight my first character, bringing young players into D&D. This was one that lots of people loved because it had tips about making the game a bit more accessible for younger players, bringing them in in a way that doesn't feel overwhelming and helps them really kickstart their first adventure. Loads of tips and tricks in there. People really appreciated it, whether they were using it for school kids, kids of their own, whether they're, you know, the cool aunt like I am. And so that's got, you know, tons of info in for making sure that they have a great time when you get them at the table. Another really good panel was the DM round table. So we have those every year. And of course, they are just packed with great advice from brilliant DMs. And this time it was all about how you really immerse players, how you bring them into that world and make it kind of bloom all around them. Really great tips there from murder letters to scented candles. I'm going to let you figure out 
what that means by watching it on the YouTube channel. I also loved Outlaws and Obelisks, Slow Down Showdown, not just because that is a really awesome title and very fun to say. So this was DM'd by Jeremy Cobb and it was set in a land ravaged by a magical cataclysm and so our intrepid band of adventurers had to uh, had to sneak into a deep underground city where time runs slower i loved this you know that just ticks all my boxes really mysterious a really great dnd setting so yeah loved that one do check it out then of course we had fizzband's treasury of dragons revealed i did host that one so sorry for just sneaking it in there, but it's mainly because James Wyatt was so absolutely fantastic, full of insights about what this book is going to do to your game, what it's going to offer, and just the wonderful world of dragons and everything they bring to D&D. We got real geeky. It was a huge deep dive, so make sure you check out that one if you are a dragon fan, which if you're here at Dungeons & Dragons Celebration, I assume you are. So I also just have to highlight even though everyone's talking about it, The Circus of Sound, a D&D &D musical, which of course had fantastic musical guests who literally staged a D&D &D musical. I know it's something people have talked about for a long time. We finally did it. We finally went there and it was absolutely fantastic. I do believe the music is going to be available soon. I know lots of people asked about that, but yeah, that was a good one. Absolutely loved it. It made me feel like bursting into song all the time. I will spare you. I promise. So those are just some of the highlights, but of course, everything on the schedule is on the YouTube channel. So you can watch everything back. If you just wanna relive this wonderful weekend at any point, it's all there ready and waiting. Now, I did just want to say one more quick congratulations to Andrew Ryszkinski. He was just crowned our first ever DM challenge champion. It was enormously close. So if you haven't watched the whole series, that is all up on the website as well, uh, dndcelebration.com. And you can also find it on the YouTube channel. So you can catch up on the series because all the contestants were incredible. If you want to pick up great DMing advice or just you know listen to the really creative ideas they came up with in 72 hours, then that is a series to watch. Congratulations again to Andrew. So before we go, I know that you are devastated things are over, but don't worry, we're, we're kind of softening the blow. So dndcelebration.com will stay up for a little while longer. And what we have there is the fantastic, beautiful interactive map. Now by itself, this would be absolutely gorgeous to just look at, explore, enjoy. But if you look a little bit closer, it includes a series of fiendish puzzles called the Witch Light Challenge. So if you manage to solve this, and I, I am not joking when I say it's fiendish, it absolutely is, then you can win rewards and you can find exclusive preview content. Now, lots of people jumped in on this one and they really struggled. So don't worry, you can also jump in the Discord, which is discord.gg forward slash DMD for a little bit of help. They're really great about tagging spoilers and that kind of thing. So if you get stuck, don't worry, there are people to help you, but this is really fun so I really recommend it. Plus if you are at the map you can go to the uh, preview content node and that's got loads of downloadables so we've got wallpapers, puzzle answers, things like that so you can download all the cool stuff that we've had available this weekend that you've perhaps seen other people downloading and felt a little bit jealous. And of course if that's not enough we have books available right now for you and on the way to look forward to. So first up, let's talk the world beyond the witch light. So of course, this is out right now. You can order it now. You can get your hands on it. I've seen people with their copies on social media. It is as gorgeous as it looks here. I mean, look at that alt art. And this is, of course, the first official D&D adventure set primarily in the Feywild. So this is a book uh, exploring the fantastic witch light carnival where Everything is not all as it seems. This is a really wonderful world. We had a great panel on it hosted by Brandy Camel this weekend. So if you missed that and you want to know a little bit more about what's in the book, you can definitely go and watch that one. But if you already know that you want to jump into the Feywild, and who wouldn't, you can order that now. Then, 
To keep you going throughout the rest of the year, we have Strixhaven, a curriculum of chaos on the way. So this one is available for pre-order now and is arriving on November the 16th. And this sees the fantastical setting of Strixhaven University arrive all the way over from Magic the Gathering. So if you're an MTG player, you probably played Strixhaven. So much fun, so I'm absolutely thrilled to see it land in D&D. And it is fleshed out, expanded. It is this huge, enormous world for you to delve into. Four years of adventures, plus loads of new mechanics like relationships and interesting NPCs that you can deal with. You can also, I've said it so many times this weekend, but it is literally the thing I'm most excited about. You can have a nemesis on campus who will sabotage you. That is just my favourite thing. But you can also have, you know, if you're boring, you can have normal friendships and relationships and that kind of thing. Plus, it introduces an adorable new race. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you can spot it on the cover there. So Strixhaven, definitely one to pre-order now if you are looking forward to attending university in the D&D world. Oh, and there's LARPing. I can't not mention the LARPing. LARPing in D&D. And then lastly, we have Fizban's Treasury of Dragons. So this is the quintessential reference guide to the world's greatest role-playing games, most, uh, most noteworthy monsters, I think, in my opinion. I love dragons. I love this book. As I said, I hosted that great panel with James where he got me even more excited about this than I was before. And it adds so much. So new mechanics, statistic, art, new character subclasses, just some very exciting lore, I have to say. Really gorgeous stuff that you can thread through your games. We're going to be exploring the multiverse. There's some great backstories to those dragons and, and how they affect the world around them. So this is just packed with everything you've ever wanted to know about dragons. And yeah, you're going to need this one. You can pre-order it now and it is arriving on the 19th of October. So hopefully that'll keep you going now that D&D Celebration has very sadly come to an end. But before we wrap things up, I just want to say one last shout out to our partner Sirenscape. They are a fantastic sound design app. I genuinely recommend them. Use them myself. They create gorgeous, beautiful, ambient background music for your game. And the best thing about them is that it is perpetual. So it lasts forever. It's not, you know, a 10 hour loop that's going to cut out or go really weird in the middle. It's, uh, it has over 60,000 different kind of base samples to pull from. So it's varied and it's different, but you as a DM can just set it, sit back, concentrate on your game. So yeah, big shout out to Sirenscape. They're absolutely fantastic and have provided ambience all weekend. But the very last thing that I do have to mention before we go there is that of course, this weekend was all to support the wonderful Extra Life and the Children's Miracle Network Hospital. So whilst you have been having fun this weekend, you have also been raising money for this incredible cause that I imagine needs it more than ever right now. And there's still lots of ways you can support if you haven't already. So firstly, you can pick up this merch. As you can see, looks amazing. It has been very thoughtfully designed so you can look fantastic and feel good if you pick some of that up at extralifeshop.com. You can also go to dndcelebration.com, explore the interactive map I mentioned earlier and visit the snail races to make a direct donation to the Extra Life campaign or visit the Extra Life tab on the website. Plus, you can visit the DMs Guild and pick up a copy of Domains of Delight where you can learn how to create a domain of delight and this will also go to support extra life so if you can if you are able please do donate because it just makes this weekend even more worthwhile even more wonderful when we know that we are supporting such a fantastic cause and if you aren't able to go ahead and tweet get somebody else tag all your rich friends let's see if we can get them to donate to this fantastic worthy cause <sighs> that's it I can't believe that we are done with D&D Celebration for another weekend. I have to say, it is very genuinely one of my favourite parts of the year. I adore being here celebrating with you all. You are a wonderful community and I hope that you have enjoyed this weekend. Do say a huge thank you to the D&D team on social media because they work so hard putting this together and I, I can only imagine that you have had as much fun as I have had sitting here. So, 
I can't believe I'm saying this, but I have been Ello Silly Wood. I have been your host for D&D Celebration 2021. It has been your ticket to adventure. I hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you back here next year.